Good morning. We're going to get started here uh, in just a second. So I'd encourage everybody to get their coffee in hand and seats under them and get get a good view. I think we we have enough uh, we have enough seats so everybody can get comfortably situated. Well, good morning again. My name is Reed Detchen. I'm the Senior Advisor for Climate Solutions here at the United Nations Foundation. And we're delighted to have you here for this Clean Fuels Climate and Health Forum. Uh, and I want to start out by explaining why you're here. Why you're here in, at this place in particular. Uh, the United Nations <coughs> Foundation was uh, founded about 20 years ago uh, by a generous gift from Ted Turner. And its purpose was to assist the UN and UN causes. And since that time, it's focused on three principal areas, uh, women's empowerment, children's health, and energy and climate. And energy and climate in particular, under the leadership of our first president, founding president, Tim Worth, who's going to be on our first panel. <clears throat> Tim and I worked together on the Energy and Climate Program for more than a decade. And shortly after 9-11, uh, Tim got together with what you might call his kitchen cabinet of closest friends, including Boyd and Gray uh, and John Podesta, and said, I think energy has something to do with what just happened. And we need to have nonpartisan, bipartisan solutions to energy uh, to take the country forward. And out of that was born an organization called the Energy Future Coalition, which was aimed at US policy, it was bipartisan. Boyden and Tim, uh, John Podesta, uh, Tom Daschle were part of that group. And one of the first areas that we took up was biofuels and agriculture. It was one of six areas, and with uh, Boyden's considerable instruction of us all, uh, we really delved into what became the topic that we're talking about today. It started out really from a security frame. Tim and I came at it from a climate frame uh, Boyden came at it for a security frame, I would say, but also a public health frame. And uh, uh, then we also saw other, other benefits and other impacts. So that's how we came to be here today. We've been engaged in this really since uh, 2002 uh, as the UN Foundation and the Energy Future Coalition. So I'm going to say a little bit about logistics just to get that out of the way. Uh, I'm sure you've all had safety briefings. Luckily, it's very simple here. The bathrooms and the stairways are in the same place. So just go out those glass doors you came in and turn to the left, and there's a little hallway there with your bathrooms and uh, the stairways in case you needed to make an emergency exit. We have a more direct exit here, but I can't recommend it. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> the agenda today and, and frame up our conversation. We're here to talk about clean fuels, climate, and health. And ethanol plays a surprising role in the middle of all three. The conventional wisdom about ethanol, grain alcohol made from corn, blended with gasoline for transportation fuel, is that it is a classic case of unintended consequences. A wishfully misguided dream of renewable fuels pushed by big agriculture that became a subsidized government boondoggle and drained billions of dollars from the Treasury, doing as much harm as good. 
That's the conventional wisdom. That's well accepted in this town. But what if this easy narrative is wrong? What if ethanol instead improves engine efficiency, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and most importantly for our discussion today, displaces the most toxic components in gasoline, aromatic hydrocarbons that comprise 25% of every gallon and that produce emissions as harmful to child development as lead. Tim, welcome. Come on up and join Boyden over here. <coughs> I've already sung Tim Worth's praises, so uh, I'm not going to re repeat that. But reviewed the, bidding, okay. reviewed the bidding, Tim, on the Energy Future Coalition. Now, to address climate change, it's pretty clear that we're about to embark on a rapid transition to electric vehicles. But internal combustions will still dominate the U.S. transportation fleet until at least mid-century. We need to address the composition of transportation fuels today. Now what we're going to discuss today is a complex, multidisciplinary topic. And I was scared away from it to start with. I'm not an expert in any one of these topics. You need to know about atmospheric chemistry. You need to know about toxicology. You need to know about epidemiology. You need to know about combustion engine technology and process. And who knows all of those things? I certainly didn't. But what I realized was that you need to be not an expert in one of those fields to get the whole picture. You need to be a generalist to understand how to bring all these facts together into a coherent narrative. And that's how you understand the argument. So you and the audience <laughs> are and on uh, watching on, on the live stream, you're as well suited to understand this argument as any expert here in this room. This is something that when you understand the facts and put them together, common sense will lead you to the right conclusion. So just to review the bidding, ethanol is now blended into gasoline at a 10% level, which ironically is the worst level for air quality. But higher level blends ideally 30 percent, could be used today and in fact are being used today as well here in Watertown, South Dakota, without any change to existing vehicles. Really any vehicles at all, but particularly ones from 2001 forward. And both existing and, and especially uh, new vehicles that will come out in the future could easily be adjusted to run more efficiently on these higher blends and maintain their fuel economy despite the fact that ethanol has a lower energy content than gasoline. And the ethanol fraction produces 40% less greenhouse gases than gasoline. 40%. Because ethanol has high octane, its use at that level would minimize the need to use these toxic aromatics, which happen to be more expensive to produce, for that purpose. So what are aromatics? They're part of the soup we call gasoline. Long-chained hydrocarbons that are slower to combust and thereby deliver octane benefits. They're sometimes called BETX for their constituents, benzene, ethylbenzene, toluene, and xylene. And if that doesn't scare you that that's in your gasoline, I don't know what will. Decades ago, Refiners needed a replacement for tetraethyl lead, which had been demonstrated to be harmful to public health. And they turned to aromatics. But aromatics are poisonous as well, as they well knew at the time. Emissions from that toxic fraction were thought initially to have a very limited life in the atmosphere, posing a threat only where they were most concentrated for example, right along roadsides with heavy traffic. But research since then has shown that the most dangerous component of these emissions, which we'll hear about more today, and they're called PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, in fact are borne along and sustained for long distances and long periods of time by secondary organic aerosols 
So there's another term you're going to hear, secondary organic aerosols. Those are the aerosols that are formed after emissions come out of the tailpipe and combine with the ambient air. So you have emissions come out of the tailpipe, they interact with the air, and they produce these secondary organic aerosols that stay in the atmosphere uh, and transport readily. And what we have found with the research, as you will hear, uh, has shown that the SOAs, these secondary organic aerosols, combine with these worst particles, the PAHs, to keep them and distribute them among the atmosphere and the population. This recent research contradicted the theory on which EPA based its models. So as it tried to determine the potential health effects and the regulation that they based it on, their concept about how these aerosols worked and how they could be distributed in the atmosphere, they have now acknowledged was wrong. So they have no tools, really, to assess what they should be doing. Now, typically, we measure concentrations of uh, various elements in the atmosphere in parts per million or parts per billion. Exposure to PAHs in the single digits, parts per trillion, trillion, has been found by two decades of peer-reviewed research to cause serious harm to unborn and newborn children, including ADHD and IQ decrements that are similar to the effects of lead exposure. In addition, a 2013 Harvard study estimated 3,800 premature deaths per year from combustion of aromatics uh, and their transition to SOAs, to these secondary organic aerosols, noted, and I quote, evidence is growing that aromatics and gasoline exhaust are among the most efficient secondary organic matter precursors, and, 69, and that 69 percent of aromatic emissions come from gasoline-powered vehicles. A more recent Harvard study found that reducing the level of particulate matter in the air by just one microgram per cubic meter from the current EPA standard of 15. So 15, knock it down one microgram, would save 12,000 lives per year. Now the level of aromatics in gasoline is directly correlated with the emissions of particulate matter. Now you might think cars are getting better. We're going to solve this problem. In point of fact, it's the opposite. Newer direct injection engine do have cleaner emissions overall, but not for particulate matter, especially of the smallest particles. Relatively speaking, pollution filters and traps capture the big globs of soot and take them out of the air, so you don't see the exhaust anymore. But they miss these invisible, ultra-fine particles that produce secondary aerosol and that penetrate not just to the lungs, but into the bloodstream where they can reach the brain. Yet, as you will hear, EPA has largely failed to regulate any of these aromatics despite a provision in the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. You'll hear this term again, 202L. It's part of the law, and a mandate, and I'm going to quote because this is important. This is the mandate to Congress from 1990. Quote, reasonable requirements to control hazardous air pollutants from motor vehicles and motor vehicle fuels that, quote, reflect the greatest degree of emission reduction achievable through the application of technology which will be available, taking into consideration, quote, the availability and cost of the technology and noise, energy, and safety factors and lead time. They were given 15 months to act 30 years later, EPA has reduced benzene levels, but has left the other aromatics alone. Now think of it. 25% of every gallon of gasoline, 140 billion gallons of gasoline are consumed in the U.S. per year. That means that 35 billion gallons of aromatics are combusted 
in engines every year and added to the air we breathe. Now, for a very long time, I resisted this narrative. It led me to places I did not want to go, challenging the conventional wisdom, questioning EPA's methodologies, its judgment, and perhaps its moral courage, and observing the influence of the oil industry in Washington. But as hard as I have looked, I have not found responsible science-based arguments that undercut the central point. Substituting a larger fraction of ethanol for aromatics would have important benefits for public health and significant near-term climate benefits for transportation, which will otherwise take decades to transform. That's the narrative we will unspool today. So I wanted to frame that up for you to give you a sense of the argument. You're going to hear a lot more about this in detail from the experts. But don't feel cowed by not being an expert. If you listen to the facts, you'll understand the story and we'll be able to take this forward. So with that, I'm going to stop this opening sermon and I'm going to turn it over to our first panel. And Doug Durante is going to be our moderator for that panel. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you, Reed, for that um, great setup for so much good information we're going to have. Um, well, Senator, how are you? Good to see you again. Nice to see you. I already said good morning to Boyden. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll sit on the end, and then we, we, we uh, the two of you, we'll space it out a little bit here. Um, what a pleasure, and what a way to uh, begin this, this very important discussion we're going to have throughout the day today with with these two gentlemen. Um, I can't think of two people who were more involved in the formative, uh, formative stages of our, our clean fuel movement in this country and the environmental movement in this country. Senator Worth, of course, is uh, chairman of the foundation here, and thank you for helping host this and, uh, and give us this wonderful venue to do it. But Senator Worth was involved in climate change before climate change was cool. Uh, he was in the House of Representatives beginning in 1974 later went on to the Senate. Uh, among the many accomplishments uh, of the Senator, he organized the famous Hansen hearings that was really the first alarm bell that uh, rang around the world uh, to, to alert everybody to the dangers of climate change. So this is, uh, these, these gentlemen are not new to this. Uh, <clears throat> he was very involved in the Clean Air Act coming from the Denver, Colorado suburbs and representing that area. He uh, was acutely aware of the air problems we had out there back then and Clean fuels and ethanol was a huge part of bringing that under control. So this is someone who has a, a deep uh, history and appreciation for, for not only where we've been, but what we're trying to do. Boyd and Gray, um, and both of these gentlemen, by the way, are back in the olden days when uh, there used to be bipartisan uh, agreements that were made by, by both sides. But Boyd and we met, uh, I met in 1988 when he drove his alcohol fuel car on the steps of the Capitol, and we had Senator Daschle and some others, and uh, Boyden has, uh, Ambassador Gray, by the way, I, I should say, but uh, <clears throat> Boyden was really one of the absolute pioneers of our alcohol mm -hmm. fuel movement. Uh, he led the way as uh, uh, Vice President George Bush's counsel. He chaired the Regulatory Reform Task Force that uh, focused on a lot of programs that have, have uh, been, been the uh, basis for a lot of our ethanol programs. Uh, later on, of course, was counsel to, to the President but uh, both under uh, President Reagan and President Bush. Boyden was an absolute driving force. He has been calling for more ethanol and banging on EPA for the last 30 years. And so to pick up on, uh, on, on what Reed has said, what we'd like to do is try to explore you know, where we can go from here. We're a little bit stuck. You know, We had this phenomenal growth in the ethanol industry. Right now, we need to, uh, boy, I have a paper, Boyd, and I don't want to embarrass you, but among the, the reams of things that Boyden has written for our coalition and my group, the Clean Fuels Development Coalition, we put out these issue briefs, and I have some copies of this, but they're all online. This is back in 2010, and Boyden's opening line, and you're, you're younger, a little bit younger then, but the opening line right there is ethanol is missing uh, its greatest opportunity um, and its greatest uh, attribute, which is that it is saving lives. So this is not a new 
concept that we're on. This is not a new idea that we are the cleanest fuel and can replace the bad components in fuel. So uh, we want to build on that and what Reed said we have, we want to get into some of the technical, some of the automotive issues, some of the health issues, but these two gentlemen have a, a sense of all of that. So I'm going to turn it over to you and free will and hopefully we'll get some discussion going. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming and it's uh, really interesting to get uh, deeply involved in this issue as you will find. The more you know, the more you want to know, and the more you want to cry. Uh, because it, it's truly such an, such an enormously important pathway and it's one that is blocked at just about every area by a whole series of interests and conventional wisdom that have really held up you know, what is one of the major climate public health, political, and economic breakthroughs that we could make. We're looking for as many steps as we can find that are going to be effective as we look at the looming climate crisis, and this is certainly one of them. We're looking at everything we can to improve the health of Americans, and this is certainly one of them. And we're looking at everything we possibly can to encourage you know, economic, uh, economic sustainability, uh, particularly in rural America, and this is one of them. So everything is on the side of this discussion. So it's important for us to understand, well, why isn't this working? You know, what's gone wrong? Have we not, not done it right? Or have there been other forces out there that are determined to make sure uh, that ethanol uh, does not advance? You know, obviously I'm leading up to the point that there are other forces out there. Let me step back and just say a word or two about my constituency in Colorado right along the Front Range uh, where uh, we've had very, very significant clean air problems for 50 years. You know, the way in which the uh, uh, wind currents come over the Rocky Mountains and air gets stuck, dirty air gets stuck right along the Front Range, right across through the Denver Corridor. We thought we had much of that solved through various parts of the earlier uh, work on the Clean Air Act but are now discovering the looming health problem of uh, what's happening with uh, uh, air, very fine particles that Reed is talking about. And the uh, Denver and the Denver metropolitan area is dramatically out of compliance uh, with the Clean Air Act. Uh, you think of this pristine western sky is not the case at all. It's a very, very dangerous, uh, f very dangerous growth of this, particularly as the fossil fuel industry uh, has grown so dramatically through fracking. If you look at various parts of the Front Range, it looks like a pincushion. If you look at infrared, and because it's all of the fracking that's going on, uh, the c contributions from the fracking is not dissimilar uh, in makeup from what happens coming out of the tailpipe of automobiles. And the two together, fracking and what's coming out in tailpipe emissions, uh, is creating now a brand new soup that is very, very threatening uh, to uh, the health of the people living across the Front Range. So you'd think, well, why don't we take this on? Why don't we, under why don't we do something about this? The data is pretty clear. It's pretty well understood. The Colorado Public Health Authorities you know, aren't dumb. They've got a new administration as well. It's fresh and eager and ready to do something. Well, something's wrong with this mix. And there are two pressures, I think, that are coming in and hammering away at this. You know, one is a kind of conventional wisdom among the uh, environmental groups. Much I'm a deeply engaged with all of these environmental groups and have been banging on them for 20 plus years about ethanol and the fact that their conventional wisdom uh, is flat wrong. Only last week, Reed, I had dinner with a senior uh, executive of a foundation that supports uh, a whole series of environmental issues, and I was making this case. I said, we're going to have this panel. It's interesting, trying to get some life into the ethanol issue and re get some new energy into it. And uh, he said, oh, you don't want to do that. You know, we don't want to tear down any more of Indonesian rainforest for palm oil. I said, what? I mean, this was a, this was a presumably very well-informed individual. I said, you're just flat and wrong. He said, no. I said, other people around the table kind of listening to this conversation. And I was practically alone in defending ethanol and where it came from and what its virtues were uh, with a group of people that should know a lot better, but there has been developed a significant conventional wisdom running through much of the green community 
that has been really catastrophic for this and makes it very hard, you know, for many people who ought to be advocates for ethanol to put their heads above the parapet, parapet and, and become supporters. The second major roadblock that I, can, I think is there uh, is our, our great friends in the fossil fuel industry. You know, I look around, I've learned enough now in politics over this long period of time to no matter what problem comes along or what we're looking for, sort of look for the, the, for the fingerprint of the fossil fuel committee. You can almost always find it. I mean, this incredibly ubiquitous, powerful in, in the industry that's out there arguing against universities divesting from fossil fuels, arguing in just about every possible way for their own well-being, and they are certainly part of this discussion, seeding and telling, making sure that the wrong stories are told. And why does that? Well, they don't own the ethanol. And if you look at that 25% uh, that Reed's talking about, if you start to think about, you know, can we clean up those emissions, uh, you know, they have got to, we have got to make progress with them. Will that be possible? Well, that seems to me is an enormously difficult issue. So that's, um, that's my story. Why did I get into this? Because of uh, the pressures of my constituency and thinking about, uh, thinking about clean air and their health. And then it led to the fascinating discussion of all the chemistry of this. And that led Boyden and me and, and John Podesta to 20 years ago put together the Energy Future Coalition, which was, I think, one of the most interesting kind of analytic discussion groups that I was ever involved with or went on for 20 years. And, uh, and it was really very, very creative. Boyden was one of the key people in that because he had been delving into this from a legal point of view and a political point of view for a long time. So we had fascinating discussions, and I, uh, you know, I hope maybe they're the seeds for beginning again to understand that climate is energy, energy is climate. How the two fit together is always to be found, always part of what we have to learn. And we always got to look where are the fingerprints and what do we do about it. So thank you all very much for coming. And let me turn it over to the real expert who's been at this even longer than I have, uh, Borden Gray. Here's Borden Gray. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, this is an issue that I've been working on, as Tim said, you know, 30 years with Dave Hallberg and Tim and Tom Daschle. And, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be completed. <clears throat> How did I get interested in this? Well, uh, I was sort of in charge of uh, President Reagan's deregulation program beginning in the early 1980s, and we wanted to, to, to get rid of unnecessary red tape. And it was obvious, getting into the Clean Air Act and EPA, that we couldn't repeal the Clean Air Act. No one wanted to do that. So my solution was, all right, let's expedite the cleanup and get the Clean Air Act off our backs by complying with it. And it turned out that um, the first step uh, had to be getting rid of lead uh, in gasoline because of its um, toxicity and its really, really severe impact on children's mental development, uh, to say nothing of other health effects. But the IQ issue was the one that really drove it. And then the question became, well, what was lead all about? And that's when I started to get into the question of why. Why do we have lead in the beginning? And lead was the first national ambient air quality standard, which was uh, imposed by the Clean Air Act. And uh, we did, in the early 80s, get rid of it completely out of gasoline. But the question always was, all right, what's going to provide the substitute for what lead does? So, so that's sort of the background of my interest, but it's important to understand what was lead there for, what was lead used for, and what is the best substitute. And the answer is, the best substitute is ethanol. And that's why ethanol is where it is. It just ought to be in a much, have much bigger presence. Um, now, so why was lead there to begin with? So that leads to the question, well, what was lead doing? Um, to do so much, to poison people so much. What was it doing? And what this leads to is the question of octane. And octane is the most important, uh, um, the most important factor 
in the relationship between the oil industry and the automobile industry, going all the way back to 1900, <clears throat> all the way back a century or more. And um, if you understand octane, you can understand this, but no one ever uses the word octane. No one ever, what is octane? Well, octane is the most important component of gasoline. That's, Mercedes will tell you that. It's the most important component of, of gasoline from the point of view of the biggest users of gasoline, or the only users, which are the car companies. Um, so lead was introduced and discovered by Kettering uh, at General Motors. In the early part of the, 19th, of the 20th century, <coughs> um, there was a limitation on compression. You couldn't go above four to one. You couldn't have trucks. You couldn't have race cars. You couldn't have anything. Fast forward, race cars are run on alcohol. Um, so why? Because it's better than diesel or gasoline. Uh, the, um, the, so, so the issue was, how do we fix this? And Kettering's puttering around in his garage, and he's trying to figure out for GM uh, how, to, how to make it possible to make cars actually have acceleration, uh, be fun to drive, actually build trucks. And he, one of his assistants um, uh, is working with him. He's a British scientist. And, and Kettering says to him, how come it is that um, a gasoline doesn't knock as badly as kerosene? Now, you say, what does knock have to do with it? Well, that was the problem with low-octane fuels is they pre-ignited in the chamber, and a car could blow up if you didn't fix this. And so that's why compression was kept at 4 to 1, and you couldn't drive anything that had any power or any fun. How do we fix this? And, and Kettering says to his assistant, why is this? And he says, that's because gasoline vaporizes better than kerosene. He said, well, find something to make gasoline vaporizing even better. And his assistant said, no, I'm not the person to figure this out. I um, am, a, am a physical engineer, um, a physical mechanical engineer. I'm not a chemist. And you need a chemist to find this out. And Kettering says, no. <laughs> if I were to ask a chemist, he would say it couldn't be done. Because if it could be done, it would have already been done. And the fact that it hasn't been done, the chemist will tell you, is why it can't be done, which is why we're stuck today. Well, you can't. If it could have been done, it should have. Well, it wasn't being done because of, you know, stuck in the ways. And he discovered lead by chance. Lead doesn't actually make gasoline vaporize better. It makes it burn more slowly. So you don't have this pre-ignition in the chamber from the compression. Uh, Ford didn't like it. GM sort of went along with it. GM raised its compression ratio to 8 to 1, and that's why GM got out in front of Ford back in the early part of the 20th century. And the question of octane has been at the center of, of the dialogue and sometimes friction between these two great industries for the last 100 years. So it's not new, but people don't understand the role that octane has played. And when we phased octane out, the question was, how were we going to find the substitute? And it was phased out lead. What's the substitute? Well, if we hadn't done anything, the substitute would have been the aromatics that Reed has talked about, components of gasoline that perform the same slow-burning function that lead was performing. Only it turns out that aromatics are probably as bad as lead for public health, and maybe possibly even worse. And the one way to get rid of that and avoid that problem was to was to authorize um, was to get the Clean Air Act to authorize the use of ethanol, which is an incredibly clean, <clears throat> totally uh, um, um, safe. Uh, and very powerful form of octane. It's the best uh, vehicle for octane that's ever been discovered. You might be able to do better than that, but it just happens to be a product that comes from one of our 
uh, biggest agricultural um, pr productions. So, but 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 the oil companies didn't like this, and so it was a really tough road to hoe. There was an amendment to the Clean Air Act of 1990 which required uh, the addition of an alcohol to um, reduce. It was really motivated as much by Denver as any other place because of the high altitude that Denver uh, uh, has, which creates problems for uh, pollution control. And that was put in. And I can remember, you tell an anecdote, I, anecdotes always tell more. It was called the Clean Oxygen Amendment. Uh, and, and a lot of people here in the room were deeply involved in this. And it was a floor amendment. And of course, Senator Dole was in favor of it in the leadership of the, of the Republican side. And, but, you know, the White House was probably going to be against it. And I was in the White House, so I went down to the domestic policy advisor as this thing was being debated on the floor to distract him from any other um, uh, queries that were flooding into his office on an hourly basis. And I distracted him for two or three hours long enough for the amendment to pass. And this was how we got um, the entryway for ethanol. It was that kind of trick, you know, that you have to use. Fast forward anecdotally, um, Grassley took in at the invitation of President Trump, brought in Joni Ernst, Senator Ernst, and a bunch of others to try to solve the current problems, the current uh, difficulties, which have to do with limits now on ethanol, um, where, the, where the Clean Air Act operates to to, to ban ethanol use above a certain uh, blending level, and there's no reason for doing that except, you know, it preserves market share for certain refineries. Um, what complicates the matter is, is that not all oil companies and refineries dislike ethanol. Some, like Coke Industries or Valero, who's the largest refiner, have many ethanol plants and are quite happy with the product and think it's a great uh, octane um, component. So it's so 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 the oil industry is sort of divided, but but somehow the you know the weakest link in the chain always prevails in fights like this. So uh, and and you know President Trump uh, fancies himself as the as the great problem solver, the great deal maker, and he thought he could solve this problem himself by a big summit in the White House. And I scratched my head and said. Oh, no, no, this is not going to work because, you know, nobody in the White House really understands the complexity of this, as, as Reed has, has, has said, and um, he couldn't pull it off. And so it's still, you know, the farm community is still upset, and with all the stuff with China and soybeans and everything else, it's a, it's a tough issue for the White House because they need the farm community. That's, that really is Trump country. But, I'm, but, but he told one of his staff, and the staff told us, so this is all sort of fourth hand to you, or third or fourth hand to you. He said after he had failed to work the grand solution, he said, you know, I'm out of this. This is more difficult than the Palestinian problem. And so that's where it stands in the White House. It's more difficult than the Palestinian problem. So people just don't want to deal with it. Um, I think they would find if they if they took the restrictions off of ethanol and just let the marketplace work it out, which, which the marketplace would, and ethanol would do very well. And if it didn't, that's ethanol's problem. It's not the government's problem anymore. So let a thousand flowers bloom. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's all we're trying to do is to liberate the marketplace so it can use the cleanest components available uh, both for our health and for climate change, which ultimately is also a health problem. And so that's, I think, what, what, what I would like to um, leave with you, um, and I'll let Doug ask questions, is, is octane, people have got to understand what octane is. It's the centrally most important um, component and that, that, that separates friction and whatnot with the two great industries. And the best way to get rid of that friction and to do what should be done 
for our, for our health and for our climate is to take the restrictions off of what is probably the cleanest fuel in, in the world. It's perverse that the cleanest fuel in the, in the world would be subject to bans and to uh, um, uh, curtailment um, and to, you know, penalties if you use too much of it uh, when it is the cleanest, cleanest component you could find. Um, but, but that's the perversity of the regulatory process and we need to solve it. And I think it can be solved if people just put their shoulders to the wheel and say, look, let's let the cleanest component of liquid fuels have its day in court and do what it can do. We're not asking, that is the industry is not asking for a mandatory minimum of octane. We're not saying you got to have a quota, you got to subsidize it. Actually, ethanol has never really been subsidized. Uh, the, the, the tax incentive to use ethanol went to the oil companies, not to, to the ethanol producers. Um, and it does not cost money. The, the ethanol boost that came when lead was phased out, uh, the 10 percent use that now prevails across the country, has lifted corn prices and, and alleviated the American taxpayer of having to subsidize corn. Um, and I think the savings run close to $10 billion a year. So ethanol has already saved huge sums of money. But nobody knows this. Nobody's told this. This is, this is simply not in part of the conversation. It's verboten. It's like, I don't know, it's off limits. It's politically incorrect. Uh, but you really got to understand that <laughs> corn does have its uses, and ethanol is a byproduct. It's not protein. It doesn't rob people of food. In fact, it helps produce a very high protein animal feed, um, which, is, which is probably as good or better uh, than anything else that's available to feed um, uh, pigs, corn, I mean uh, chickens or, or cattle. So there are lots of, of good things that come out of this if we can do it right. And I just should emphasize again, the, the oil companies are not monolithic. And if it's good enough for Coke Industries, it's good enough for me. Well, thank you, Boyden. <clears throat> Senator. Well, we've got time for some questions, but I certainly I, I got a couple I want to throw out in the Senator Worth first. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the one of the problems we've had, that palm oil story you just told was, you know, so telling because we run into that, that kind of thing all the time. But one of the things we're struggling with um, <clears throat> as we try to find this next phase, and, and you know, when this business started, um, of course, Denver, and I worked very closely out there in, in, in Colorado because of the, uh, the CO problem, as you alluded to, Boyden, and we knew that oxygen reduced CO. That was pretty clear. Nobody could dispute that. But I think there's a bit of an identity problem. One of the groups that has been very helpful to us over the years is the Governor's Biofuel Coalition. And I tell this story because when we work to put that together, it was fascinating to me who the governors sent to our formative meetings. Some sent their energy person, some sent their ag person, some sent their environmental person, some sent their water person, some sent their economic development person, because it, they, it meant something different to all of them. And we haven't lost that. That's, we're the Swiss Army knife of, of alternative fuels, and that it, it covers all that. And, and even though we, uh, it was the late 70s when we had the oil embargoes, and we had these, in, in, these insane rallies all over the country for American agriculture. We had the tractor cade here. So when we hear today that we don't need this anymore because we got plenty of oil, that means we've lost all those other arguments, all those other things. So as a policy, from a policy person, you know, how do we get that back? How do we correct that person on the palm oil? How do we make people see that it is, in fact, you know, multiple benefits? all of the, which I just named, all of those stakeholders, all of those constituencies benefit, and we just, you know, how, how we need, you know, counsel and advice, how do we get back to that? And of course, right now, health is, I think, the, the, the top card on the deck that we should be playing, but how can, we, how can we do that? And your article, by the way, that you did with Senator Grassley, that environmentalists should take another look at E30, is exactly the kind of thing we need. We're just not, Boyden's written a lot, we're always going to him to write things, and you've done a lot. 
how do we get more? How do we do more of that? Well, obviously, if we knew, we'd be doing it. But um, if we would figure it out, it would be being done. You know, I've always believed that if you have an issue you're taking on and you want to try to drive it, you need a horse. You know, you need somebody who's going to be not just the water or the ag or the environmental person. You need somebody who's going to pull it all together and be the horse. Who's going to be the lead? And that's going to demand, I think, you know, a, a Western, Midwestern governor. You know, that'd be my guess, or maybe a member of the Senate who really takes this on and drives it, and, and he or she owns it. And they own it, and they drive it, and they drive it, and they drive it. And that's the way, largely, that's the way that things happen and get attention. You know that, I know that, we all know that. We don't have a horse right now, as far as I can see. There's nobody out there. You think there are live people who should be doing it. Seems to me it'd be great politics for somebody to pick up, and they haven't done it. So that's... You know that seems to me this is the is the is the prime uh, is the prime need. Uh, we've all written a lot of things and seen a lot of things. I've always thought that having a a very simple primer or primer, you know, first grade primer, having a very simple primer on on uh, on ethanol, you know, is would be an excellent idea. I think we've been through a number of drafts of that sort of thing, but that you know to have it out as this is the conventional wisdom as to why. You know, this is important, and these are the barriers you have to look out for. And developing something like that, not a complicated thing to do. We've had pieces of it, but I don't think that that's ever been produced so that that can be given to all those people from the various offices that show up so that they're all operating on the same base of information. But getting a horse, I think, is the single most, would be my view, single most important item. Now, how do you do that? You know, you look for uh, you look for you know who 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 in these uh, you know there's some very talented uh, younger uh, people coming up the political system and who out there can for is there somebody out there for whom this can be a winning op opportunity? I mean, if you get if you get uh, the Coke you get the Coke brothers someplace out there along with uh, uh, maybe an enlightened part of the of the environmental community, you know that's a that's a pretty great incentive for somebody who's political, it seems to me. Well, we had that leadership uh, very much when you were <clears throat> in the White House, Boyden, both for the vice president and for the president. But um, let me ask you more of a procedural question. One of the things we had going for us back then, and you were you know, the, the, the leading that whole effort, is we had a fairly um, favorable or open EPA. You know, we had Bill Riley and Bill Rosenberg, and, you know, you worked with them and got them to open their eyes. Our biggest obstacle, as you know better than anybody in this room, is EPA and their failure to uh, look at things uh, in, a, in a contemporary way and to look at some of our science. We've all done comments. You've done comments for us on challenging EPA for not using the best science. Um, how, you know, I know this is a too broad of a question in, in some respects, but how can we break through that? I mean. They were open to uh, <clears throat> the role that oxygen and fuels could play. We had an oxygen standard in RFG. There was an accepted science that this was reducing pollution. Uh, now we can't, I mean, uh, for EPA to tell us that they can't regulate octane, which is what we've heard directly from them because uh, they somehow think it's out of their jurisdiction, you know, how do we break through with that? Because that's the single biggest, that's where the barriers are. You, again, you know better than anybody. It's very hard to, to, to really explain it. Um, for EPA to say we can't regulate octane is to say we can't do anything about the environment because what was lead all about? It was all about octane, and they were regulating octane when they phased out lead. I mean, that's what I was trying to explain. Octane is, is the key concept here that you've got to understand. For EPA to say they can't regulate it is absolute, uh, unmitigated nonsense. Now, I will say this about EPA. They, they have some of the finest minds in that agency. But those minds often get misdirected into um, <clears throat> places they shouldn't go. And the reality is, is that nothing innovative in pollution control has ever emerged from the bureaucracy at EPA. In fact, they've tried to stop it all. We worked on um, perhaps our finest collaboration, I think, was acid rain, don't you think? I mean, that was, that was great fun. That was really... Uh, that was opposed by EPA. Most successful environmental program probably ever imposed. That we, we've gone from 18 million tons 
down to about um, two million, a million and a half. Um, it's one of the greatest public health uh, coups ever, and it was opposed lock, stock, and barrel uh, by the EPA um, bureaucracy. Um, most of the other innovations in the 1990 Clean Air Act were opposed by uh, EPA's bureaucrats. You, you tell me why this is. Uh, I think I know the explanation, but I, it's, it's, well, um, I'm an administrative lawyer. Most of you don't know what that means, but, but there are a few of us. And it's, it's the intersection between the Constitution and the statutes and how they get converted into regulations that apply actually to, uh, to uh, us as individuals. So it's a sort of a small little group based mostly here in Washington and in the law schools. You won't find administrative lawyers in any of the big cities, New York or Chicago or L.A. or even Houston. Denver. Uh, Denver, probably not too many. Um, so there, there um, is a theory which is well understood in academia. It's well understood as, as, a, as a discipline. It's called... Um, public choice theory, and what it does is explain that uh, inevitably the bureaucrats who have to implement things in the various agencies, whether it's EPA or HHS or wherever, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, get captured by the um, interests that they're supposed to be regulating. And so agency capture is a central uh, facet of all this. and. Um, one of the ways that uh, agencies get captured is the industries they regulate tend to make a lot more money than they do. And so when, when, when someone from EPA who works in this area is, and wants to, after he's got tenure and he's spent 20, 25 years, where does he spend the second half of his life and where he can earn more money to educate his children and his grandchildren? One of the best job opportunities are in what industry, you can guess, and that's where they tend to go. And so they're not going to bite the hand that they expect to feed them when they when they finish their careers at EPA. So the revolving door is at the heart of all this. And um, <clears throat> I guess if I would step back from this, I would say that the answer is for Congress uh, to, to be a little more um, responsible for its own behavior. Because if Congress really looked at this carefully, you wouldn't have the result that we have now with the bureaucracy blocking this. You would have senators like Grassley and Ernst and a whole bunch of other rounds. You could go through a litany of, of uh, Midwestern senators. Uh, if, if they were actively engaged in this debate, it, it would be over. But Congress has gone into uh, eclipse for the last two decades. Uh, I think that, and I'm here, I'm sitting next to a very esteemed senator, so, but I think one of the reasons he left the Senate was it was no longer the body that it used to be when you first started. I'm, I'm not going to speak for you, but um, the problem is, is that Congress is not exercising its proper role as uh, overseer and as um, legislator. And the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990 were a success because Congress got into the details the way it always used to do. And that was probably the last time they ever really did it on a, on a major scale. Today, they just delegate everything to the bureaucracies. And, uh, as a res and then the leadership, started by Gingrich, but, but, but perpetuated by Pelosi, I mean by Democrats. So it's both parties. Gingrich uh, wanted to centralize all the legislation into the leader's office. Um, so, did, so does Pelosi. She famously said when she introduced the, uh, the Affordable Care Act to the public, we got to now enact this Affordable Care Act to find out what's in it. Because, you know, nobody knew. It was all done in secret. And that's the way the Congress has been operating for the last, in, in, in sort of growing uh, levels for the last two or three decades, culminating in this latest debacle where 
you know, the, they really shouldn't have been spending any time on impeachment. They should be spending time on trying to solve the trade problems with China and trying to help si solve this problem. Uh, but they have been AWOL on most key regulatory issues for be the better part of two of two decades. And so I think that's where the problem is. I don't know how to get Congress more energized, but the, but the, um, the obvious leader, in my view, with the right views about this, is Senator Grassley. Um, and he should be succeeded probably by Joni Ernst. They both understand what the issues are. Um, but for some reason or other, the way the atmosphere is structured, the way the atmosphere works, they just don't get, they, they're just not playing the roles that they would have been playing or did play uh, 20 years ago. Even, even um, uh, Ted Cruz, who comes from obviously Texas, which is an oil state, even Ted Cruz uh, in, in the Iowa primary four years ago, um, wrote, you know, took the position that ethanol should be liberated, should be, should be unshackled, not, not subsidized, not, not pushed, but not restrained. And um, it, was a, it was an amazing result. And Trump won Iowa in part as a result of, of this Texas senator's work in Iowa. Um, but the Congress doesn't have that same voice. This doesn't have a voice that does what it should be doing. Well, I can tell you, we're going to hear later on today, you know, you talk about, e about EPA. We've done some extensive research and study over the last 20 or 30 years going back and, and produced a report that uh, we called Gasoline Gate. And uh, it documents to a painful degree uh, the extent that EPA, every time they had a chance to err on the side of ethanol, to do a little bit more. They did not. So again, I, the last time I can remember that was when you were uh, directly, both of you were directly involved in that, and there was a willingness to, you know, sort of, what, how, can we, how can we do more, not less? So we're, we're in this. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be hearing about that uh, a little bit later. But it is. We once in, went in to see Gina McCarthy, I think our last caper at all of this, you know, saying, saying, trying to lay out the case to her and what ought to be done. And, you know, Gina's an old buddy of mine. And, you know, incredibly cheerful and nice person, and so I think Dashiell, Dashiell and Podesta and you and I were the four of us going. Oh, the, the four of us? No, you and I were. We went through all of this and and uh, and uh, laid it all out, and Gina made it very clear this wasn't going to happen. So one of us said, "Well, you know, we we're preparing a lawsuit. We're going to we're we're going to sue you. Was what we're going to we're that's where we're headed." And she said plaintively. But you're my friends. <laughs> I, I'll never forget it. Well, here we are. You know, that was the. We you're heard my about, friends. We heard about that meeting. Yeah, that meeting was led by, by by Tim and Tom Daschle. I was there, sort of as a, you know, because it was a Democratic administrative uh, than Obama. Uh, so I was just a fly on the wall, basically. But I have never seen two U.S. senators treated as rudely and as disrespectfully as she chop your heads off, and uh, then, so then plaintively said, but you're my friend. Ah, uh, it's just, it's just, you know, you sort of think it's sort of. I mean, she was, a, she, she was obviously feeling enormous internal pressure on this, and it had gotten built up that we were coming and what we were doing, and, you know, it was a huge amount of heat on her. She had a, huge, a large number of things on the agenda, I'm sure, and, oh boy, you're my friends. Let us go to the plane. It's gone. <laughs> Yeah, we, we heard about that meeting uh, from, from several of you who were there. But um, we got some questions, but just a, a couple of quick points just to, for, for the audience, to, you know, a perfect example of what we're talking about, the, the, the lack of leadership and lack of help we're getting from EPA, uh, the recent decision to extend the vapor pressure waiver to blends above 10 percent uh, was limited to uh, blends of 15 percent. Well, blends of 20 percent are lower in vapor pressure than 15. It's a linear progression downwards as you go out in volume. There was no reason to stop it at 15. In fact, the evaporative emissions go down and the benefits are greater. And obviously, if more ethanol is, is diluting toxics and creating more octane. And doing, 
but they would not entertain that at, at all. So that's, uh, that's, that's a perfect example. And then the second piece, which is a very live issue right now that is really uh, one of the driving forces behind our whole event today is the uh, fuel economy rule, the SAFE rule. They specifically asked in that rule how we could raise octane, because even they can't deny that raising octane, as Reed alluded to, allows you to, you know, the higher blends or the greater value, much more than 10 percent. So they asked, how can you increase octane consistent with the Clean Air Act, uh, specifically Title II of the Clean Air Act, which is the 202L uh, provision Reed also alerted us to, and that's uh, the mandatory requirement that they uh, control toxics. So he said, well, if you want to raise octane, you can control toxics and use it with ethanol. Both of those have just been batted back over the fence at us. So uh, this is the challenge we have. We have a product. It's good. It's clean. It has all the benefits I alluded to earlier, and we sort of can't get, get through the door there. And your story is particularly disturbing, too, for two distinguished Democratic senators to go and see a Democrat-appointed EPA head. That's, that's sort of alarming. So. I think it just underscores we have our work to do. But uh, we've got time for questions. Dave, did you have something? And um, yeah, I know we're you? running out of time here, and so I'll try to keep this short. And, and Boyden, you'll have to try to keep it short. But you're the best guy to answer this. You mentioned the clean octane provision that passed amazingly on the floor of the Senate, 69 to 30. Uh, the Congress reaffirmed that in the 2005 EPACT Act when the oil industry and EPA tried to eliminate it when the first RFS was, was enacted. Um, you have spoken many times before about the concept, I believe you call it, legislative endangerment. We're in that the, it, it, it's a unique provision, uh, not only mandatory, but that the Congress stipulated that these aromatics were a health danger to the American people and that we don't need an endangerment finding from EPA because Congress has already done it. Could, could you elaborate just a little bit on, isn't 202L one opportunity for our industry to, to force this into the, into the court system and try to get some, some light shown on the, on the real facts here? Well, I agree. Uh, EPA has really violated um, or ignored the law, and there are other provisions that feed into this. And so that's probably where this is all going to end up is in the courts. That's not unusual in our system of government for that to happen, but that's probably going to, going to be where it ends up. And I think that the, the, the timing's important uh, as to when that's done, um, and that gets into a complicated set of issues which are resolvable, but I don't want to go into them now, but you, you, you're right. That, that is... That provision is pretty stark, and I think it's a winner, not a slam dunk, but a pretty clear winner, and that is probably where this is going to end up. Okay. Well, any closing thoughts, Senator Boyden? Uh, we're right on schedule here. We have a, a panel coming up behind that Reed's going to uh, share that will get into some more specifics on aromatics and um, both the health effects, but any closing thought? We can't uh, thank you enough for both of you for being here. And, um, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, so if we can put some new juice into this issue, that's the key. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. We can, we can bring our next panel up. <laughs> Carol and Steve. <clears throat> Team. The 
good news about this next panel is you're not going to have to listen to me. You've already heard enough out of me. Uh, the other good news about this panel is we have uh, uh, two people familiar with both the politics and the science of this argument. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear from them sequentially. Carol Warner uh, goes back on this issue as far as any of us. We, we've all been at this a long time. Long time head of the Environment and Energy Study Institute. Uh, recently retired, but still uh, engaged as ever in, in the topic. And she approaches it from a, from a perspective of environmental protection and public health. And Steve Vandergren is uh, one of those dangerous experts I was talking about before, who really does understand some things about uh, particularly uh, uh, combustion chemistry, uh, fuel properties, and how these play together. So uh, we're going to hear a little bit from them, uh, uh, laying out the, uh, the, the facts as, as, they, as they understand them. And then we're going to have time for uh, additional uh, interaction with you all. So Carol, why don't you just go ahead and uh, lead us off. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Reid. And um, as you said initially, in terms of feeling like many times that certainly not an expert, but coming at things from a generalist perspective and looking at how things fit together and what that means, because I actually think that with regard to this whole issue that we're looking at, that it is an opportunity to address multiple problems have multiple solutions, uh, multiple advantages all at the same time. So let me start, first of all, by saying, um, Reed, I'm not sure what all I could possibly add to the very, very good job that you did at framing out the whole issue that we're talking about today. Uh, you kind of covered, covered it all and did a very, very good job with that. So let me start thinking about it a little bit from a policy perspective in terms of coming from uh, having been at EESI for so many years in terms of looking at, at looking at a whole variety of issues, and the point I think that I want to make in terms of thinking about why we as an organization started to look at this and why we cared. And so, first of all, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute is a nonprofit, uh, independent nonprofit that was initially started in the mid-1980s by a bipartisan congressional caucus that set up the organization to really bring more resources to policymakers in terms of providing solid, credible, timely information about key issues that policymakers should begin to know about, um, number one. And number two, to also really reach across sectors, reach across disciplines, to really learn and to build bridges. And number three, to do our work in terms of also, therefore, looking for solutions and trying to bring those forward to policymakers. So it's kind of a three-step process. So in terms of dealing with um, those issues, and I should also mention the beginning in 1988, and, and our, because our mission was really to work for towards environmentally sustainable development, but also beginning in 1988, we started to look at everything through a greenhouse lens in terms of everything that we did also needed to be compatible with thinking about the enormous challenge that climate uh, change was, is, is and, and is posing for our society, for our planet. So when the whole issue around uh, thinking about um, uh, aromatics and everything was sort of first brought to us. I was, I also, like you read, thought, oh my God, this is so complex. There is no way to, you know, how do we best think about this? How do we tell the story for policymakers, for the policy community to make it understandable what really makes sense and how can we do that? And traditionally, the ways that we have always worked are through congressional briefings, through putting together fact sheets, through doing articles, in, and at that point, a weekly newsletter. Uh, and, and so we had those kinds of tools, but it meant having to really get in and really look at this whole issue about aromatics. 
And there were some of people here that were uh, encouraging us to take a look. Uh, and I'm looking at someone here in the front row who was one of those persons. Um, and, and what was really clear was that um, we, we started to look first in terms of thinking about the whole history. And as you've heard before, the history with regard to lead. That lead was in gasoline because there had to be octane to prevent knock. And that therefore, over the years, we also found that we were finding all sorts of horrible, horrible situations with regard to lead poisoning, the toxicity in terms of public health impacts, what this meant for kids, what it meant for adults, all over the country. Finally, 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 after many years of, of research, a lot of work you know, from the public health community documenting the kinds of problems that lead uh, toxicity that lead poisoning was causing, it finally reached the whole point where lead was going to be phased out, but it wasn't until the Clean Air Act amendments that uh, lead was actually banned. And then, of course, the oil industry was, well, we've got to have another octane uh, because we have to have something. And you've heard this already, but it, was, but it was really important in terms of that there's got to be an octane. And of course, the oil industry wanted to make sure that it was a petroleum product, even though ethanol would have handled the whole thing perfectly well. The oil industry wanted to make sure that there was, an, that there was um, a, a petroleum product that was there. And, and the, the thing is that that meant that we started to see aromatics going into gasoline. And as you had heard also earlier, that in terms of the Clean, Clean Air Act amendments, there was essentially an endangerment finding in this section 202L, which indicated that there were health concerns with regard to aromatics, and that EPA clearly was given the authority to phase out, to move, to ban those aromatics um, as, as soon as technically feasible. But nothing happened, and so moving forward, we started to see more and more uh, peer-reviewed literature in terms of whether it was science and technology, environmental uh, journals, uh, various journals, uh, public health journals, where we were starting to see all sorts of issues come up with regard to the role of aromatics. And one of the things that um, you heard a little bit earlier with regard to thinking about the, the BTEX complex in terms of what's in this very toxic stew of aromatics in terms of this benzene, toluene, xylene, uh, other, other chemicals, all of which are extremely toxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, and therefore um, just a really nasty brew. And, and as we found out that, that um, when you have aromatics, that as a result of an incomplete combustion process, you then had, um, and you've heard this mentioned before too, but it's really, really important in terms of thinking about what this means as far as, as the ultrafine particulates, um, as far as PAHs, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and how the, the um, uh, the PAHs basically were kind of propelled by these ultrafine particulates into our bodies in a very different way than what the soot, the, the exhaust that you could see that you could somehow manage through filters other ways. But this stuff is really, really insidious and penetrates into soft tissues into bloodstreams, creating all sorts of problems in terms of cancers, cardiopulmonary disease, um, all sorts of, of lung disease, uh, asthma, uh, issues with regard to cognitive development, uh, reproductive issues, neurotoxicity, and the list goes on and on. And we can provide you with a whole list of journal articles that really look at all of this. So it became really important to think about 
we need to start addressing this because we're seeing more and more of, of this kind of thing. So one thing that EESI did, which I would also encourage people, and certainly people that are listening, to look at, to go to EESI's website. And there is a fact sheet that we did that is very much, even though it is now a few years old, but very, very much on point. And that is called, um, it's, it's um, a brief history of octane and gasoline from lead to ethanol. And as a result of looking at the, all of these health impacts, that is why we actually started talking about aromatics as the new lead because we're seeing very, very similar kinds of things, but ever more uh, uh, adverse health impacts. And of course, for uh, the millions and millions of people who are situated close to congested areas, to uh, busy roadways, uh, things were, are even worse. Even though, as we know, these kinds of pollutants in terms of the secondary organic aerosols can travel uh, very, very uh, wide distances, stay in the atmosphere a long time, at the same time, things are even worse if you are in a congested area. And this has been documented through studies through the um, uh, Columbia uh, School of Public Health, uh, through many, many other kinds of meta-analysis, et cetera. So I think one, one thing, and, and in terms of looking at this issue, we also did a couple briefings that I just wanted to mention quickly. Um, in terms of bringing together various perspectives. One was on future fuels. Can biofuels make gasoline cleaner, cheaper? We also did one entitled Protecting Public Health Through Cleaner Fuels and Lower Emissions. And again, bringing in experts to look at this, including people who are experts in looking at endocrine disruptors and the whole role of these kinds of toxics. Um, upon, upon public health and the really detrimental impact that, that it was having. So the, the thing is that we were also at the same time hearing that because of new fuel economy standards, which all of us who care about efficiency, who care about uh, climate change, were very, very eager to see improved fuel economy standards as a way to really reduce fossil fuel consumption at the same time, in order to do that with the new technology, with direct injection engines, it meant that automakers were saying we also needed improved fuel. We need better performance. We need higher octane. That higher octane, which was really important, is, you know, which would actually provide for improved fuel economy. At the same time, we were really looking, therefore, at a choice, at an opportunity. Do we get that increased octane that is so critical to improve fuel economy, to reduce greenhouse emissions, and to improve air quality, improve public health? Do we get it through going the aromatics, the new lead route, or do we get it through a renewable resource, through ethanol, which does not give us any of those negative benefits, and in fact creates all sorts of positive uh, benefits in many, many different areas. So I will go ahead and stop there and turn to somebody who is a real expert in terms of really looking at all of the details and in terms of looking at all the specifics on these chemicals. Well, Carol, thank you. Uh, and uh, you're the perfect example of someone who has looked at this wide range of disciplines and facts and tried to pull them together into a coherent narrative. And I think that that's the, the essential skill we need here. Well, and one other point that I would just raise is that, you know, while it can sound complex, it's at the same time, I think the story at the bottom, at the bottom line or at the end of the day, that the story is pretty simple in terms of we need cleaner fuels, we need, um, we need higher octane. Um, we do have that choice. We now know that that choice is available, the kind of difference it can make, the kind of penalty that we are paying on the health side. And that affects real people's lives. It affects huge amounts of dollars in terms of thinking about health care. And at the same time, while we may know this, I would also submit that based upon conversations I've had with a lot of people over the years 
um, on the Hill um, in policymaker offices. People do not know this issue. They are clueless in terms of the impacts, what this means. So I think there is so much that's got to be done in terms of letting people know that their health is at stake and why would you want to put your lives, your kids' lives in jeopardy. Well, thank you, Carol. And, and we are going to pivot to Steve here in a second, but I'm going to ask you one question now because we're really, in a sense, going to be changing our focus when we move to Steve. And that is, uh, now that you've done your briefings and uh, you heard the discussion we had with uh, Tim and Boyden, the question is, what is the pathway uh, for engaging Congress in this issue? And do you see either some potential champions or uh, suggested pathways. Uh, you earlier used the, now uh, probably it's an oxymoron to say bipartisan congressional caucus. Uh, it's very hard to get people to work across lines, and yet this is an issue where it's possible. Do you see any, any way forward uh, uh, at a strategic perspective? Um, I am an eternal optimist, and so that allows me to get up in the morning and I think, I, and I hear what everybody has said in terms of how difficult it is, how many hurdles have been put out there. But I think that we have to really look for champions. I am very glad that the uh, Governor's Biofuels Coalition is, that the leadership of that coalition is, is really um, uh, staking a leadership claim on this and is also really trying to now uh, push their congressional delegations uh, with regard to taking some action uh, to help them become better informed and to uh, take some ownership. I think that's critical. I also think that once is never enough, that it does require lots of hard work. Um, but I do think that it is also really critical to both educate policymakers but also go in a very concerted way to the public health community, to the public, to make sure that everybody understands the kinds of health implications, ramifications, that we are really grappling with here. And for people who think, oh, we're just going to go electric, so go away. You know, we have a lot of years where there are going to be a lot of vehicles using gasoline. So why should we sacrifice our health during all of these years when we know better? Well, thank you. That's actually a, a very good segue over to Steve. Uh, and Steve, uh, uh, as the board shows, is the technical director of the Urban Air Initiative, but has also been closely associated for many years with ICM, which is uh, probably the largest manufacturer of ethanol uh, manu manufacturing equipment, uh, and so he's intimately familiar with uh, the uh, uh, ethanol production process as well. Steve, uh, you, we're, we're going to let you do a little technical detail. Well, thank you, Reed. Uh, your introduction, I thought, was uh, really good of, of going through the, the issues here. Um, eight, eight years ago we started the Urban Air Initiative, but I, I think back to about ten years ago when I was actually doing a large octane study with Ford and John Deere. We actually had an oil industry involved and, and they provided some of the test fuels and I thought it was kind of odd that there was no benzene in their test fuels. And, and I asked him about it and he said, well, it's against company policy to put car known carcinogens in test fuels. Yeah, we could do that to consumer fuels. So I, that was kind of my first introduction of uh, test fuels, which I'll talk about in a little bit uh, here in a couple of slides. But uh, our focus has been to research uh, the benefits of ethanol, what the refineries do, what the auto industry needs, and uh, especially we, we are looking at the science here in, in the EPA models. Um, so as we talk about ethanol or aromatics, it really is a discussion about octane that, that should be discussed. Uh, because the aromatics at the oil refinery is what the oil industry goes to when they need to even bump to get to the minimum octane. So I'm going to try to put a face to a name here a little bit in my presentation in the initial slides is 
we use the term BTEX a lot, but I'm going to just try to explain this and hopefully don't go too far. But if we look at aromatics, I'm oh, sorry, uh, in gasoline, we look at something that's very high carbon intensity to produce, and it also has the highest carbon per energy. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about all the health concerns there. If we look at ethanol, we have a low uh, intensity to produce from a carbon point, but we also have less carbon per BTU. Uh, it's renewable. And I think the, the interesting thing is from an octane blending value, ethanol has twice the octane blending value of any component in gasoline. So it's a very effective way of raising octane in our fuel supply. I thought here I should probably try to even introduce what aromatics are a little bit. Uh, if you look at any automotive study, they will at least break gasoline down into three major groups of hydrocarbons. And so in the bottom picture, I thought, well, it'd be kind of interesting to take the most common component of each one of them and let you see that the aromatics in the middle are the worst uh, for producing soot. They have the most resistance to combustion. Uh, so I kind of coined the name the good, the bad, the ugly. 65% <laughs> of gas is saturates. They're prone to much better emissions, but they don't average as much in the octane category here. So the oil industry is going to primarily rely on that 25% aromatics to raise octane. So I thought I was just going to try to introduce to you to that 25% in the, in the summer months, you know, what aromatics are, but they're really anything built on a benzene ring structure. This double bond in carbon is really the cause of a lot of the incomplete combustion, the formation of the toxics, and uh, so I'm hoping you'll have a little bit better understanding. Any study I reference here has got a link if you wanted a copy. Steve, could I just interrupt? Because sure. I think you make a very important point that all aromatics, by definition, have a benzene ring. Right. And EPA reacted to the congressional directive by regulating benzene directly, but they didn't do anything about the other compounds with benzene in them. Right. And actually, my next slide will be a, a good uh, lead into that. Um, I'm, I'm introducing you to the, the family of aromatics. We can say toluene, but it's still methylbenzene. Every one of these aromatics has benzene in its name. Uh, we often say BTEX because those are the most common ones, but over half of aromatics are 40 plus other aromatics, and some of these can be even worse. And so you kind of got a, a figure here to the, to the right hand side of this slide because it's all based on distillation. We go all the way up to even the simplest PAHs in our gasoline. Uh, we can say naphthalene, but if it's pure, we would just say mothballs. Um, so, uh, but to characterize a little bit more on aromatics, like I said, uh, the refineries produce this. It's higher in carbon. It is the primary source for a lot of the toxics we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's slightly lower in the wintertime. Uh, aromatics also has the highest rate of emission. So when we look at the volume in the fuel to what we're measuring on a percentage out of the tailpipe, ethanol or aromatics has the highest rate of emission compared to any other component. Um, and then lastly, it's also, which doesn't get a lot of attention, is aromatics is also the biggest concern for material compatibility, especially in small engines. So especially the variation of aromatics. So there's a lot of baggage associated with aromatics before we even get into the emission side of things. I believe there's a good success story when we talk about what happened as we transitioned even to E10. Uh, in the green line in this chart shows the ethanol content uh, going up from just a few percent to nearly 10 percent over a 10-year period. But in the solid red line you're seeing actual consumer gasoline aromatic content going down. We can see that the refinery has lowered aromatics, and then you get the dilution of adding the ethanol. So even the E0 to E10 has a great success story today by saying we're preventing anywhere from 7 to 8 billion gallons of aromatics being in the market today in the U.S. The U.S. actually averages lower aromatics than Europe, but we have a ways we, we believe we can go. Uh, lastly, the market survey data over the last couple years has shown that we're starting to go back up in aromatics and a lot of that has to do to the sulfur reduction that's going on and the oil industry is actually struggling just to maintain octane in today's market so 
uh, the, the oil industry cannot compete against ethanol from an economic point of view, especially. Um, I think when we go back to why did we start the Urban Air Initiative, I, I, I was actually seeing a lot of the health concerns in automotive studies. Uh, we have General Motors here talking about toxicity and the respiratory disease, these particulate that actually can get right into the bloodstream, causing the damage to the, to the blood vessels. And so we were actually reading this in automotive studies. We have a lot of health studies studying health effects, but how do we tie the reduction of those benefits of, of health studies right back to the source? But here's just an interesting couple uh, older papers, actually, we were looking at seeing these concerns. Um, earlier this morning, you heard Reed and Carol talk about SOAs and PAHs and, and all that. So I kind of wanted to tie this together why it's all associated to aromatics in, the, in our fuel. In the little figures on, on the right side of the slide, you kind of see the single benzene ring going to the PAHs, going to the UFPs. So any one of these uh, uh, five listed here, you can find uh, more health studies focusing on each one of these. So, and, but they're all tied together. So in the aromatics, uh, the EPA study showed benzene going up with increasing aromatics, even though the benzene in the fuel didn't change uh, from a volume point. But the aromatics then also contribute to the PAHs. So what I'm trying to say here is you can't have PAHs until you have the aromatic structure. And then as we look at the ultrafine particulates, as these PAHs go on to create the ultrafines, we can't have the ultrafine particulates until we have PAH formation. So they're really tied together, feeding each other. And then it's also important that as we get to the UFPs, that's what's coming out the tailpipe. Now we're going to start talking about the secondary organic aerosols, what happens in the next 24 to 48 hours. And EPA recently had a, had a, had a report that showed 50% uh, of MSAT, mobile source air toxics in urban areas, actually comes from SOAs. So there's, there's a huge category. And then some health studies will actually look at PM2.5, but in urban areas, a majority, over half the PM2.5 is the SOAs. So you can see how these all kind of tie together back to aromatics and the fuel. So. Uh, I'm going to show a couple slides here just on some of our research uh, showing emission benefits of not only ethanol but some varying aromatics. So even a couple years ago we took three vehicles to an auto manufacturer's test lab near Detroit and we tested multiple fuels. But here I'm just showing the reduction in a percentage going from E0 to simply adding ethanol to make E30. So we have a percentage reduction for three vehicles. Uh, the top chart is mass because that's how we regulate PM or will in the U.S., but the Europe and other countries are adopting a number. So there's always a mass or a number to, to discuss. But the, the reduction here is always consistent while there is variations because it's a difficult measurement to take. Uh, we were seeing that simply adding ethanol made significant reductions. The blue bar is a city driving and the gray bars are a heavy highway driving. And that, again, is just the reduction of simply adding 30% ethanol with these two fuels. Steve? Yes. Um, I think it, it bears uh, explaining a comment you made earlier, which is that we measure particulates by mass or number. Uh, that could, not everybody could be uh, familiar with that. Okay. Uh, mass, of course, means weight. So you just weigh right. the particulate matter. But if the problem area starts to become these tiny ultrafine particulates, they don't weigh much, but the number of particles in the brew is going up, and that's exactly what's happening with the newer engines. Right. The, the number's going up. Also, as you have a higher number, you're going to have, even with the same mass, you're going to have more surface area. And that's where you're finding, because of the pHs is what creates the UFPs, you're finding the pHs will coat the UFPs. And so um, in Europe, they felt it was better to regulate the number because these smaller ones, these sub-23 nanometers, and we're talking PM.01, not PM.25, uh, that is what's more toxic to get into the, into the bloodstream. And so that's why we, in almost all these automotive studies, they will give you both the mass, 
by weight and the number per mile is typically how they do that. But again, this is the percentage reduction for simply adding 30% ethanol. Uh, another study we recently did is we asked the North Carolina State University to test five vehicles using three consumer fuels, but also a E25 by simply adding ethanol to that E10 regular. And in that, we were statistically lower, not only on the PM, which you see here, and the CO, but we're also better on efficiency. So we had the greatest CO2 reduction because of higher octane when we were comparing the E25 to the E10 regular. Um, and also to mention that uh, four of the five vehicles here are non-flex. And as we monitor the computers, these vehicles did very well adapting to uh, you know, the, the higher blends. And so this was a very interesting study for us using PIMS. I'm sorry, we were on-road testing using portable emission system testing, which is becoming very popular because there's a growing concern that the, the certification data or lab data isn't mentioning, uh, measuring real world. So here we have a nice reduction as we compare the first fuel to the second fuel for PMCO, and, and there's other information in that study as, as well on CO2 emissions. So we really didn't have any emission or mileage reduction with E25. More recently, also, but a, a series of three studies with the University of California, Riverside. We asked them to test two FFEs. And uh, so you see uh, in each category, two FFEs, number one and number two. Uh, we created a high and low aromatic. Now, this is the SOA uh, data, the PM going into the SOA. I'm just showing the, the SOAs here, or the, the PM. Um, the SOAs is also very similar to this, but um, when we compared the high and low aromatics, the SOAs went up, the toxics went up, and then when we simply added ethanol, again from the E10 to the E30, we saw a very nice reduction uh, with comparing E10 to E30 in both vehicles. Um, so aromatics was increasing the PM and SOAs, and the ethanol was decreasing. Uh, I have two studies here because I think it's almost really important to have these two together is part of our work was, or UCR was sending these PM samples to the University of Wisconsin for toxicity testing. And so we found that the toxicity was pretty much related to the PM mass. If we could reduce the mass per mile, we were reducing the toxicity of exposure. But the study also didn't find a lot of mutagenic uh, emissions with our PM samples coming from the tailpipe. The second study here is by EPA directly, where they were looking at the mutagenic emissions from what happens with aromatics after the tailpipe, the first 24, 48 hours. And I think this is really important because this is EPA saying that although we regulate the tailpipe VOCs, we're doing nothing to regulate pretty much the, the products of photooxidation, the SOAs. Um, and that the mutagenic uh, ex creation of this stuff was directly related to the photooxidation. Um, and that la lastly, most of these aromatics in urban areas are man-made, so we're not talking uh, something from uh, vegetation or something like that. So changing a little bit here, um, what is the biggest challenge to creating a, a better fuel? What is the biggest challenge in uh, promoting higher blends of ethanol to reduce those emissions? It is our view that it's the test fuels. Uh, whoever creates the test fuels is controlling the outcome of the study. There is no standard today in how test fuels are blended. So there's a lot of conflicting science out there uh, that people are relying on to make policies, but you really need to go back to how were the test fuels blended. Um, so there's, there's a lack of consistency in our science in this area. But as I said earlier, when we simply add ethanol, we make it better. And that comes back down to this two ways that's going on today with, with test fuels. Uh, this match blending allows the test fuel providers to do pretty much anything they want. Uh, you can change a lot of things in fuel to hold the few parameters constant. But in the term of splash blending, again, simply adding ethanol, ethanol has a very favorable story. 
So as we brought our information to the autos, Ford and General Motors actually published this paper in 2014 into regards of how EPA was allowing their test fuels to be blended. And uh, these two key statements are right in the abstract that the exclusive use of this match blending is fundamentally flawed. And, and secondly, a lot of these emission increases EPA and others say uh, are occurring because of ethanol are due to the added aromatics, but, all, but unfortunately being incorrectly attributed towards ethanol. So work we're doing in this area is uh, a little over two years ago, we started with an outside consulting group of a very reputable uh, oil refinery consultant and uh, um, a, some gentleman from, retired from University of West Virginia. And we did a meta-analysis where we went back to all these studies and we not only mo uh, looked at how they modeled the emissions, but we looked at how they blended the test fuels. And we saw a pretty interesting trend there that uh, a lot of these match blended studies are not matching real world and they can be very negative for uh, ethanol in certain areas. But that's not the truth. That's not a fact. I mean, we, we can compare, again, uh, greater aromatic reductions in the real world. So with that, we did this meta-analysis that's found online. We published a secondary, uh, another paper, Society of Automotive Engineering paper uh, last year. We also have another paper coming out using real-world fuels in EPA's model. Uh, that has been accepted and will be published here in a few weeks. And lastly, we're working with a wide uh, group of stakeholders to include oil refineries, the autos, uh, CARB is on there, uh, test fuel providers. We're actually trying to develop a, a fuel blending guide, something that we can inform these researchers who are doing the modeling that are not fuel experts, but they're modeling the results of this study and not having the information there of what they should be modeling. Uh, in our past, we found studies that ac accidentally modeled the wrong fuel, or we found studies that weren't very truthful in their blending because we understand how these properties should change. Uh, so with that, uh, reducing aromatics is simple. We can be putting limitations on that. Ethanol is readily available. Uh, it will reduce uh, the toxic emissions and, and uh, increase octane, protect public health. And I believe if it was done um, uh, correctly, we could be looking at a greater than 50% reduction, maybe 70%, especially in urban areas uh, in the summertime when this photo oxidation is more important. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. I want all these technical experts in the audience to raise their hand and ask a question. And I'm going to uh, call out and say Witherspoon back here. I'm going to call her out by name because I'm so pleased that she's here. She's the executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. And that, to me, is exactly uh, the core constituency that needs to be advocating for change here. But Ense, please ask your question or offer a comment. Thank you, and um, I'm not sure if this is uh, related to this panel in particular, or maybe both from the last two, but um, I think I totally agree with all of the justification that's been put out in these wonderful reports. Um, I think uh, part, if not all, of maybe the challenge of bringing along others in public health, and then specifically some of our lawmakers, may be the protecting public health piece. It seems so absolute in that we've had unfortunate examples, obviously, in our history where unintentional uh, you know, consequences clearly have been the outcome. And my concern is not necessarily on the output, it's on the, in the input, it's on the output. So the, I, what I haven't heard yet are some of the concerns that are being raised um, about n unsustainable practices that this no doubt will incur. So as a primer is being thought and put together, I think it would be huge value added to at least acknowledge what many others in public health are raising as vital concerns. Um, that if this is something that is being deemed as sustainable, then through its whole life course, we need to see that. And if not, I mean, what are the, what are the implications being offered to counter that? So i.e., much more land use, much more water use. Um, the Midwest is already slated to use something like 5% more herbicides in the next coming years. That is not what those of us in Children's Environmental Health want to see as far as more uh, use of pesticides, which have its own level of concerns with women and 
uh, children um, and all of that. So anyway, I just wanted to offer that as not that it hasn't been thought of before, but I just haven't heard it yet today. And I think that that is a huge missing piece right now, especially if we're targeting in the future public health leaders. So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, offer an observation that asks Carol to answer the question. Uh, we are going to have more discussion of that this afternoon, and I know you can't stay for the afternoon, so it's fair enough to ask us while we're here. Uh, it is a complex question. It gets into agricultural production practices, and uh, uh, it's yet another field of expertise. Uh, but Carol, go ahead, please. Well, just briefly, and thank you for that question. And frankly, I would be happy to meet with you um, uh, sometime later or whatever um, to talk further about this, because they, those are very important questions that often do come up, um, and certainly from the environmental community. And a couple things that I think are really important. First of all, we, there, uh, there is going to be a lot more information later today with regard to that, because one of the things and, and to be very honest, I, you know, we are very, very concerned about overall sustainability, life cycle basis, absolutely. And, but, the, but the thing is, it's terribly important to really look at, at what are the key issues. There, right now, there is so much misinformation that is out there, or really old information, that, that is, keeps being repeated and repeated and repeated. And we need to figure out how to finally deal with that and to get people much more current in terms of what the situation really is. Because the numbers with regard to thinking about life cycle emissions and inputs and everything with regard to agricultural production um, are, get better and better every year. Now, that does not mean that the job is done. Absolutely not. And I think that that we need to continue to work on that and, and continuing improvement. But it's really important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's also really important to look at compared to what. And, and, it's, and as we look at, at what is involved in terms of gasoline, that life cycle in terms of aromatics, I think there is no comparison. But I'm happy to follow up. Steve, you want to come in? Yeah, I would like to just add one more thing because we are also uh, uh, people I know are highly involved with the uh, manufacturing of ethanol plants. I think the ethanol industry has somewhat lost its good name when the campaign came out on food versus fuel. But how many times do we hear that people say, well, one third of corn goes to the ethanol industry? But how much corn do we displace? Because what we're doing with our protein today, I believe over half the feeding value of that bushel of corn is still going to livestock, so we're displacing one seventh. Um, ICM just started up the world's most efficient ethanol plant three months ago in Kansas, using waste wood for all our energy use. Uh, that should be coming online soon. Fiber separation technology, uh, reducing our energy costs because now we're not putting everything through the, the ethanol plant. You can take the fiber out on the front end. So I think there's a lot of advantages, uh, a lot of you know going forward. Farmers using less fertilizer with GPS technology, um, you know, precision ag, where they can sit in their tractor and they don't even drive them anymore because the GPS does that. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So I think there's there's a lot of challenges of trying to, you know, update the value of ethanol to a lot of people. Uh, I think that there are at least uh, half a dozen people in the audience who are going to surround you at the break uh, and say. <laughs> So uh, all you ag experts, uh, NSA is going to be able to stay at least a little bit into the lunch hour, so you'll, you'll have a chance to uh, share your cards at least. Uh, but I'll, I'll throw one uh, sort of uh, plug in here uh, uh, out of my own uh, perspective. Uh, as, as most people in the room know, the way California encourages uh, renewable fuels is through a low carbon fuel standard. And it does a very careful analysis, uh, reaching into the actual manufacturing plant by plant of uh, how much uh, fossil fuel use there is, et cetera, et cetera. And they credit those fuels from that facility on the basis of their actual practices. We have an opportunity, which we haven't yet realized, to reach back yet another step further 
and that's to reward the farmers for their practices uh, in uh, how uh, they're producing the corn that is used in the ethanol production. If California or another uh, entity with a low carbon fuel standard gave additional credit for good farming practices that accomplish all the things that you want to accomplish in, say, uh, that economic incentive would single-handedly transform the agricultural industry faster than anything else I'm aware of. Right. And one, one additional thing, I'm so glad you raised the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, too, because one of the, th an additional thing that I think is important about that is that um, a number of years ago, there was a lot of opposition in California um, to the use of ethanol. And with the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, it has become very, very important in terms of helping California. It's playing a very, very significant role now uh, in terms of meeting their, you know, their carbon uh, reduction goals. And um, so I, I think you know, it's really important to look at all these opportunities. And again, the economics, I think, are really critical because there has got to be um, a, a kind of the right incentives and to line up the costs uh, appropriately so people can really make the investments and make all of the changes that we'd all like to see. Other questions for the panel? Doug? Yeah, Steve, you, you mentioned uh, uh, particle mass versus size, and um, I want to just make sure everyone knows some of the materials we have out front. An article came out yesterday that we circulated uh, from um, mostly focused on China, but it's a fascinating article. Uh, you know, you talk about Timely, it just came out yesterday, where the World Health Organization actually uh, states that uh, these ultrafines are, are not regulated. I've always sort of loosely referred to them as either under-regulated or, or not regulated, but they're not regulated. And, and part of the whole mix of fuel testing and everything, how do we get them, and I know that, that they thought that they controlled particulates through sulfur and through stationary sources, but these are smaller for our audience than, than 2.5. And people think that 2.5 is as low as it goes. These are way, way, way lower. So this whole concept of ultra-fine nanoparticles which, of course, becomes a number and not a mass game, but how do we get them to focus on that? Because, again, the evidence is piling up. It, you know, it comes out every day. When, and, again, I'm just pointing out this article came out yesterday where they're, they're, everybody seems to know it and we're not doing anything about it. So I'll throw it out to the three of you, really, but what can we do about that? Because that's where the problem is. If they think we're regulating. Yeah, as I read that article, it's, it's a challenge because some people would look at that and they're just going to throw gasoline under the bus and say it's got to be electric. You know, the, the point here is we can make some significant reductions in a very short time by really going after the source of the PM. Like I said, there's, uh, if you go and try to look at just the aromatics, we can make not only a significant benefit here in the United States, but even a greater reduction in countries like China that has, they're, they're desperately trying to even catch up to the rest of the world how they even regulate fuels. So. Um, I think the best thing we can do is, is to say, you know, it's not gasoline, it's a certain portion of gasoline, and we can do something about it now instead of, I think, some people saying, it's, well, we'll just wait for electric. But, uh. And Steve, I think it's true, uh, you would probably know this better than I do, but uh, uh, we focus on the U.S. where the Clean Air Act restricted aromatic content to 25 percent uh, certain months and areas. But in Europe, and presumably elsewhere in the world, aromatic levels are much higher. Uh, Europe runs higher, uh, though I would say that the overall variation of makeup in like the little bit of China data I have is, is even worse. Um, so and we're talking 40, 40 to 50 percent as opposed to 25 right. percent. And, and, but again, we have some of the lowest octane standards in, in the world. So again, if we tried to move up in the octane, and relied on the oil industry, uh, you're going to have, and we had that in, in, even in Denver recently, it's a little bit off topic, but in concerns of the MOOS model, we actually had the oil industry come in and say, well, if we have to go to back to E0, we're going to increase the aromatics. I mean, they admitted that right in the meeting, that that's the only knob they have today at an oil refinery to replace the octane of ethanol is to go to more aromatics. 
die sooner, right? Yeah. You Steve. die a premium death, right? Steve, this is a kind of a setup question, but uh, one of the facts of air quality regulation is it's only 50 years old. And gasoline was around before we started to regulate it. Uh, what do you think would be the experience of the oil industry if they had to bring uh, gasoline forward as a new fuel? Wow, when you look at all the, the work we had to do just to get E15, I'm always amazed that, you know, it took so long. But how would they be, how would they be looked at in terms of their uh, health effects? Oh, I don't think they would pass at all. <laughs> Other questions uh, around the room? We, we can carry on with this. Thank you. This one's for Steve. You know, we always talk about the volume of benzene and benzene-laced aromatics and gasoline. Can you talk about what comes out of the tailpipe and, and, and that portion of the benzene that you know, doesn't seem to be accounted for? Well, I, I refer a lot of times to a very large study by EPA that actually showed aromatic, or benzene itself doubling out the tailpipe with no change of benzene in the fuel. They were just changing the volume of aromatics. Um, so you can decompose some of these complex uh, aromatics down to a benzene or a benzoaldehyde or, you know, some other oxygenated stuff. Uh, so, you know, that was where I got a lot of the uh, very useful information because it requires speciation. But, you know, again, aromatics can either decompose to benzene or go towards the PAHs, uh, but they have a very high emission rate as well. Um, and I, what I mean by that is let's say you have an E10 with 10% toluene, you'll find three to four percent, three to four times more toluene itself out the tailpipe than ethanol. Uh, the challenge we have in a lot of these studies is they're actually raising the aromatic level with increasing ethanol. Completely backwards to real worlds, but that's how you're getting the conflicting studies out there uh, that, you know, I've even seen studies say we raise, ethanol raises benzene, and then you look at the fuel properties and I go, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, you know, it's the manipulation of science. Steve, you talk about, in Denver especially, they have the summer um, blend and the winter blend, and, and I've always understood that the winter blend was supposed to be better for the smog. Does it really change the particulate matter that's coming out of the back, summer to winter? Actually, from a particulate mass, uh, it's worse in the winter just because of the cooler temperatures. Uh, your fuel properties, as far as the propensity to make PM, will probably be a little less in the winter because they can go to, uh, they can, I mean, every year in Kansas City is the highest in aromatics compared to St. Louis because of RVP. Uh, so I would say you, you got kind of a mixed answer there, sorry. Um, I can show you a lot of data on that. But my concern, though, in Denver is, that, is they're using the Moose model based on flawed science that really downplays the dangers of aromatics by downplaying the benefits of ethanol. Thank you. Um, some of the flawed science that you're speaking of is very concerning. Can you give just some examples of who's funding some of this and where are some of the, these coming from? Are they coming from well-established academic institutions or not to call them all out, but I'm just curious, this is a concern. We see a similar trend in what they call match blending by increasing the aromatics but reducing the saturates to add ethanol. Uh, a lot of these studies are doing it because that's the way it's been done in the past. It really started about 10, 15 years ago, and, and I can point you just to what we call the CRC E67 study. So if you just search that, you'll find it. Uh, that's actually a study that says ethanol uh, created uh, increased benzene emissions. But there's different ways to model the fuel, prom, pr the fuel properties that we can show. It's not the ethanol. is They were making a dirtier gas to add ethanol. And unfortunately, it's a study like that, or there's even studies out there that just tested a few fuels. And you look at the fuel properties, and, and it's like that's not even real world. It's, so the ethanol industry lacks, uh, in, and I believe in the fuel side in general, we lack the ability 
to say this study is relevant, this study is not. Once they're peer reviewed, it gets really thrown into the, into the mix and it's very hard to, to be selective in your studies uh, when you know, we, we have this conflicting data. This is not a question, sorry, but it's to complement Steve's answer. Also, a lot of these studies are coming from an entity called the Coordinating Research Council, which receives more than 50% of its funding from the American Petroleum Institute. So, so yeah. So, Carol, I'm going to give you a hard question to end on, and Steve, you can chime in on this if you want. This is really the hardest question to me in this whole area. We talk about how multidisciplinary this is and it has many benefits. It also has many harms. And uh, there are harms, uh, I'll give you an example, in the recent Harvard study when they calculated a one uh, microgram reduction in PM, they said it would save 12,000 lives uh, uh, on that alone. But a similar reduction in ozone would save 1,000 lives. So as we think about this problem and the choices that inevitably have to be made, how do we value the different benefits and compare them? How do we uh, hopefully not trade off but at least evaluate, well, this has a climate benefit and this has a health benefit and this has an economic benefit. I'm sure you've thought about that. Where, where do we have to stick our thumb heaviest on the scale? I should defer to Steve, undoubtedly. But, but one thing I guess I would say is how important it is to really look at these issues holistically and to really look at, say, all of the, um, look at all of the issues that surround it and look at all of the potential benefits and where are there um, detriments or, or downsizes and or downsides and to really so that you really can look at the whole thing in an appropriate context rather than looking pulling out one thing and looking at it um, in a silo uh, I think too many times we don't look at things in an integrated holistic way and we suffer um, in uh, from a policy perspective many times because we don't. I think as, as we've collected a lot of not just the, the automotive studies but the health studies, um, I think it's a, always been a challenge on my view. How do you connect with those that are doing the health studies? It feels like sometimes we do health studies to do more health studies. You know, we need to do more information. They're, they're researching, you know, trying to figure out exactly where the the, the cause and effect is coming from, but they're not given the rest of the story. Uh, how do you give these health researchers the, the, uh, the information to what would happen if we make a 50% reduction or 25% reduction? Um, so there's, I think that's the hardest thing is to bring this f to a full cycle of from the fuel tank to the air quality 48 hours afterwards. Which is why it would be wonderful to figure out how to put together a group of health researchers and really ask a whole series of those kinds of questions, let them also ask a lot of questions so that we could help figure out some of this together. And I just want to pivot that question right back to you, Reed, in terms of what you think. Funny you would do that. I was ready to say it anyway, Carol. <laughs> I'm actually going to bring in another science uh, that we haven't talked as much about, which is epidemiology. The, the, the research we have on PAH damage to young children was done by uh, a team at Columbia led by Frederica Pereira over a 15-year period, very careful, uh, controlled study where, uh, as I recall, 200 women who were initially pregnant and then gave birth, uh, and they separated them based on the PAH exposure uh, that, they, that they had had and, and came to conclusions about that. That's extraordinarily difficult work to do. It's expensive and it involved 200 women. If the conclusion is that microscopic exposure to PAHs in the atmosphere has 
lead-like effects. It's almost impossible to imagine extrapolating that to the entire U.S. population. But we don't have any idea how much the current incidence, for example, of ADHD, which has been at least reportedly rising over recent decades, how much that's related. We don't really have an idea whether there is widespread impact on IQ and child development because of these very low levels of exposure. It's almost an impossible so question. So autism has been linked. But yeah. Potentially yeah. autism. Yeah. But t to me, that's when I say, where am I going to put my thumb on the scale? It's protecting those kids and public health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's, uh, we have, uh, I think, a couple minutes for uh, a break so that you can make a quick trip out or get your cup of coffee, and then we'll start promptly in about five minutes on our next panel. Thanks very much to these great speakers. All right, Anne, on to you. Well, good morning, everyone. We have heard a lot of very informative information today about the history of ethanol, um, about how ethanol ha is uh, cleaning up our environment, cleaning up our air that we're breathing, which has all been really educational, great topics. Um, and I'm really excited because our next speaker is going to talk about the improvements in corn ethanol uh, and what we're doing to reduce carbon emissions. Um, it's certainly a really uh, important topic, a very timely topic right now. Um, there's a lot of attention being paid on climate change. Uh, and ethanol has a big role in that in reducing carbon emissions. And so I'm really excited for, for Jeff's slides. Um, this issue for the National Farmers Union has long time been a very important issue for us. Uh, we are big proponents of a move to E30. We actually have two of our state presidents here, Doug Somke from South Dakota and Gary Wordish from Minnesota. So um, this issue really couldn't be more important to our organization. And so we really appreciate hearing from Jeff. Uh, and so with that, I'll get to it. Um, Jeff Cooper is our next uh, speaker. He is the president and CEO of the Renewable Fuels Association. Um, Jeff is really a trailblazer and a leader in our renewable fuels industry. Uh, and I'm very proud that he is here to speak for, uh, for the ethanol industry to talk about such an important topic. Uh, so thank you, Jeff. With that, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ann, and, and thanks to all of you for the opportunity. Uh, when, when Ann asked if I would come talk about the latest and greatest developments in, in corn ethanol's carbon footprint, I, I eagerly said, of course I will. This is, a, this is an issue that I have always been very passionate about uh, and have been working on for 15 years. Uh, and unfortunately, there just continues to be a tremendous amount of misunderstanding, misinformation, old data, uh, bad science uh, around this en entire issue. And so it remains uh, a fight for us uh, to try and get the you know sound science and 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 fresh data um, and just good information in front of policymakers and 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 regulators uh, and and other stakeholders. I, th I think the questions uh, in, in the, at the end of the last session uh, really speak to a lot of the uh, uh, kind of conventional wisdom around uh, corn ethanol's life cycle and its and its impact. So I was hoping that uh, she'd be able to stick around to to hear this presentation, but uh, I will catch up with with her later. Uh, but again, I, I just kind of want to talk about uh, the, the corn ethanol carbon life cycle. Uh, and I want to start at a very high view. This is actually a, a 30,000 kilometer high view. Uh, and a, just a fascinating study that came out a few years ago from the National Academies where they uh, developed a, a new technology, a new method for measuring photosynthetic activity. Uh, using satellites. And what they found through this study and through this data, which was a bit of a surprise to them, is that the Midwest part of the United States uh, during the growing season here in the U.S. Uh, boasts more photosynthetic activity than any other region on the globe. Um, and you can see that reflected in the bright pink uh, that shows up there in the, in the heartland of the U.S. Um, so there's more carbon dioxide being sucked out of the atmosphere uh, by that region of the country than anywhere else in the world uh, during the North American or the Northern Hemisphere growing season. 
Uh, you know, one other finding from this study that I thought was uh, very interesting uh, was specifically about the ability of corn plants to assimilate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and quickly suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequester it in the grain and in the stalks and in the roots and, and in the soil. Uh, and, and really, these, these scientists were, uh, you know, pleading with the scientific community to do a better job of accounting for that ability of the corn plant to assimilate CO2 uh, as they analyze sort of the life cycle impacts of, of corn-based products, uh, but also the impacts of, of climate change uh, on, you know, agricultural production in that region of, of the world. So a very fascinating study, very high-level view to start out with, and I would encourage you to, to, to take a look at this. Uh, NASA scientists were involved in this, and, and they actually have some really cool videos uh, two that go along with some of the satellite uh, analysis that they did. So when you take all that CO2 out of the air and then, you know, you've got 90 million acres of corn um, actively pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, where does it end up? And again, this is a very simplified kind of cartoonish schematic of where that CO2 goes. And it's <laughs> overly simplified, of course. Uh, but what, what, what you see when we use corn for ethanol specifically, which is about, you know, five billion bushels or about a third of the crop uh, produced annually, uh, is that's, that carbon that gets locked up in the corn kernel uh, goes to the ethanol production facility and in, in rough terms, about one third of it leaves uh, as CO2 emissions during fermentation. About one-third of that carbon uh, becomes uh, locked up or contained in the distiller's grains co-products that, that Steve Vandergren was talking about. Uh, they, 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 you know, that is fed to livestock and, and poultry and returns to the atmosphere. Uh, and then one-third ends up in the fuel, in the ethanol itself, and comes back out the tailpipe as CO2 when that fuel is combusted in an internal combustion engine. Uh, and then you know, this cycle continues and the next crop of, of corn that's growing sucks up that same amount of, of CO2. So what we see with bioenergy and really the benefit of bioenergy is that we're recycling atmospheric carbon. Uh, and when you contrast that to what we do with fossil fuels, uh, you know, it's a very distinct difference. With fossil fuels, we're, we're taking carbon that's been sequestered underground for hundreds of millions of years been locked up, you know, carbonaceous material uh, deep underground, and we're making that into fuel, we're extracting the energy out of it, and then we're venting it into the atmosphere. It's a new emission, it's additive. Uh, with bioenergy, we don't see that. We are simply recycling uh, CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. And believe it or not, you know, this is a fairly simple concept, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about, uh, about this cycle. Um, you know, you've got professors at uh, University of Michigan, for instance, that, that pretend that that last piece of this cycle isn't real or doesn't occur. Um, so, you know, we spend a lot of time just re-educating people about this carbon cycle that you learn about and photosynthesis, uh, things you learn about in, in seventh or eighth grade, uh, you know, science class. Now, of course, the, the question comes up, well, what about all the energy used? in this process to take that corn and, and you know, plant the seed in the ground, to harvest it, uh, to fertilize it, uh, to protect it from, from insect and, and uh, other pressures. Uh, what about you know, harvesting that grain and, and shipping it to the ethanol plant? Um, you know, what about the energy use at the, the ethanol facility and then shipping that ethanol to, to the end user? Um, all of those emissions, all of those life cycle emissions and, and energy use uh, is really the subject of, of life cycle analysis, uh, sort of cradle to grave analysis, and, and we do have very good tools and very uh, well-tested methods of, of measuring these impacts. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about some of that. And, and this schematic just, you know, again, at, at kind of a 101 level shows some of those inputs uh, at various stages of the ethanol production process, uh, you know, and, and in life cycle analysis, we typically use a, a, a functional unit called grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of energy. Uh, and, and, and really what we do is we sum up all of the energy used from beginning to the end of this process uh, and all of the emissions related to that energy use. 
uh, and that's used to generate what we call a carbon intensity score or, or, or a CI score. Um, you'll see one uh, input there uh, into this process that's got an orange arrow and a question mark, and, and that's been the subject of a lot of debate, um, a lot of discussion, a lot of analysis uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, and that's around this, this notion of, of land use change um, and, and whether expanding our use of agricultural products for biofuels is somehow causing expansion of cropland into native grassland or into forest. And, and if we're chopping down forest uh, to make room for biofuel crops, uh, shouldn't those emissions be charged to the ethanol life cycle? Uh, it, they probably should if that was happening. Uh, but I'm going to show you some of the latest uh, developments there. And, and again, this, this gets to some of the questions that were asked at the end of the last uh, panel. Uh, but I want to start with, you know, again, I think one of the reasons that there is such a lack of of understanding um, about corn ethanol's current life cycle is because this is the last thing that a lot of people remember about corn ethanol's greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, back around 2008, 2009, both the US EPA and the California Air Resources Board were evaluating corn ethanol's life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and they were doing so because they had you know, brand new laws that they were writing regulations on and uh, beginning to implement, and, and those laws required uh, these agencies to evaluate uh, the life cycle emissions of not just corn ethanol, but various other fuels as well. And, you know, it was a, a fairly new science in terms of, of uh, you know, broadening things beyond kind of that simple contained supply chain. Uh, you know, EPA decided, well, we want to look at all the ripple effects of, of what happens if we increase demand for renewable fuels. And, and then CARB jumped in and said they wanted to do the same. Uh, but, you know, the initial analyses from both these agencies were incredibly flawed uh, based on really outdated information and data, uh, based on, you know, using methodologies and tools that were not quite ready for prime time. Uh, and so what you ended up with is, is EPA said, uh, look, our analysis shows that, that on average, corn ethanol reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 21 percent, but that doesn't happen until 2022. And so they baked in some assumptions about, you know, process improvements that would be needed to get you over, over that 20 percent level. Uh, and then at the same time, you had the Air Resources Board in California saying average corn ethanol doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions when you compare it to gasoline. They're about the same. And the bright green piece of these bars that you see for both analyses is that land use change emission estimate. And again, this is based on the notion that, you know, if we, if we grow demand for, for corn ethanol, um, you know, the, the Brazilians are going to have to chop down rainforest to plant more soybeans because there will be less acres for soybeans in the in U.S. And, and all these ripple effects and, and kind of knock-on things are happening. And they use these... Um, economic models, partial equilibrium models to, to estimate all these things, and, and this is where they ended up. Uh, so obviously, if this is the last time you checked in on corn ethanol's life cycle analysis, you've got some bad information and, and bad data. This is, a, you know, this, this was bad when it came out, and it's really bad now. Uh, and of course, you know, hindsight is always 20-20. Uh, some would argue that those regulators were doing the best they could based on what was available. Uh, but here we are a decade later, and this is what we know today. We know that uh, the real world data shows that those early estimates of land use change were grossly overstated. Uh, there has not been net expansion of cropland in the U.S. Um, there's been no identifiable relationship between biofuel production uh, and deforestation in the Amazon or, or, or Malaysia or anywhere else. Uh, and so when you look at those original estimates of land use change emissions, the first paper that came out, the first analysis that was kind of the, the nuclear bomb that dropped in this whole discussion was, was from Tim Surchinger at Princeton. And he came out with this cobbled together slapdash analysis and said the, the land use change emissions alone are over 100 grams per megajoule. And, you know, that doesn't even address all the process related kind of supply chain emissions. And just for reference, gasoline is around 95, 98 
milligrams per megajoule. So he was saying just the land use change emissions alone make ethanol worse than gasoline. Uh, a, a year or two later, you know, EPA and CARB came out with their estimates on land use change. They were about 30 grams per megajoule each. Uh, and more recently, uh, around 2015, CARB revised its analysis and, and brought it down to 19, which we still think is, is far too high. Uh, Purdue University's got a, one of the economic models that was used by EPA and CARB both. Uh, so they've been continually updating their, their modeling and they've recently came out with a 12, 12 gram per megajoule number. Uh, but we think the most uh, reputable and sound analysis of what is actually occurring in terms of land conversion that could possibly be tied to biofuel expansion has been done by the Department of Energy and Argonne National Laboratory, specifically in conjunction with some of the folks at Purdue. Uh, and their latest analysis shows, you know, uh, land use emissions, if they're occurring, are probably on the order of four to seven grams per megajoule. Uh, we also know 10 years later that the, the uh, agencies, you know, EPA and CARB both grossly overestimated emissions that happen in the rest of the supply chain as well. How much energy is being used at the ethanol plant? Um, how much fertilizer is being put uh, down by the farmer? Uh, what is the corn yield? What are the ethanol yields? Um, you know, 10 years later, we have a lot better data on that, and it shows that they were way off in, in, their, in their assumptions. Uh, and specifically on the question of land use, I, I want to just highlight quickly uh, that chart on the left there. Uh, when Congress passed the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, which expanded the RFS-2, it included in the law specifically uh, provisions that said if cropland in the U.S. expands beyond this baseline level in 2007, uh, then that feedstock, you know, any corn, soybeans, any, any feedstock that would come off those expanded acres would not, be, would not qualify uh, for REN generation under the RFS if it was converted into biofuels. Uh, so there were provisions in the law uh, that prohibited the expansion of cropland for the purposes of, of producing biofuels. And so what that chart shows is what that 2007 baseline level was, is 402 million acres in the U.S. were engaged in, in crop production or, or some other kind of agricultural production. Um, each year EPA is required to estimate agricultural land use relative to that, to that baseline. And what you see there is each and every single year since 2007, that amount of agricultural land continues to trend downward. So we are well under the amount of cropland that was in production in 2007 when the RFS was expanded. Uh, the other chart that I'm showing here is, is you know, sort of addresses one of the other uh, myths that was popular around uh, the 2007-2008 the time frame, which is, you know, what we do here in the U.S., if we expand our, 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 our base of cropland, it's going to push uh, soybeans and wheat and, and, and other crops um, to the margin, and other countries, other producers around the world are going to have to make up uh, that, that marginal production that we lose here in the U.S. And so it's going to happen in Brazil, and, um, you know, what's going to happen is they're going to plow up their pastures, and they're going to plant soybeans, and the cows that were eating the grass on those pastures are going to be pushed into the rainforest, so they're going to cut the rainforest down and, and feed the cattle on new pastures in, in, in the rainforest. And so, you know, through all these kind of convoluted uh, reactions, you know, the agencies were coming up with these land use change analysis and, and, and emissions estimates. What we've seen in the real world is deforestation rates in the Amazon uh, have trended down significantly since 2004. Uh, now, we don't have 2019 data yet. Uh, it's likely to show an increase, right, based on what's been going on in, in Brazil. Uh, but clearly that has nothing to do uh, with our, our production of biofuels uh, here in the U.S. Uh, you know, I, I also want to look at what's been happening on the farm uh, the last 10 or 20 years. And, and again, I, I wish uh, the, the, the woman who asked the question at the last panel was, was here to see this. Um, we are not expanding our use of fertilizers. Uh, these three plots show farmers' use of the three kind of key macronutrients that are used in corn production, uh, nitrogen, potassium, and potash. And this is on a, a you know, input per unit of output basis. And what we've seen is, is farmers ha have grown more efficient 
in their use of, of not only these fertilizers and, and macronutrients, uh, but if I had charts that showed uh, pesticide and herbicide application, it would show an even steeper downtrend. Uh, so farmers have become far more efficient in their resource use. Uh, and again, that, you know, all of these products have greenhouse gas implications. And so when we're using less fertilizer, we are emitting less greenhouse gas uh, emissions on the farm. Uh, this data, unfortunately, only runs through 2016. Uh, this is from USDA. Uh, when the 2018 data becomes available, we expect to see a, a continuation or an acceleration of, of this downward trend. Uh, here's another way of looking at land use in the U.S. specifically for corn. Uh, the blue bars and the left axis there show millions of, of acres of corn planted in the U.S. And what you see there is all the way back to 1930, uh, we haven't really expanded our, our acreage that is planted to corn. In fact, we're lower today than we were in the 1930s uh, by 10 million acres or so. Uh, but if you look at the orange line and the other axis, that's how many bushels we're getting off of each acre of corn. And so you go back to 1929, 1930, we were getting about 25 bushels per acre. Today we're getting 175, 180 bushels per acre as a national average. Uh, states like Iowa, Illinois, you know, they're upset if their state average isn't 200 bushels per acre. Uh, and all of this has been achieved, at least in the last few decades, with reduced inputs per unit of output. Uh, so again, this is, a, a, I think, a fascinating story that we're not doing a good, good enough job of telling, quite obviously, uh, when, we, when we still have questions about the sustainability and, and impacts of commercial corn production and, and, and what it means for the ethanol life cycle. We're seeing improvements at the ethanol plant as well. Um, and I'm sure Jim Sire could speak to these quite well. Uh, this is just the last five years. And, and what this is looking at is uh, BTUs per gallon. How much energy is the ethanol plant using per gallon of, of production for, for ethanol? Um, and you go back to 2014, and it was about 28,000 BTUs per gallon. And I wish this chart went back to 2000 or, or the late 90s, because that number would have been double. It would have been around 40, 45,000 BTUs per gallon. Uh, but, but again, just in the last five years, you've seen a reduction from 28,000 down to about 25,000. And these are real numbers. Uh, they come from a, an accounting firm out of the Twin Cities, Christensen and Associates, that has a benchmarking program that I think something like 80 ethanol plants belong to. So, you know, nearly half the industry is submitting its numbers every month uh, and comparing, you know, comparing their operations to their competitors. Uh, the green bar shows kind of the top quartile, uh, the top 25 percent, and you can see their energy use is, is even far lower than, than the average. So when you take all of those improvements and add them together, uh, what you get is a significant reduction in the overall life cycle greenhouse gas emissions uh, associated with, with corn ethanol. Uh, Carol mentioned on the last panel that California, you know, 10 years after they started the low carbon fuel standard, um, are realizing that, hey, this is a pretty good fuel when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. Um, it, it's available at a low cost. Um, and, and, and yes, it's not immediately changing California to full carbon neutrality, uh, but it's doing a pretty darn good job of reducing emissions in that state. Uh, what this chart here shows is California's, this is data straight from the Air Resources Board, um, every quarter they publish the average carbon intensity of the ethanol that was used in the state. And if you go back to one of the slides I showed earlier, they originally started out in 2009 saying ethanol is worse than gasoline, or, or no better. Uh, we were able to convince them that by 2011, when this program began implementation, that ethanol is better than gasoline, and, and we showed them tons of data, you know, lots of modeling, um, and they said, well, okay, it might be marginally better, we'll, we'll, you know, 88.5 grams per megajoule compared to 96 for, for gasoline. So fine, we'll, we'll agree that corn ethanol gives you about an 8% reduction. And that was borne out as individual producers submitted their data and their natural gas receipts and, and the mileage that the ethanol was traveling to the state and everything else. But over time, you've seen that reduction fall dramatically. 
uh, we've seen about a 33% reduction in the carbon intensity of ethanol consumed in California. And today, the Air Resources Board would tell you, yeah, ethanol in the third quarter of 2019 was reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 40%. Uh, compared to California gasoline. And that still includes a, you know, 19 grams of that 59 gram number is a land use change penalty that we still think is, is, is unjustified. So even with that bogey, uh, we're still achieving a, a greater than 40% reduction in California. Uh, also want to point out the orange line at the top, which is the comparator, that's gasoline. What's happened to the carbon intensity of gasoline in that same time? It's gotten worse. Uh, five or six percent worse as the sources of crude oil that, that are being used to produce gasoline that's used in the state have gotten more carbon intensive and, and harder to extract. Uh, and in fact, you know, again, you go back to 2009, 2010, uh, I remember going to some of the hearings where, where members of the Air Resources Board said, we just don't see much of a role for corn ethanol in this program. Uh, well, here we are a decade later, and ethanol is responsible for about 40% of the greenhouse gas reductions achieved under that program since its beginning in, in 2011. Uh, that's more than any other low-carbon fuel. It's four times more than electricity. Uh, and if you're just focusing on the gasoline side of, of the equation, just the gasoline pool, uh, ethanol is responsible for about 85% of the reductions achieved in the, in the gasoline pool. So times have changed, uh, but we have a lot more work to do, and we think we have a lot more room for improvement in the corn ethanol life cycle. Um, you know, I want to go back to this little cartoon that shows about a third of that carbon that that corn, you know, those corn acres were sucking out of the atmosphere, returns to the atmosphere through fermentation at the ethanol plant. What if we were to capture that CO2? Uh, what if we were to sequester that CO2 or use it for enhanced oil recovery? Uh, significant benefits could come from that. Um, today we've got, you know, maybe two out of every 10 ethanol plants is capturing some of that CO2 um, and selling it into the beverage, you know, bottling industry or, or food service or, or other places where, where CO2 is, is used. Uh, very little of the CO2 coming from fermentation today is being sequestered underground, although that's changing. Um, just within the last few months, uh, Red Trail Energy in North Dakota uh, has, it, they are doing carbon capture and sequestration. And they have applied for a, a pathway in California. Um, the Air Resources Board is looking at it. Uh, if CARB approves it, what they're going to see is a reduction in their CI score from about 75 grams per megajoule down to about 35 grams per megajoule. So capturing and sequestering the CO2 from fermentation um, could result in about a 40 gram per megajoule uh, improvement in, in the ethanol uh, CI score. But I want to start with the CO2 uptake by the corn itself. Uh, it was mentioned on the last panel that corn producers today have, have made remarkable improvements in how they're managing agric agricultural soils. And, and so much of the, uh, the CO2 that those plants are pulling out of the atmosphere is in fact being sequestered in the ground, uh, especially when you look at uh, no, you know, tillage systems like no-till or, or um, other conservation tillage methods. Uh, the root masses have gotten so much bigger. Um, the disruption of the, of the soil has, has been minimized. Uh, farmers are not getting credit for that se sequestration that's occurring today. Uh, they should be getting credit for it. Uh, we're working with regulatory agencies to, to, on ways to do that. Uh, but there again is probably another 20 or 25 grams per megajoule that is being left on the table. Uh, and, and would see, you know, even further adoption of these practices if farmers were incentivized uh, to, to adopt them. So I, I just want to finish with, a, with a, a few slides based on this one's based on some modeling that, that we did at RFA um, that shows, and, and this is actually a year old, um, but it shows kind of the, the average kind of typical corn ethanol today, uh, you know, would be about a 57 gram per megajoule number if you're using the, the argon greet model. 
and that's about a 40 to 45 percent reduction versus gasoline. Again, that's a, that's a big reduction. That's something we should be proud of. Um, but we think within the next three to five years, due only to improvements on the farm and at the ethanol plant and technologies we know are being adopted today by ethanol producers, uh, technologies that are being adopted on farm, uh, that reduction, that, will, that the carbon footprint will continue to shrink. And, and we expect in the next three to five years, the average gallon of ethanol is going to achieve a 50 to 60 percent reduction versus gasoline. But longer term, if we have the right policy incentives in place, the right uh, regulations in place, uh, and, and just the right signals being sent, we think that you know, corn ethanol can, can truly approach carbon neutrality, uh, even when all the energy inputs and emissions are summed together. Uh, if we're adopting carbon capture and sequestration technology, if we're fully crediting the soil se carbon sequestration that's happening, uh, we think, you know, that offsets or more than offsets uh, the emissions related to natural gas consumption at the ethanol plant, um, emissions from fertilizer production and, and application and, and other phases of the life cycle. So I, I showed this slide around a few times last year and, and people said, oh man, that, you know, yeah, that sounds great, looks real nice, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll believe it when we see it. Uh, so I was really pleased when a few weeks ago at another meeting I was at, uh, some modeling work that I was completely unaware of was presented and basically found the same thing. And this came from the Great Plains Institute. They're a, uh, an NGO out of the Twin Cities. Uh, and they basically said, you know, if you start on the left with sort of the greet default kind of average corn ethanol today, you've got a 55 gram per megajoule number. Again, 45% reduction versus gasoline. But as you work across to the right uh, and you assume the adoption of, of some of these other technologies, you can get to carbon neutral or carbon negative uh, corn ethanol. And, and the green bar you see on the end there where you're actually, um, you know, providing a 34 gram per megajoule um, carbon, you know, uh, benefit um, it assumes that the ethanol plant is using renewable natural gas. Uh, you heard Steve. Vandergren talk about the facility in Kansas. You know, it's, it's, it's using wood waste um, to generate its, its thermal energy needs. So, so there you go. But it also has carbon management and carbon capture and sequestration. So, you know, in theory, if an ethanol plant is using that suite of technologies, uh, it could be achieving a negative uh, carbon score. Uh, and you put that ethanol in an FFV or a flex fuel hybrid, um, it's going to do every bit as good or better uh, than an electric vehicle. Uh, so this is just the final slide, and, and, and I just wanted, this is probably hard to interpret, uh, so you may want to study it a little careful, you know, more carefully when the, when the slides are sent around. Uh, but what this shows is, is just the, the carbon intensity number um, across the bottom axis and what that should result in in terms of a, a premium price uh, for the ethanol at varying uh, carbon values in the California market. And so focus on the yellow line at the top because that's really where uh, carbon prices are in California today. That's $200 per metric ton. Um, so, you know, for example, if you have a, a CI score of 65, uh, you go up to where that yellow line is, and that should result in a 25 or 30 cent per gallon premium uh, for your ethanol. Uh, that's a nice premium to get if you're an ethanol producer. You can take that and reinvest it in, in you know, more technologies, cleaner technologies to take that CI score down further. Uh, now, I will tell you, and, and ethanol producers would certainly tell you, they're not seeing that full benefit today in, in the California marketplace. And the reason for that is the market is flooded uh, with this sort of low CI corn ethanol. There's more supply than there is demand for uh, in the state of California, and that's because they have a 10% cap on the amount of ethanol that can be blended with gasoline. Uh, you, you, you boost that to 15% or 30%, um, you're going to see that value trickle back upstream uh, to the ethanol producer. Um, the other thing I would just point out real quickly while we're talking about this is, you know, where do you think E85 sales are growing most rapidly? It isn't Iowa, it isn't Minnesota, it's in California. 
and it's just going like gangbusters out there because of this equation, because of the, the value uh, that comes from the carbon intensity reduction. Putting a, putting a monetary value on carbon reduction has absolutely uh, incentivized and encouraged innovation in the retail space in California, but also innovation in the production of, of these fuels. Uh, the other box I have here is just corn fiber ethanol, and, and we have a, an increasing number of member companies um, that are taking the cellulosic fiber that's in the corn kernel, and rather than passing it through to the animal feed co-product, uh, they're converting it into ethanol, into cellulosic ethanol. And it has a very low carbon intensity score, somewhere in the 30s. Um, there was 19 million gallons of this product recorded in CARB's last uh, data release, so it is happening. Uh, and again, you can see the sort of economic premium associated with that level of, of low CI ethanol. Um, so, you know, LCFS was brought up in the last session, and I just wanted to point out that it has been, after fits and starts uh, at the beginning with California, it has been a, an important policy for our industry and, and one that we today uh, support, even though there are further improvements that we think need to be made uh, to how they do CI scoring and, and life cycle analysis. Uh, so th that's really it. I just dropped a lot of data and information and, you know, charts and slides on you, but uh, happy to address any questions, uh, any comments that you have, or Ann, I don't know how you want to, what direction you want to take this. I think we have, thank you. I, I know we're running up against lunch, so we'll, but I think we do have time maybe for a question or two. Um, just a real quick comment. Um, this is a phenomenal presentation, and I've seen parts of this before because um, RFA and the National Farmers Union is working with different groups to try to really educate them. Uh, we recently went to an event with the Carbon Capture Coalition and presented in front of a bunch of environmental groups and labor unions and um, entrepreneurs uh, and even uh, refining interests. And people were really blown away because they had no idea all these things had changed. So I think it really underscores the importance of events like today um, and all the rest of the speaking engagements that we're doing to try to publicize that. So just an editorial thank you. That was phenomenal. Dave, I saw you had a question. Thanks, Jeff. It was outstanding. Um, I see we're on the uh, CI scores in the, in the LCAs, the life cycle analyses. Everything is compared against gasoline, per se. Uh, as you well know, the aromatics component of gasoline, EPA itself admits is at least 25% more carbon intensive. Other data shows much higher. Uh, have you ever talked to folks, even at the CARB folks, about having the comparison, if we get especially to the point where we're substituting for aromatics, where they're, they're comparing to that more carbon intensive component? Uh, that's a great question, Dave. I mean, and, and we have said from the beginning, we need to be comparing ethanol to what it's replacing. And that's not just gasoline, right? It's, it's aromatic hydrocarbons and other octane sources. Um, there has been some interest in, in, in looking more carefully at uh, those sorts of comparisons. Uh, Argonne National Lab, in, in one of their iterations of the GREEP model, did in fact um, do that sort of analysis where they're comparing ethanol as an octane uh, source to, to other competing octane sources on a life cycle basis and did find exactly what you're talking about. Additional carbon uh, savings, uh, you know, compared to, to, other, you know, to, to other octanes versus just looking at gasoline. Uh, so, but, but that's an area of life cycle analysis and, and um, just this field that needs more work and, and, and more resolution. Um, you know, the other thing we've said is, is we need to be, you know, in, in California and other places, if you're going to compare us to gasoline, you can't compare us to the national average gasoline. You need to compare us to the sources that are being used in that jurisdiction. Uh, we, we know, uh, you know, that there are varying degrees of carbon intensity when we talk about crude oil sources as well. So uh, lots of work to do in terms of establishing the right baseline and, and, and frame for comparison. Two, two quick questions, Jeff. Uh, one on the uh, the CO2 recovery from a plant. You know, you said there's certain plants that are doing that. Uh, and you mentioned oil recovery. I know in the past it was hydroponics and greenhouse, you know, grown tomatoes and whatnot. But uh, just refresh me, wasn't there a, a tax incentive if the CO2, was it 
general for capturing CO2 or specifically if it was used for oil extraction? Wasn't there a, a, some legislation? Yeah, the, the 45Q tax credit um, that, that came through what, a year and a half or two years ago, um, it, it provides a substantial benefit. It's $35 a ton yeah. uh, for sequestration or EOR, uh, which, you know, you, you, you put that sort of incentive on the table and, and it, it really causes ethanol producers to, to take a hard look at, at whether, you know, they, they, they should move forward with that capital investment. It's not inexpensive. Um, to set up a, a CCS type of system uh, with an ethanol plant. And, and it, you know, today it really only works in certain geographies and in certain situations. Um, you know, ADM in, in the middle of Illinois is another place that's got a perfect geological formation sitting underneath it uh, to do this sort of sequestration. Um, but having that tax credit available, and, and the final rules are still being written on how that's going to work, uh, but that's a, that's a key piece of this. One more quick one. On the E85 in California, well aware of you know, how ethanol is such a, a turn from decades past when they hated ethanol, is people may not be aware that E85 is classified as anything as low as 51 percent. Is that based on the production from the plant? How, how are they gauging that? Because that's a big difference whether you're actually at 85 or 51. Yeah, well, in California, they don't, they don't adopt the ASTM uh, specification for E85. They have a much tighter range uh, to define what E85 is, and I believe it's 70 to 85 percent um, ethanol in California. But, but the data from CARB has shown, because they go out and measure uh, and, and do sampling, and they've shown that E85 in California typically is E85. It's, it's normally between 80 and 85 percent ethanol. We have, oops, sorry, everyone. We have time for one more question, and then we're going to go ahead and break to lunch, okay? Well, it's probably more of a comment than a question, but I really wanted to build on what you and Dave Hallberg were talking about, not just looking at aromatics, but octane, you know, as an, uh, as an octane credit. In our, like our North Carolina study, one gallon of ethanol makes over six gallons of E25 at a 5% reduction per gallon. So I think when you look at, a, at an efficiency credit, it's a very nice story to tell well, what you're saying. That's a good point, Steve, and, and, and the study from Argonne does look at the fact that, hey, if we're using ethanol as the octane source instead of aromatics or, or, or stuff coming out of the refinery, then they're running their reform, reformers less severely. They're using less energy in the refinery. And that should, you know, that's a credit that should go to ethanol. Um, so there are all these very complex uh, effects and indirect things happening uh, that we just need to keep looking at. I want to, I want to go to a different uh, question, and and I want you to jump in on this too. We talk a lot about E30, and obviously we're using a lot of cropland to produce E10 or E10 plus. Over what period of time could you imagine a transition in corn production to E30, and what would be the impact on U.S. land use? Uh, we have done that sort of modeling, um, and we have, you know, arrived at the conclusion that we could certainly support, our agricultural system could certainly support a 25 or 30 percent blend uh, in the future. I mean, and one of the kind of important variables in that is the increases in fuel economy are going to reduce overall gasoline consumption. So, you know, 25 percent of the gasoline pool, by the time you could actually achieve that, is, is much less ethanol than it would be today if you were to do it. Um, but at the same time, you've got to look at the, the trend lines for, for crop yields. Um, you've got to look at these other improvements in efficiency that we know are coming. Uh, you know, I used to work at the National Corn Growers Association, and every year they had a corn yield contest. And the winners of that contest, you know, had yields of 350, 400 bushels per acre. Our national average today is, is less than half of that. So um, are you going to have that sort of productivity across the U.S.? No. But it shows the potential of where crop yields can go. I mean, we, we've had a, you know, honestly, the situation has been the reverse of what a lot of people think. We've had huge surpluses that have burdened our, our agricultural economy, uh, burdened our commodity markets. Um, and, and we think because of increases in productivity, we're going to have that again unless we have somewhere, some market uh, for that grain, and we think uh, ethanol is, is where it ought to go. Is this too much of a stretch? Do you think that the corn industry 
could commit to meeting uh, the demand for increased ethanol without increasing the corn acreage? I think in certain scenarios that that, that, is, that is plausible. That is absolutely possible. Again, it depends on the time frame and, and lots of other assumptions. But, uh, and, and I know the corn growers have done that sort of modeling too. Just to add quickly, I know we're going to hear a little bit more on E30 this afternoon um, with one of our panel discussions. Um, but just on behalf of farmers, I mean, if we're given a goal, we're, we're ready to meet it. Our corn prices have been incredibly low, um, and we're looking for additional markets for it. We've done extensive research. E30 is widely used. Um, and so we're looking for that kind of acceptance and that nationwide use, and, and that's something we're going to be spending a lot of time on. And I'm sorry, I know you're supposed to be going to lunch, but just Ann made me think of one more thing. And that was uh, when, when I was at the corn growers back in 2000, this would have been f five or six, uh, we sat down with our board for a strategic planning session to talk about, you know, how much ethanol could we make from corn in the near term? And, and came up with this, this strategic plan that was 15 by 15 by 15. 15 billion gallons of, of corn ethanol, production of 15 billion bushels by, by the year 2015. And, and as we kind of shopped that around, people said, you're, you're nuts. There's no way you're going to get there without vastly expanding cropland and, and having all these, these negative impacts. Uh, well, guess what? We, we got there. Um, we got there and surpassed it. We, you know, we're, we're, we'll produce 16 billion gallons of ethanol this year. Uh, the corn crops have been, you know, 15 billion bushels or higher. Uh, so Ann's right. When you, when you put that vision out there, um, and send the right signals that the marketplace is absolutely going to respond. Well, let's thank Ann and Jeff for that great discussion. We're going we're to uh, modify the program to give you a little bit more of a break. We're going to take a half hour break here for lunch, and then we're going to reconvene in about a half an hour, let's say at 1240. And uh, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Larry Pierce. <clears throat> Among my many old friends in the room, Larry is right there. We've been at the Governor's Biofuels Coalition since the inception, I'd say just about. And uh, 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 he's been, uh, number one, a great uh, source of intelligence in both senses of the word. Um, about what's happening in the states. But if uh, by any chance anybody in this room does not get the daily news update of the Governor's Biofuels Coalition, you have missed your bet because A, it's free, and B, it's valuable. And there aren't that many combinations like that. Well, thank you. So uh, Larry, Larry, um, Larry goes back to when one of the members of the Governor's Biofuels Coalition was George W. Bush, Governor of Texas. So with that kind of breadth, Larry, you can handle anything, and I'm just going to throw this over to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. And listen, thank you uh, to Dave Holberg, uh, Reed, of course, uh, for organizing this. It's uh, really very beneficial. Um, as Reed mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Governor's Biofuels Coalition, and uh, the current uh, chair is, uh, well, it's Christy Noem, who is the, uh, the governor of South Dakota. And um, Governor Tim Walz is the uh, the vice chair. Um, last year, late last year, they both signed a letter to the president asking him to enforce the uh, aromatics or direct EPA to enforce the aromatics provision in the uh, in the Clean Air Act. A copy of that letter is uh, is uh, right up the entrance there if you want to grab a copy. And um, there there are times <coughs> in this job that I, I feel more like an astrologer that I can only really get things done when the planets align. And they finally aligned with Governor Walsh in Minnesota and Governor Noem in, in South Dakota. Um, they, they both agreed immediately to send the aromatics letter to the president. Um, they saw how important it was <clears throat> and, and how it could play uh, an important role when it comes time for Congress to decide whether uh, the RFS is 
reset, hand it over to EPA, or whether Congress does an extension of some kind on it. Um, so that was very beneficial. Uh, <clears throat> my good friend Carol Warner and I um, spent the last two days visiting with, uh, feels like everybody in Washington, but we met with uh, all of the uh, congressional delegation for Minnesota and South Dakota staffers, sharing with them the, the governor's letter as well as sign-on letter that we would like to circulate in Congress. Um, we also met with <clears throat> White House officials, uh, talked a little bit about this, uh, also met with a representative of, of a, a national health organization whose reaction to what we were proposing to do was somewhat shocking. Uh, he did not think it was worthy of their time since uh, basically EVs are going to replace gasoline. And I was, I was so hoping, and so was Carol, that we'd find a, a health um, advocate who could join us on these discussions. So. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, I guess what we've learned from the meetings with the, the House and the, and the Senate staffers is that a lot of them don't know anything about this issue. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of educating um, with them. It takes time. I think once they understand how important it is, they could do something. We were looking for a bright light in either the Senate, House, or, the Senate or the House, and I think we, we did find that who can help circulate the... Um, the sign-on letter. Um, oh, as I said, I think as the agenda indicated, um, oh, let me just mention the, the E30 demonstration programs that we've been working on. Um, this is part, this is the, the other part of the equation. Uh, what we want to do is allow the governors to, um, we have one e, E80, E30 pilot program underway in Nebraska, and we hope to have South Dakota um, Minnesota, uh, Iowa also apply for an E30 uh, permit or E30 authorization from EPA for a one-year demonstration program. And then what we want to do then is uh, two things. One, we want to do a joint application to EPA uh, in which the governors will ask for um, the right to use E30 permanently in their state fleet vehicles. At the same time, we want to do the basically the same approach we did with E10, is to have the governors uh, do a joint news release saying that um, there have been no problems with the fuel, um, there have been no um, no problems with the vehicles, the emissions have been fine, and it's saved the states a, a lot of money by using uh, a high ethanol blend, and in that way, kind of further the grassroots support for E30. So. Anyway, um, as I said, Governor Nome was going to attend, and she sent me this letter asking me to read it, and it's uh, kind of her regrets of not being able to be here. And it's, uh, please share my regrets with the participants of the Clean Fuels Leadership Forum that I am unable to attend the forum because of a commitment to attend a National Guard event in South Dakota. Also, please thank Senator Worth for his kind and thoughtful letter and um, acknowledge the forum sponsors, including the National Farmers Union, uh, Farmers Union Enterprises, Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and the Clean Fuels Development Coalition. Since I can't attend the forum, please share these comments with the group. It was a little over two months ago when Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz and I, as the chair and vice chair of the Governor's Biofuels Coalition, wrote President Trump asking that he enforce a provision in the Clean Air Act that requires the reduction and eventual elimination of toxic carcinogenic aromatics in gasoline. As many of you know, the requirement has been largely ignored by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for decades. As we told the President, EPA's failure to enforce the provision today is unacceptable. We asked the President to direct EPA Administrator Wheeler to immediately take steps to enforce Congress to enforce Congress's aromatics endangerment finding and replace the aromatic content of gasoline with non-toxic additives such as high-octane biofuels. In 1990, Congress banned lead as, the, as a gasoline-octane booster in the Clean Air Act amendments. 
during the debate that preceded the vote on the air on the amendments senators uh, noted the enormous economic and human costs that leaded gasoline imposed on society gasoline aromatics are today the new lead president george bush signed the amendments into law in november 1990 and directed the epa to reduce the dangerous chemical additives in gasoline today 30 years later the critical element of the law has yet to be enforced in any meaningful way. Aromatics are the most toxic, energy inefficient, and expensive gasoline component, and on average make up 25% of each gallon of gasoline we use. As a result, aromatics cost inflate gasoline prices. After 30 years, the aromatics level in gasoline have remained relatively constant, and we now know the impact of these components is even more deadly than originally thought. EPA's options in the 1990s were limited and cost-effective substitutes did not exist. Today, many options exist, including high-octane biofuels. <clears throat> it's time to follow the law and give Americans the benefit of lower gasoline prices by, replace, by replacing aromatics with biofuels. America's biofuels industry is a remarkable achievement, unlike the oil industry, which after 100 years still retains its subsidies. The U.S. biofuels industry stands on its own without tax incentives or endangering the health of Americans. Biofuels can do even more uh, to the same, to save consumers money, reduce air pollution, create quality jobs, and grow the economy. And then she just goes on to say that Carol and I are going to be visiting with members of the, of the, uh, the House and Senate uh, congressional delegations from South Dakota and Minnesota. Um, and she concludes by saying, everyone here today has helped lay the foundation for our letter to the president, but our letter is just the beginning. Our message needs to be persistent and requires a concerted bipartisan effort by public health organizations and the agricultural community if we are to succeed. Thank you for your past and future work on this vital issue. So that's, uh, that's sent to all of you. Um, and um, that's pretty much everything I have. Do you want to do, you wanna do um, Plenial? Is that OK? All right. <clears throat> oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Clint Anastasi. <clears throat> I'm very glad to be speaking to well, you. Well, just an introduction. Uh, Plino Nostari couldn't uh, join us today because of a very complicated uh, international travel schedule. Uh, he did, though, agree to record this brief video uh, to share it with all of you. Uh, Plino's uh, biography is, um, is about the length of a short story in uh, New Yorker magazine. Um, but the salient parts of his bio is that uh, he holds a PhD in agricultural economics from uh, Iowa State University, uh, uh, the, uh, the same alma mater as the, the president of China, where he also got the same degree. Uh, Plenio is uh, also a world leader in advancing the use of higher ethanol blends in Brazil and in Brazil and around the world. So. Let me just introduce uh, Bill. Uh, Bill Korvac is uh, the co-author of uh, The Forbidden Fuel and also the, ethanol, the Ethel Controversy, uh, dissertation at the University of Maryland in 1993, and Revolutions in Communication about Media Technology, uh, published in 2016 by Bloomsbury. Hello, testing? Hey, it is so good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Dave Hallberg, and thanks for everybody who is here today. What you're looking at is a 
1932 advertisement for an alcohol blend that was very common in England. It was called Cleveland Discall. And the champion of Cleveland Discall was a guy named Harry Ricardo, who was the inventor and designer of the Merlin Rolls-Royce engine that powered Spitfires. So we have this um, wonderful and interesting history that is so little known and I'd like to just introduce you to a couple of things. I have, you know, 200, 300 slides, and I used to tell my students, this is all going to be on the quiz, so take copious notes. Um, but I did teach a course in the history of renewable energy, and I, we spent a month on, on ethanol, and I had a lot of good, you know, students working on that, and I'm, you know, still working on that today. Um, so, where, are you ready to? Yeah, okay. So this is sort of my main claim to fame. Back in 1982, uh, Scott Sklar, who many of you know, and I worked together on this book with Hal Burnton, who works for the Seattle Times. Um, the fourth Beatle uh, was Dave. Um, so, uh, Hallberg, uh, kind of. He was, so Scott was over in Javits' office, and Dave was over, this is ancient history, sorry. Um, uh, Dave was over in, um, uh, Berkeley Bedell's office, and between the two of them and the press and, um, and another guy, uh, who you'll see his picture in a minute, there was a considerable amount of momentum, um, and then it, out in the Midwest people were remembering this history. So I never actually, the book was published in 82, but I thought it was fascinating. I never stopped researching it. I've presented papers at the um, Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau uh, International, CABI, which is very well known in United Nations circles, uh, IIED, Alcohol Fuel Symposium, and all this stuff, just to make sure that, you know, if there were errors or, or problems with the approaches that I've taken, that they would come up. So this history is very solid and very much peer-reviewed. Uh, so, next slide. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> I've got a clicker, but I don't think it works for this because that's okay. So um, the, the, the person who really inspired a lot of the historical work and a lot of us is Colonel Bill Holmberg. Um, he's no longer with us, but I just wanted to mention that um, I was sort of at a, at a crossroads at one point in 19, I guess, 90 or 91 and, and said, you know, I, I don't know if I should go out to see this old GM archive on, on ethyl you know, leaded gasoline, and he said, go, hell, I just bought your airplane ticket, you better get out there. So that's, he would call us up in the middle of the night and say, you know what, your country needs you. You know, this fuel business, this history business, this work that we're trying to do is really important. So your country needs you, and I, it, this gruff old Marine would be like, you know, Bill, your country needs you. You know, if that's even close, I don't know. But he, he's a wonderful guy, we all miss him, and this is the horse. This is the horse that um, uh, Senator um, Worth uh, was talking about. Yeah, uh, he, and, and we miss him a lot. So, um, you know, if you're gonna be a historian, you have to sort of categorize things. So if you look at the history of biofuels, there's this period of illumination to about 1906 where the fuels have been, you know, the sort of vegetable um, uh, and animal fuels far predominated petroleum, and they were the early autofuels. They were the basis of early autofuels, and they were also there long before kerosene. So the idea that, you know, we were running out of whales and therefore kerosene came along to, uh, to save the whales is actually a complete myth. Um, there was a large number of choices of biofuels, and, you know, I have 20 slides on that. When we get to early autofuels in 1906, they were very well aware that ethanol provided higher compression, much cleaner um, emissions. There were, in Germany, there were um, alcohol-fueled locomotives around 1910 that were being used in the mines because the emissions characteristics were so much better. Um, by the 1930s, we were looking at economic warfare and the, um, the giveaway of leaded gasoline by the oil industry um, and synthetic rubber being blocked in the U.S., which actually came from ethanol in the Midwest. So three-quarters of the tires that the Allies rolled into Normandy on were made from Midwestern grain. The Midwestern grain industry saved the war effort. That is not an exaggeration, and this needs to be known. Uh, and then, you know, the energy crisis, we're all familiar with this. Nebraska gas hall, this is just kind of, you know, this period. And now the ethanol industry is established. 
Um, but there are new sustainability issues that need to be addressed. So that's kind of the overview. Now I'm just going to pick out a couple of mountaintops in this and then we'll move along to the quiz, which is, you know, waiting for you at the back of the... All right, so next slide. There we go. So this is what I showed Bill Holmberg. Um, in 1902 in France, there was an alcohol fuel exhibit. It featured autos, you know, farm machinery, lamps, stoves, heaters. Um, and this is the muse of alcohol fuel. And what she represents is the, uh, the marriage of industry and agriculture, the hope that industrial technology could be civilized enough to work hand in hand with agriculture. This was explicitly, you know, exactly what they were trying to do in France. It was a little less poetic in Germany. Um, they were trying to um, satisfy the conservative Junkers in the rural areas while keeping food cheap in the, um, in the cities. But, you know, I, I love the poetry of this and, and what it represents. Now, consider this enthusiasm that this represents in contrast to this next slide. This next slide, there we go. All right. Um, so, historians and many of us are trained to look for what's not there. And if you look at this 1951 paper on the relative effectiveness of leaded gasoline, um, which is the high part, I know it's in reverse, okay, but um, bear with me here. Look at where hydrocarbon 12 should be. See, see what's missing? Hydrocarbon 12 could be nothing but ethanol. There's, there's no way, and they took it out. It was so controversial in 1951 for the Ethel Corporation. This is, you know, chilling, really, to me. Um, because leaded gasoline was so deadly, and it was even at that time, you know, so doomed, and they knew it, you know, that they didn't want to admit that there was an actual alternative. They didn't want to name the alternative. So contrast these two things. That's what got Bill Holmberg so animated. He said, that's why you need to go out to Flint, Michigan and go, go through those new archives, which, which I did. And I spent, you know, two weeks out there. And, you know, that's where a lot of our understanding of what happened between ethyl alcohol and ethyletic gasoline has changed because these were unclassified archives released by Thomas Midgley, who was Kettering's assistant, or, uh, yeah, it was, it was his office papers. So there's a lot of very interesting stuff out there. And it's in my dissertation, which you can get, thank you. Yes, let's move on to Germany. Um, so I never really quit doing the research, and in Berlin I came across an entire library full of alcohol fuel um, information. And it's still there. It's the National Distillery Library. It was on the east side of Berlin, and the um, library head told me that um, when the Russians uh, took Berlin in 1945, there were people who actually um, stuffed their bags and their shirts with this, these sorts of books and, and papers to get them home to save them. And if they had been caught, they would have been killed on the spot, you know, by the, uh, by the Vopos. Um, and they brought it back and they reassembled their library. It's a, it's a magnificent story. Um, so, one more. Let's keep going. In 1919, alcohol will inevitably be part of our steadily increasing importance in economic life. That was, that, everybody knew that. So it was 1921 that we had, you know, uh, leaded gasoline invented. I'm going to start going a little faster through the slides here. We all know that Henry Ford was pro-ethanol. The fuel of the future is going to come from a, that you know, from that field, okay? But how many of these others do we know about? Alexander Graham Bell, 1917, right there in National Geographic. You know, beautiful, clean, efficient fuel. Stop right here for just one second. Um, so I gave this one to Boyden Gray back in 1992, and it was in the White House for a while. It came out of the, um, um, uh, was, it, was it 91, I think? It was in the White House for a short time, yeah. Um, but it's, it's from Nebraska, and these guys who ran this station sued the Ethel Corporation for antitrust violations. A couple more and we'll just, somebody just, uh, these from the 1930s, let me, uh, yeah, these are from the 1930s and sugarcane culture, it was much cheaper to make fuel from sugarcane than, than to import oil, you know, both in Brazil and, and in the Philippines. Next. Leaded gasoline was a huge scandal, and the people who were making it in the refineries went violently insane at work and had to be hauled off in straitjackets. This is part of the legacy of leaded gasoline. Nobody knows about this. Next. 
Um, this is a, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, this is the thing. This is the proof that leaded gasoline was only supposed to be a bridge into ethyl alcohol, which was, of course, the fuel of the future. According to the um, legal history of tetraethyl lead by the uh, DuPont Corporation. So the lawyers interviewed the engineers and wrote this. You know, when high compression engines came along and oil started to run out, they would still be able to make the transition to ethanol more quickly. So leaded gasoline was almost nothing in their view. It was just gonna, it was gonna be a blip. And we just never ran out of oil in the way they thought we would. So, next slide. You need to know also that there have been, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this. This is 1952, a United Nations conference on what was called power alcohol. Um, so I thought we were here at the UN uh, Foundation. We ought to mention this. Next slide. Um, one of the things that came up, and this is not the only one, but it's interesting that um, a, a guy, a Munchi, who was one of the governors of um, um, the state that Lucknow is in, uh, basically said, you know, we need to focus on cellulose. It's 1952, India, at a power alcohol conference, because he was worried about the, um, the scarcity of food, of grains being used. Now, we know that this is a, something of a canard when it comes to the use of starch and the, and the um, pass-through of DDGs, right, in, in the American system. But this has been a, a consistent uh, and interesting, you know, concern over the years. Next slide. Um, and this is hard to read, but uh, Brazil once stockpiled its um, sugar, but now it converts it into industrial alcohol. This is a cartoon from the 1950s out of the Chicago Tribune. And, you know, the bias aroused by the use of alcohol, this is one of Harry Ricardo's chemists um, for Discol for this 1930s winter blend that was supposed to, in England, replace leaded gasoline. Okay. And, and finally, a um, quote from Scott Scalar for a paper that I wrote um, on the international history of ethanol. You know, it was the Brazilian experience that helped keep American auto and oil companies at least somewhat honest. So there was a, a parallel engineering um, set of engineering data that was very, very helpful. And I think that's it. Yeah, the important thing is, when we talk about history, we have to think about social construction and not predetermined or path-determined, um, you know, models. We have to think about what people need and not what, you know, businesses want. That has to be part of the equation. Vannevar Bush said it very clearly in 1949. It still applies today. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, uh, I am Plinio Nastari um, and I'm very glad to be speaking to you uh, by video. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not uh, present at this very important uh, event in Washington, 
but I send my best regards uh, to Dave Howard, to uh, Larry Pierce, to Jeff Cooper, um, to Todd Sneller, I hope he's there, to Doug Durante, um, uh, to Senator Tom Daschle, to Governor uh, Ben Nelson, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, if he's there, um, Terry Branstad, to see Boyden Gray, our friend, uh, my best uh, regards and, uh, and um, recognition to President uh, Bush Sr. And uh, my recognition to those who passed away already uh, and left a great um, tradition, a great remembrance. Uh, Bill Holmberg, Fred Potter, Lamartine Navarro here in Brazil, Cicero Junqueira, and many others. I think we belong to a tribe. I'm very proud to be part of this tribe. Um, through the past 45 years, we were able to build up a strong and relevant ethanol industry, uh, which is growing worldwide. Um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about what is happening here in Brazil. Since 1982, we have been using mid-level blends already. Uh, blends have started in Brazil in 1924. And uh, in Brazil, the decision to raise uh, ethanol content in gasoline started in 1975. But since 82, we have been using 22% ethanol blended in gasoline. Since 2003, 25%. And since 2015, 27% in all gasoline sold in a country which is continental size. 8.5 million square kilometers, 851 million hectares of land, with ethanol distributed as a sole fuel in 43,000 retailing stations and blended as 27% blend in all gasoline sold in the country. Last year, 2019, 46% of gasoline were substituted by ethanol. This is a very remarkable achievement. Um, no other country has achieved this level of substitution with great advantages in terms of health, uh, reduction of uh, uh, hospital expenses, uh, reduction of air pollution in general. This is why Sao Paulo, a city with 21 million people, 8.5 million cars, doesn't have the same air pollution as Mexico City or Delhi or Beijing, where people use masks. Uh, Sao Paulo is the fourth largest city in the world, but it ranks number 879 in terms of air pollution in the world, in particular matter 2.5 microns. These all do from the large scale application of ethanol, we have the automobile industry here in Brazil, 34 world-class automakers, the same that you have in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in Korea, in China, established here in Brazil, adopting high-level blends and using flex cars. Flex cars account for 80% today of the existing fleet and are responsible for 92% of sales. Very soon, the fleet is going to be 92% flex. And uh, the economic impact is tremendous. Over 45 years, Brazil has been able to substitute $506 billion. This is very relevant for Brazil, a country that has um, international reserves of $380 billion. So we are very proud. We have evolved in Brazil from simple blend mandates to a new regulation called Renova Bio. Renova Bio, uh, without creating any subsidy, without creating a carbon tax, simply by establishing a regulation that promotes voluntary certification for energy efficient scores, is going to raise the 46% participation. 
uh, in auto cycle fuel demand for ethanol to 55% in 10 years. Uh, it's through Renova Bio that technologies which are very modern in motorization, like the hybrid flex car, which is today the cleanest car on earth, emitting only 29 grams per kilometer, grams of CO2 per kilometer, 29, uh, are going to be rewarded, <clears throat> obliging fuel distributors to decarbonize and reduce their carbon intensity. So the only thing the government will have to do is establish decarbonization targets. This is the new frontier. This is how we think the world should evolve, through market-driven pricing of carbon. And we are moving here in Brazil towards zero carbon ethanol. Very soon, ethanol produced in Brazil will be zero carbon. This means that the battery electric vehicle that is emitting today between 98 and 141 grams per kilometer is going to be something um, that is not going to be part of the objective. So I think we need to have continued integration, continued exchange of information. Um, I'm very excited. We are at the edge of the discussion of mobility, sustainable mobility. Um, and I'm very glad to send this message to you in Washington. And I wish you have a very productive uh, discussion uh, and count always with me uh, to promote sustainable production of liquid fuels with high density, which are high dense in energy, with low carbon footprint. This is what is going to promote income development um, and sustainable conditions for us to continue uh, thriving uh, and integrating the energy and the agro uh, industries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you, Barrett. Um, sorry that I could not jo be joining you this morning. Goodbye. One of the great uh, mis uh, misleading statements of uh, today was various acknowledgments of my role as organizer of this uh, event. I am literally the host and nothing else. We know the real organizer is sitting here in the front row and we're going to call him up here to actually run a panel and show his face, Dave Halbert. Thank you very much, Reed, and thank all of you for coming and the folks out there that are listening on live stream. I'm looking for uh, Senator Somke and Senator Sire, please, to join me on the panel without further ado. I might also say while we're waiting, wherever you want to sit, Jim. Uh, them to get collected that uh, the, uh, the bios and photos and all the presentations will be available uh, on the, uh, on the what, what website is it, Barrett? EESI. E -E -S -I, um, which reminds me, by the way, that uh, I have two big thanks and shout outs here. One is to Senator Re uh, Worth and Reed uh, for this incredible venue at the UN Foundation. And in particular, Charlotte and her team have been just incredible. Uh, and the second is to uh, EESI, um, Dan and, and, and Carol and Amory. Uh, you guys have been really, really great. And this live stream is helpful. And we're going to continue to work with you on that in the future. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through the, the bios of these uh, uh, incredibly uh, renaissance gentlemen to my left. But I'll start with Doug Somke. Uh, they're both 
South Dakotans, which I'm very proud of since I was a South Dakota farm boy myself. Um, Doug uh, uh, Farms is a very large farming operation with three sons. But for the relevance of today's event, he's uh, the president of South Dakota Farmers Union, as well as the, the president of South Dakota Farmers Enter Enterprises. Uh, how he finds the time to do all of these things, I don't know, but he's, uh, he's truly an ever-ready bunny. Um, you will hear today him talk about America's farms protecting America's cities. Uh, he recently was published in the Des Moines Register in a guest essay that laid out a, a clear uh, blueprint uh, as to how we think we can move this industry uh, to protect America's cities from E10 to E30. He'll talk about that today. To my immediate left is Jim Sire. Uh, he's the CEO of Glacial Lakes Energy, which is a uh, approximately 400 million gallon uh, enterprise of uh, three separate facilities. Um, They're extremely efficient, uh, very productive, e e profitable even in today's environment. And he and his team uh, brought uh, those plants back from the verge of bankruptcy about 10 years ago, uh, where Jim, in my mind, is, has earned his claim to fame, and I'll never forget watching how he and his people did it, was what we call the Watertown E30 Challenge. A couple of years ago, they mobilized the resources, hired the, uh, the technical expertise required, and uh, convinced the people of their town to uh, get behind the use of E30 in standard vehicles, what some people call legacy vehicles. Uh, it was an enormous success. They mobilized the car dealers, the, the police, um, just about everybody, including the, 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 the girls and boys clubs. And uh, all the data that came out, as he will explain, had proven that the use of E30 in standard cars is, is uh, magical and very effective. From there, I'll go with you, Doug. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I, uh, every time I get up in front of people, I... Uh, you want to give me that clicker? The, the first thing I want to point out is, uh, whoops, must not be on this piece. All right, there's, uh, there's no picture for it, but it's my grandkids. You got, you got to make this personal. You really do. I mean, there's one reason that uh, ethanol business is as successful as it is, because I think people like Jim and people like Ori Swayze and some of the other pioneers like David have made it personal. And for me, it's about my grandkids because the last thing I want them to do is to say, down the road, when things are way worse than they are today, Grandpa, what did you do? That's not going to happen. Not under my watch. And as president of South Dakota Farmers Union, I relayed that message not only to our state board, but to our members in National Farmers Union as well. And uh, right now we've got uh, Ann Steckel who's on board with us. Uh, glad to have her representing Farmers Union and the E30 and E30 Challenge with Jim and his board have taken on. Um, the, whole, the whole thing with the <clears throat> ethanol, why? Why? Right? Why ethanol? The fact of the matter is it's the best thing going. Can't find anything better. Um, Back in the day when Senator Dasha was, was fighting so hard for us uh, with RFS and RFS2, um, it was pretty easy to do things across the aisle in this, in this town. As we've heard from different speakers before, that's not the case today. Thank God they did what they did. And the fact of the matter is, we don't need to really do any more, not in this town. We can challenge uh, what EPA is doing, how they're holding us back on the 202L with lawyers like we've already hired. And we're going to prove it. We're going to take them to the challenge because the law is there, as you heard Boyden say. And Senator uh, Worth, I'm telling you what, they've done the hard work for us. We just got to see it through. And that's why I'm here. You know, I, you know, I can go through all these slides all, all I want and tell you, you know, about the different uh, levels of the plants in the different uh, states. and billions of bushels that we go through, and uh, what did I do? There we go. There it is. Um, but here, you know, here's some of the wide range of uh, policy uh, goals that we've got. Same thing as anybody, right? Health care, the economy, 
the wealth and, and income inequality, climate change, taxes, jobs, foreign affairs, crime. I mean, go down the list, military. I was sitting on the plane one time, this is way back when Senator Dash was still in the office, and this is during the Iraq uh, war. And I uh, had a young man that was in the military coming back uh, from Minneapolis to uh, Walter Reed. He was an amputee. And he asked where I was going. Of course, I didn't ask where, have to ask where he was going. I could tell. And he told me he was going to Walter Reed. And, and uh, I said, you know what? I said, uh, that's one reason I'm going out here is because I'm pro prone to the use of ethanol. I don't want anyone to have to fight and defend our, ourselves from other countries and for that oil that, that you had to fight for. Too many times we've done that as a country. Many of the wars that we fight are over energy, oil. And uh, he was glad for me to be doing that. He told me, he said, thank you. He said, I really wish I would have been defending the uh, Iowa cornfield where I'm from than defending uh, uh, the oil rigs in Iraq. So we've got, got to keep that in mind. It's something we don't talk about much anymore. Um, you know, and corn is the most efficient, resilient, beneficial uh, crop this nation that farmers can grow. I mean, the carbon sequestration, we've heard all about that already. Um, Jeff did a great job talking about that. And the, the yields are getting greater and greater. I've got a slide that uh, points that out a little bit uh, more clear uh, later on here. Uh, and why should we give the money away? I mean, I think about... Uh, some of the things that have happened in Watertown. I remember driving through Watertown uh, before the plant was built. And you'd have to wait for a train car to go by, loaded with completely raw corn. It's not the case today. There's several trains that go out of there now. They're not just carrying distillers, but they're carrying the, the uh, wet distillers, they're carrying the dry distillers, they're carrying the ethanol. And all that money is staying right there in town. Jim and his, his board are doing a great job, not only uh, with the business, but also promoting it and the use of it in the community. Uh, food versus fuel, we heard a little bit about that earlier today. Um, I get to this point, I guess I'd like to say, you know, uh, you've seen Jeff's slides about how we're producing more with less, and that's exactly true. Uh, on our farm, we use what we call MZB. It's a multi-zone um, uh, based uh, uh, soil sampling, and we, bre we break it down, not so much in a grid like a lot of farms do, this is on the soil type. And it's a very unique system that our co-op uses and, and uh, we do a lot of testing for the co-op, my son does that. And uh, we don't put any more fertilizer on any of the zones that we know it can produce. So we're taking from the poor ground, we're, we're not putting anything on basically, but on the better ground we're putting more on. We're really not using a lot less, but we're using it more efficiently. And same thing with water, same thing with, with uh, herbicides. You go down the list, and uh, it makes our farm so much more productive. And I really believe that eventually, someday, uh, we could see that as a regulation. We farmers are getting used to that. I mean, we're, we're being regulated on a number of different fronts, and for good reason. We should be accountable. Uh, we don't want to uh, make our water worse. We don't want to make our air worse. And again, that's why ethanol is such a big part of, and why I promote it so heavily. The economic stimulations, I mean, look down the list. Look what we've done there with 16 billion gallons from 43 million metric tons of, of byproducts. You know, look at the jobs, set almost 72,000 jobs, 294,000 indirect uh, jobs, $46 billion contributed to GNP. Uh, $25 billion in household income, $10 billion in tax revenue, no subsidies. Can the oil industry say that? Ask yourself. Here's where we came from. I mean, this here slide really points out the facts of, of where uh, farmers really seen the last big boom. It was during the RFS 1 and RFS 2. And back in those days, we were told, you're on a new plateau. Our commodity groups are telling us, you're on a new plateau. You will never see corn under four bucks again. Guess what? It's not up to four bucks today. And guess what? I've got a lot of farmer friends that are in trouble today because they believed that lie. They believed that that was going to happen 
that they were never going to have to look back. So they overspent. They didn't have the capital to do it. They borrowed to the hilt, and now today we're losing them. We've got 20% higher use, uh, loss of, of uh, uh, farms to bankruptcy today than we did just eight years ago. That's astounding. Uh, but we were, again, we were, we were told a lie. And we were counting on the ethanol industry, and we were counting on what was going to happen through the government, and it didn't happen. I'm here to tell you today that I don't believe that we should count on the government. I think we should be, just like Boyden said, I think we should be on a free market. But if we're going to be on a free market, let us stand on the same ground that they're standing on. Don't hold us back. And where, is the, the, where are we headed and what are the goals? Well, it's, I pretty much said all that already, but the fact of the matter is the same uh, public health reasons and the same get the lead out. I mean, we've, we've got the aromatics that are causing us problems today that we knew were going to cause us problems, and we're worse off today than we really were with the lead, when you really think about it. Um, but to find a pathway to safer and higher octane standards, EPA can reduce the amount of mobile uh, source air uh, toxics from gasoline and the emission to the greatest extent achievable, just as was said earlier. Here's some of the eliminating barriers, and this is all by EPA, basically. You know, I mean, read down that list. I mean, it's, it's astounding. Um, there's no reason that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, I mean, they get a lot to be accountable for. We need more to help us hold them accountable. And what's in it for all of us? Well, we can fulfill the RFS targets. You know, we can restore competitive marketplace. We can make possible uh, in, in, in <laughs> immediate and substantial reductions to the U.S. transportation uh, section of the carbon footprint. I mean, that was all said earlier. But the safe rule to me is our ticket to where we're going to make things right. I really believe that. I mean, there's a lot of other uh, government challenges or lawsuits going on right now, uh, the RVP and such, and understand that. But I really believe that the safe rule is where we are really going to make some hay. This is what we've, and if we don't, shame on us. That is on us. And more people, more organizations need to jump on board with us and to get to that point. Now, here's something I really want you to think about. Ethanol provides the lowest cost, highest octane enhancer in the world. If ethanol was used to be made the premium, it would uh, cut the cost and spread from regular to premium to pennies. Right now, there's a 60 cents gouge that the oil industry is charging to you for a lesser product. So what I'm saying is if ethanol was actually sold as a premium, we wouldn't be ta talking about this today. And we'd be solving the health issues at the same time. This here, just a simple slide that I'll just tell you, um, shows that we are keeping the price of gasoline down. We help the oil industry. We don't harm them, as so many are trying to say that we do. And where are we going and how are we going to get there? Well, this is a simple slide showing how uh, corn production was pretty stagnant, you know, early on in, in uh, the history of, uh, of corn production in this country. And then all of a sudden, look there in the 40s, how we started to use hybrids. And I remember my, my grandpa telling me, he was a funk seed dealer for any, any of you farmers in here. And I, I, I should ask this question first. I usually do. I say, how many farmers are in here? I know there's a couple. OK, I'll try to speak up. Because most of the time, they can't hear because they're always around tractors and augers and things. So I, I always want to make sure they can hear me or move them to the front. Uh, they're they're, they're kind of like uh, Norwegian Lutherans. They like to sit in the back row, uh, which you, you've seen here already. But look how that, uh, like my grandpa said, you know, hybrids changed his production. He went from 35 bushels an acre and went to 75 bushels an acre, and he thought he had the world by the tail because now he was filling his grain bins. He didn't even think about any of the fuel additives or anything like that back in those days. But then look how it just continued to climb, and it will continue to climb. And I can tell you why. It's because that's what farmers do. We produce. We're good at it. So let us do what we're good at, okay? Um, every time that we think that we're on a new plateau, like I said, we show people that we produce. But the fact of the matter is it really comes down to this, and I don't have a slide for this one, but it comes down to the fact that 
It's calories. How many hamburgers can every person eat in a day? Just so many, right? Well, guess what? In this world today, we're producing more calories every single day. We can't eat ourselves out of that hole. We're overproducing, and that's on us as farmers. But I was telling uh, Reed and some others, Jimmy, uh, earlier, one of the challenges that we have besides what we have in ethanol is the farming system, the marketing system, doesn't work for the farmer today. Not the way it was designed to. It works for everybody else. It works for everybody that provides a service to the farmer, and I'm talking from bankers to insurance companies and, uh, and the Chicago Board of Trade, but it doesn't work for the farmer who has the most invested for the longest amount of time, and he gets the smallest margin from that marketing system. We've got to find a way, and we've got some answers through Farmers Union on how to do this, and to, to make sure that our farmers have a tool that they can market things through. That's one of the other answers that we can get farmers in rural America back on track. And, uh, but ethanol, in my opinion, was the last great thing. It can be the next best thing, and it can also help save the, the country, and it can also help make our, our health care better. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, as Dave uh, introduced me earlier, I'm Jim Sire, CEO at Glacial Lakes Energy. Before I move on, I think he's been far too generous in his uh, uh, accolades that he's placed upon me. I think there's some uh, pretty important folks that uh, I want to acknowledge. Uh, certainly, Doug and his group have been. Uh, 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 as of the last year or two, have been there right in, with us uh, pu promoting these products and, and pushing it forward, uh, single-handedly pushed uh, forward some E30 uh, initiatives in the state legislature last year. Um, Marcy Cole is our Director of Corporate Affairs and Communications. She really, uh, when we began this campaign four years ago, she really took it uh, to the next level. Um, obviously, uh, we're all busy, we all have responsibilities, but she is, the promotion of our product and the, the membership falls under her uh, uh, responsibilities, so uh, a great fit for her. She's been with the company since day one, and so she's had a, a major part of this. Terry Schmidt standing in back, he's one of our board members. Obviously, we can't go forward with something like this without the support of the board. So um, the board has been very, uh, and Terry in particular, has been very supportive and vocal about uh, the higher blends and what it takes to get to that next level. Uh, not always easy. Not always easy. Even within our own industry, there's apprehension. And uh, maybe we can talk about that a little later. But uh, uh, so, you know, we've, we've been called a, a, a rebel. Uh, we've been called kind of a different animal. Uh, out there, uh, making you know, doing what we're doing, but uh, we're perfectly comfortable with those uh, titles, and and uh, I think what we've done there, uh, while probably not significant for us individually as a company, because 99.9% .9 of what we make, there's j there's just no people in South Dakota. There's 30,000 people in Watertown, and, and uh, you know, eight nine hundred thousand in the whole state. So 99.9% .9 of what we make goes out to the West Coast, to, to uh, Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas, and even exported. We, we do a nice job of creating export grade that goes to oh, some, something like 23 countries. So, um, so anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done with our little sphere of influence there in Watertown, South Dakota, or I'll call it Northeast South Dakota because... Uh, it really does reach out into the, some of the smaller communities that surround Watertown. So what is the E30 challenge? Well, the E30 challenge is a camp, and you heard a few folks refer to it uh, maybe as just what's going on in Watertown. Well, this is what was going on. It's a campaign to trial the use of premium E30 in all vehicles, both flex fuel and non-flex, uh, what we call legacy. 
that we are challenging the conventional wisdom that 2001 and newer non-FFE autos, which are flex fuel vehicle autos, can operate at most on a blend of E15. So the 2001 have been approved to use E15. We think the EPA came up short and should have gone all the way to E30. And, uh, and, and you know, for various obvious reasons, much, much of which were talked about today. The main purpose of our challenge was to drive change, to support rural America. There's no secret about that. That's uh, uh, a lot of what Doug's talking about. Um, but we think we have something to offer. When he says the farms can help the cities or protect the cities, we think we have something to offer in this product. So, um, you know, when I, when I, back in my early years of my career, I left, uh, and, and I, I regret that Senator Worth isn't here, but I actually left South Dakota, went to Colorado for 18 years. I lived in that dirty, toxic air for 18 years. And it's interesting, when you flew in, I traveled a lot, when you flew in, you could see it. Once you're in it, you don't even realize you're in it. And, and so, um, you know, we think we have something to offer. It's frustrating to, to be in a, a setting like that, the front range, where you should be able to look up. And, and there are mornings when you can do that, when the wind's out of the right direction, and maybe on a Sunday morning when people aren't driving. You could look up and see the mountains, and it's just a beautiful sight. But it's frustrating when, when you know, you fly in and you look at that, and the first thing you see is this ugly brown cloud hugging the ground, and you know that there are solutions out there. So that, that, is, that is what we mean by the statement where we think we have a product that uh, large cities, metropolitan, wherever there's a concentration of people, foreign countries, uh, countries in India, uh, such as India and China, and places where there's large concentrations of people and a lot of activity, we think this is the, the solution. So the goals of the E30 challenge was uh, to increase the level of awareness, uh, to gather some engine performance data, to dispel the myths about premium E30, to change consumer preference and behavior. Uh, we still, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things out there, a lot of uh, opinions out there, even to this day. And then finally to create a prototype for, for government and the industry. Again, if we were looking at this as solely what did we get out of it in Watertown, South Dakota, I would say very little. We sell a tanker or two a week of ethanol locally, and that's pretty much it. Everything else goes on a rail car, it's shipped out of the area. So as we look at the goals, I think that last statement there was really the one that we were trying to uh, drive home. We hope that the industry, that policymakers, that government will take this exercise that we went through and use it as a, as a stepping stone to something else. We also hope that uh, within the Midwest, uh, my vision would be that there are more Watertown South Dakotas out there, that there are more communities, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the panel up here that said, you know, they'd like to try this in uh, uh, South Dakota, North, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, and Nebraska, I think that's a great example of what we're trying to do too. We're trying to entice other communities to do what we've done so that eventually we grow those islands and we cover not just cities and counties but states. And then, you know, just like E10 did, it started from the outside and worked its way to the coasts. So really just for folks, uh, I know this is very basic, some of this is uh, uh, things you've heard before, but E30 is 30% ethanol, 70% gasoline. Uh, it's lower in toxins. We, we've heard, talked about that. Uh, in almost every case, it's more affordable. I think there probably are some exceptions where there's an ability to sell that higher octane, that high performance octane, but it, it's, a, it's an octane rating of roughly a 94, 95. Um, so that is, that is the product. Um, and um, uh, we have, uh, you know, since regular premium is 91 octane, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, you know, if, if I look out there, I mean, it would be nice at, at some point, uh, and I think it's the right way to go. 
uh, at least initially, to see 15% as your regular gasoline and 30% as your premium. I think you're, there's, it's very likely that folks would move on to the 30 just for the reasons. And then the, the gentleman from uh, Brazil, uh, they're at 27%, so 27.5%. Uh, so um, we're very, very closely aligned. Uh, it's interesting, a couple of days ago I was in Nashville, I talked to a gentleman from Brazil, and um, he, 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 and we've heard this throughout the industry, we've not done any official work on it, but there's literally no difference between the vehicles, and I think Steve maybe has done some of this work too, but between the vehicles that are going to Brazil and, and those that are in the, in the U.S. here, other than I think they can handle some of the higher blends even more than and E30 and the whole anhydrous hydrous thing too. So, To pull this off, we knew that we couldn't just go out, even though that we've got a long history in Watertown, South Dakota, and we've got shareholders there, we've got, and Glacial Lakes Energy is a co-op made up of 4,000 shareholders. Um, not all are there, but the legacy shareholders are in, in the area. Uh, I would say we probably have about 60, 50 to 60 percent of those folks or right around within a 50 mile radius. So to, 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 to pull this off, we needed a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we had the uh, history behind us where some of this uh, initiative has started years ago when the plant was first built. And I think the EPA, EPA even sent a representative out to Watertown and asked, started asking shareholders when they were filling up their non-flex vehicles with E30 to stop doing that or they were going to be arrested. And uh, so, um, you know, I wasn't there then, but, but I've heard it from so many people and Doug's shaking his head that that, that did happen. Uh, and then finally, I guess they gave up and, and left, left us alone. And so we went through this tough period, as, as Dave said earlier, and, and we were really, really focused on saving the, the company. Uh, that was in 2008-9, and, and it was post-expansion, so we had a lot of other things to focus on. Once we, uh, once we uh, righted the ship, so to speak, um, we were approached by uh, Steve's brother, Dave Vandergrind, and said, I think Watertown, South Dakota is the perfect place to do this uh, challenge, and this is, this is what I'd like you to do. And, uh, so we took that, that back to the board, and the board was, was all in, and management was all in. And, uh, and Marcy, for sure, she was in 150%. She wanted to go with this thing and, and make it work. So, but when we sat down, we knew that we had some critical pieces that we need gaps to fill. You know, we knew that we had the, the membership support, we, although that was mainly within our own uh, shareholder group. There's still lots of other industries and residents in Watertown uh, that, are, that were skeptical. Um, we knew that we had the network of stations. We have roughly 50 percent of the stations in Watertown are uh, flex, uh, or, uh, flex pumps or blender pumps. Um, but beyond that, really the, the critical partnerships that we needed, we knew that Okay, if we start ask, actually asking people on a grand scale, coming out in the media and asking them to start to try E30, what's going to happen? Who, who are, who's going to be the first one to be contacted? And we really felt like, well, anybody that is responsible for selling that auto or selling a auto or fixing it, is gonna, that's the first place they're going to go. So we set out to... Uh, gather these people together and to find out what, what they thought. Uh, I can tell you we have two significant dealerships in Watertown. One is very supportive of, of what we're doing. One is maybe not as much. Um, and in, in his words, he says, I'm not going to get in your way, but just don't expect me to jump in and, and, and endorse this, this, because he had concerns with the, you know, the, the, the brand that he was carrying that uh, that he was going to get crossways with, with, with them. The service shops, maybe a little bit easier. Uh, the technicians, even within the dealerships. And we held some meetings early on to, to tell them what we were, what we were up to. Um, Lake Area Tech is a, 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 a technical institute in Watertown, very successful. In fact, uh, 
three years ago named as the number one technical institute in the country, and President Obama actually came out and gave the commencement address. So we felt it was important to get uh, with get with those folks and to start working with them more than we had been. The fuel retailers, we knew that if folks pulled up and and they were at the counter, we didn't want them to start to, uh, uh, well, you better not try that. So we felt, you know, we absolutely needed to get, <clears throat> excuse me, get these fuel retailers on board. And then probably what was most uh, enlightening was our own employees. You know, they're working for us. Their paycheck comes every two weeks. If we can't get them on board, why would we expect somebody else to, to jump on board? So we actually surveyed our own employees and found out some pretty interesting things in that process. So that kind of set us back to, okay, now how do we, how do we, what do we have to do to pull this off and, and do it right? So from there, and there was many others. I mean, there was, there was, was uh, oh, some promotional events we did with charities and some, uh, the media was a big part, but, uh, and other civic organizations, but slowly we, we, we started to push this thing forward and it was really uh, uh, interesting as to what we were finding out. Early on we felt it's critical that we have kind of a go-to guy, a point man, if you will, or woman, um, and I, I really didn't even know Andy Wicks until this, this campaign. I'd heard the name, <coughs> excuse me, drop the time or two, and, um, uh, you know, so uh, uh, Ori Swayze uh, said, you got to get Andy Wicks on your side. You got to call him. So we, we reached out to Andy. Andy is the owner of Dino Tune Speed and Performance in Watertown. It's an interesting shop. It's not your normal mechanic shop. He does, typically doesn't take just normal run of the mill products or projects. But if, if you have a Oh, let's say you decide to buy a Corvette. You want to get a little more, not if uh, 600 horsepower isn't enough, but if you want to get 800 horsepower out of that car, you're going to take it to Andy. And uh, so he, and to get that, he's, you know, fuel is what he works on in, in performance and efficiency. He specializes in high performance fuel injected engines. Um, over 15,000 tested and tuned across the U.S. Since 2006, he tested ethanol and OEM and high-performance applications on a vast array of makes and models, uh, knows this stuff inside out, um, and has been a trainer for some of the, the big three and, and others, um, and then at one point in time had been selling uh, flex fuel conversion kits for non-standard or non-flex fuel vehicles and then I believe the EPA came and told him to stop doing that too. So uh, for, for the longest time they had their eyes on Watertown, South Dakota in one way or another. But Andy, Andy, after I first met him, I thought, you know, this is the guy. There is no question about it. This is the guy and here he is right here in our backyard. What more could, could be, what, what could be better? I guess the other thing I'd add is Andy is very, uh, well respected within the automotive circles in not only Watertown or in, in the area. And it was interesting, the first time I ever went into his shop, nice big shop, clean shop, and I looked around the room and here's all these muscle cars and high performance cars and there's very few of them that have South Dakota plates on them. They're coming from a, like a six or seven state re area up in the Midwest. So he's he's got his name out there and you know these are folks that like to spend money on cars and probably go through a set of tires in, in a month. So early on, you know, the, one of the questions that we kept uh, anticipating that we kept hearing was, will the premium E30 work in my auto? And I think this is what we put in front of Andy. Of course, some of us knew it would. We've had a lot of shareholders that had these stories. Uh, I think Marcy has got a, what's, what's your Honda Accord, How, what year? 2007, it's got about almost 300,000 miles on and maybe only a handful of fuel tanks that were E10, it's all E30. So, uh, you know, we, we, we had some examples like that, but still, 
we have a vested interest. Shareholders have a vested interest. Marcy has a vested interest. So, you know, we, we knew that, okay, this, this can't just be within GLE. It's got to work its way out into the community and, and have uh, others experience and believe what we believe. Uh, what we found out in the, in the uh, trial is vehicles react somewhat differently, although the data was fairly consistent across all test subjects. And in other words, a Chevy pickup with a, with a 305 in is going to act a little differently, or maybe a lot differently, than a Ford EcoBoost. And now that's a high compression engine, so right away you could see that difference. But even within uh, the same line, different engines that weren't necessarily high compression engines were going to perform differently. Any car with a closed loop fuel control, uh, most, which is most anything 1988 and newer, is, uh, is, is, you know, the fuel system would adapt to that, that higher ethanol concentration. And that's kind of referred to as what Andy calls the adaptive fueling strategy technology. There had been some large-scale testing done uh, in the past, uh, and there was significant parts compatibility research that had been done previously with higher blends as well to dispel any uh, corrosion uh, concerns. So one of the questions that kept coming up was, well, does E30 by itself trigger a check engine light? Because that's the diagnostic system that's, that's monitoring everything that goes on in that, in that vehicle, and then it triggers a light. And there's, there's over 2,000 different issues or codes that could, could come up. E30 was tested and it, it, it produced about an 11% variance. Well, most vehicles are set with about a 25 plus or minus uh, tolerance level. And so we, early on, we knew that E30 was not going to trigger a, a check engine light. So the check engine light, again, just a little background here, uh, 2,000 codes that can be triggered. Um, most vehicles, 20% uh, variance either way, um, and then our conclusion was, or at least the, the, the uh, advice we're getting from Andy was, Andy Wicks was, premium E30 will not be the only thing that triggers that light. There will be something else going on in the background when coupled with E30 that's going to trigger that light. Again, very important because to this day we still have people that say, well, I put the E30 in, and guess what happened? The check engine light went, came on. I took, put in regular fuel, guess what happened? It went off. So those are, that's, that's some of what we anticipated could happen. But here's what's really going on in that situation. So you've got your, your original tolerance uh, or, or a trigger of 11%, which is far below the, the check engine uh, threshold. If you happen to have a dirty mass airflow sensor, uh, and Andy has estimated that could be as high as 18%, and then you go and put the E30 on top of that, guess what? You're at 29%, now you're over the 25% tolerance. So that would explain, you, you take the E30 out, now folks think everything's okay. You put it back in, here comes a check engine light. So those are some of the things, and we still have these that come up. And in every case, Andy has hooked that, that vehicle up to, we invite them to bring those vehicles forward. We, we send them over to Andy. He hooks it up to the computer, and he can see there's something else going on in that vehicle. So as part of the test, or part of the challenge, we, we, uh, we went out to our shareholder, or excuse me, our uh, the public and we said, you know what, if you try this, we will buy you three tanks of each E10 and three tanks of E30. There's a few things that we would ask you to do for us. One is to, uh, that, that uh, E30 test vehicle sticker, we wanted to get that out into the community. These folks are driving around the community, we wanted them to see that that is an E30 test vehicle. So it wasn't just something they were hearing on the radio or reading in the paper. They were, um, uh, you know, seeing it in the traffic, too. Um, we had data loggers on there, and uh, these were the same data loggers used by the EPA. And we had a number. We wanted a, a random uh, 
collection of makes and models. And so here's the list of some of those vehicles. And as you might not be surprised, lots of Fords, Chevys, and Chrysler products up in that part of the country. But really, we, if you pick your way through there, you've got a Mercedes in there, you've got a Nissan, you've got a Volkswagen, lots of Toyotas. Um, so we, we did get not every make and model, but we got a good collection of makes and models. So in the end, the results, uh, over 80,000 test miles were driven with E30 and the test vehicles. Uh, we didn't see any reduction in performance. Some actually felt an increase in performance, particularly the, and Andy tested this, the high compression engines, um, stable or improved fuel economy, in, again, primarily in those high compression engines. Uh, and, and uh, horsepower increase, that was proved out on, the, on Andy's dyno tune. Um, we estimate that there's thousands in fuel savings alone. Um, no check engine lights from E30, and certainly, although this probably isn't uh, as much of an issue in Watertown, South Dakota, we get, we get a lot of wind there. We've got wind towers that surround us, and so we, we don't typically see the issues that Denver would, but we know that the air quality has improved. So who else is using E30? Just run through uh, this trolley that runs around town in the summertime is on E30. We've got uh, the police department, the ambulances in Watertown are on E30. Now there's a testament if the police and the ambulances can use it, it's safe. Um, over in Aberdeen, which is a, another sister community about 100 miles to the northwest of us, the Brown County Sheriff is, is on it. The, uh, the the county fleet, Boys and Girls Club, and numerous private businesses. And there's the, uh, the Watertown Area Transit, just a picture of the buses and uh, some, some uh, statistics, 268,000 miles that they put on, all but one vehicle slightly increased mileage. Police department, street department, saving money. There's a statement from one of the captains. The Aberdeen Boys and Girls Club again, and I think uh, Mike Herman over there, big supporter, uh, once we had him believing, he made the statement, no problems in the winter. So to date, since May of 2016, we've uh, sold, we've been tracking the fuel sales in Watertown, South Dakota almost six million gallons. If you use a 20 mile per gallon average, that's 120 million miles on, on E30. Thank you very much and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, I think we're right at two o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, we'll probably just move on to the next panel unless somebody is just going crazy to ask a question. Thank you very much, Jim and Doug. Now I've got the bad news for you is I'm on a panel now. So I'm going to turn it over to Ernie, and Ernie's going to introduce the next panel. I can. Well, you, you're the moderator. Ernie. I think we're looking for Burl. Yeah. Grabbing his notes. All right. We'll get, we'll get a slide up on the screen. Here, I'll sit in the middle because I'm going first. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. While we're waiting for the uh, uh, screen to change here, we'll segue to our next panel. My name is Ernie Shea. I am the coordinator of the 25 by 25 Renewable Energy Alliance and the facilitator of the Ag Auto Ethanol Work Group. And uh, with many, many of you and other partners, I've been working for the past 15 years trying to accelerate the introduction of high octane, low carbon fuels into the North American light uh, uh, duty transportation fleet and it's been quite a journey, quite an adventure uh, and the one thing that I've really taken away 
is the critical need for partnerships to get to the shared goal that we all have together. So throughout the morning and the early afternoon, we've been taking a look at the role of ethanol in America's energy future. We've spent some time talking about health impacts, national security benefits, uh, climate and environmental benefits, economic benefits to local communities. The list goes on and on in terms of ethanol's contributions to America's energy future, America's economy, America's health. And now we're going to go back and take a deeper dive into health, public health, by taking a look at the uh, uh, gasoline aromatic health effects and impacts. And we have a panel composed of two veteran presenters, Reed Dutchern and Dave Halberg, who have been introduced before and you've heard from already, so you get to go again, gentlemen. Uh, we're also joined by Burl Hegwood with the Clean Fuels Development Coalition, and Burl and I have worked together for many years over the course of this march to a new energy future and look forward to his contributions as a member of the advisory board of the Clean Fuels Development Coalition. So to get us started, um, Reid, I think you're first up to take us uh, a little bit deeper into this question of what effects do these aromatics have on public health? So, Reed? Thank you, Ernie. Uh, I don't see the clicker up here. Did, oh, there we go. All right. Ernie did pretty well, considering he didn't know until about a minute ago that he was doing that. I thought that was pretty nice, Ernie. Thank you for that uh, intro. We're a good team. There you go. Ernie and I have suffered together a low these many years, since uh, 2002, if you can believe that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review a little of the bidding. I'm not going to go fast through the few, first through few slides. And then we're going to dig a little bit deeper into what exactly uh, we know and why we know it. So just to review the bidding, uh, we, we've heard a lot about Octane. I thought uh, Boyden's story about Octane this morning was terrific. Uh, uh, but uh, until uh, we had the change of administration, we were aiming at 455 MPG, we've got a role in there that's not as aggressive as that. But, you know, automakers um, don't operate on congressional cycles or even presidential, cy presidential cycles. And we'll hear later from Reg Modlin about how they need at least a five-year planning window to uh, design their new vehicles. So they're moving in this direction anyway, and uh, that's why the industry is split about the quote-unquote relief that the administration wants to give them. <clears throat> and we heard about the, 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 the history of, of why, why this benefits um, uh, vehicles, because you can set them at a higher compression ratio that makes them more efficient, but you need higher octane. The history led aromatics, alcohol, fuels. Yeah, we've heard about aromatics uh, and uh, the Clean Air Act amendments uh, that r limited them, and yet we still have uh, roughly 25% of every gallon of gasoline. So there's a benzene ring for you. Um, the reason that aromatics help with octane is that that benzene ring is harder to break up in combustion, so you have a little bit slower combustion, and that leads, leads to a more even burn, but they also end up uh, producing emissions of particulate matter. And it's particulate matter that uh, people are zeroing in on as the biggest health risk remaining uh, from uh, motor vehicle emissions in particular. Uh, we've heard uh, and will reiterate that uh, aromatics are the most carbon intensive fraction to produce. And so uh, not only are they more expensive, but they are running up the greenhouse gas emissions profile of the oil industry. And then once the emissions come out of the tailpipe, uh, they recombine with sunlight and air and produce secondary organic aerosol, or SOA. And the recent research we've learned is that this SOA is able to travel long distance. Uh, these very um, uh, tiny particles, uh, well below uh, 2.5, uh, penetrate uh, not just to the lung, but into the bloodstream, heart, and brain. And have effects on mortality and morbidity. And uh, the, the 2.5 exposure alone uh, was estimated, and this was 
uh, a meta-analysis that uh, was done at Harvard uh, uh, some years ago uh, was uh, 3,800 premature mortalities and a total social cost of $28 billion a year. Now, sometimes you come across people will say, well, 3,800 mortalities, I mean, is that the worst thing in the world? Well, in all the time we've been engaged in the Middle East since 9-11, We've lost 7,000 American lives. Uh, American soldiers have been killed uh, in, in that time in the Middle East. And that's two years' worth of deaths from uh, particulate matter. So yeah, I think it matters. Now we're going to dig a little deeper. And this is uh, a little bit dense on the screen, but it's because I want to give you some actual uh, uh, data here. So. This is an excerpt from EPA's Tier 3 rule in 2014. So now I'm not saying EPA should have known. We're saying what EPA actually uh, published. So uh, they, they acknowledge that uh, light-duty vehicles, cars and light trucks, can contribute to air toxics. Uh, as a result, the population experiences an elevated risk of cancer and other non-cancer health effects from these air toxics. And they, they list a half a dozen of them that number one is benzene, and uh, later on in the list is polycyclic organic matter. Well, that just means uh, the same, these are all interchangeable terms, really. Organic matter uh, uh, defines uh, a broad class of compounds, including PAHs. So, as they say, and this is again taking this from the EPA uh, rulemaking, uh, that uh, they're formed from combustion, they're present in the atmosphere in gas and particulate form. I'll say as a side note, and we're going to come to this in another slide or two, this is before they have had shown to them that in fact their understanding of how uh, SOAs are formed and how they continue to exist in the atmosphere was contradicted by the research we'll refer to. But in any case, even at this stage in their understanding, they acknowledge that cancer is the major concern from exposure to POM. Then they, then they recognized the research by Ricky Pereira, uh, which was, studies have shown that maternal exposure to PAHs in a population of pregnant women were associated with se several adverse birth outcomes, including low birth weight, reduced length of birth, as well as impaired cognitive development in preschool children. Uh, these, that's that particular research that they're referring to, they're writing this for a publication in 2014, has since been augmented uh, further by Columbia. And they acknowledge that uh, mobile sources are also, uh, this is where they get, they, they at least acknowledge secondary organic aerosols, that they're uh, contributors to precursor emissions, which react with sunlight and air to form secondary concentration of air toxics. So along comes uh, a scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory named Alice Luniak. And among other things, um, Alice Luniak uh, did a research uh, that looked at what happened to air quality on the west coast of the United States during the Olympics that were in Beijing. Well, what, what's that got to do with the price of eggs, you wonder? Well, if you remember, during the Olympics, they shut down Beijing's industry and car transportation. I mean, the effect on air pollution in, in China was remarkable. So there was a wonderful natural experiment that for a couple of weeks, there was no pollution coming out of China. Well, lo and behold, there wasn't any pollution reaching Western Oregon either. Now, I'm exaggerating, of course, but they saw an actual relationship between the pollution in uh, Beijing and the pollution on the west coast of the United States. What does that mean? That means that this pollution is not settling out on the roadsides of Beijing. It's traveling across the ocean thousands of miles and still existing when it reaches Oregon. So her research showed, and this is again, now I'm, I'm quoting from her published documents, I'm not uh, paraphrasing here. When secondary organic aerosol 
particles are formed in the presence of PAHs, their formation and properties are significantly different from those formed without PAHs. Now, I added the underlining here just to point it out. Compared to pure SOA particles without PAHs, these PAH-infused particles exhibit slower evaporation kinetics, higher fractions of non-volatile components, and higher viscosities, assuring their longer atmospheric lifetimes. So here was scientific analysis uh, underpinning the reason that these particles were making it all the way over from China to Oregon, uh, because they, they combined and rode the SOA across the ocean. And as she explains, the increased viscosity and decreased volatility provide a shield that protects PAHs from chemical degradation and evaporation, allowing for the long-range transport of these toxic pollutions, pollutants. The magnitude of this effect is surprisingly large. The presence of PAHs during SOA formation increases mass loadings by factors of two to five, and particle number concentrations, these are these ultrafine particles that penetrate so deeply, in some cases by more than a factor of 100. So we're not talking about a trivial effect here. We're talking about something that's central to understanding the health effects of these pollutants. So this is my summary. This is not Alice speaking. So just to repeat what we just heard, they ride along, and in my term, they weaponize these ultrafine particles uh, that might otherwise be relatively harmless, but now are carrying this toxic payload of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, these particularly high molecular weight PAHs derived from aromatics and gasoline, you'll sometimes hear diesel blamed, but in fact, Diesel tends to produce low molecular weight PAHs. High molecular weight PAHs come from gasoline. They seem to be the more dangerous. Uh, and the PAHs, as PAHs, are not in the fuel. They're a product of the combustion of the fuel. So the aromatics are in the fuel. They get combusted, and the outcome is PAHs. Uh, this is the, uh, a little excerpt from the uh, Herrera findings that uh, exposure of pregnant women in the single digit parts per trillion was associated with a variety of adverse developmental effects in children, including IQ deficits similar to those from exposure to lead. Well, we heard earlier today again that it was discovering the IQ effects of lead on child development that turned the tide of public opinion and forced the industry and EPA to act on lead. And we may have the same uh, thing going on right now. And then the last uh, little item here is a, a kind of a refresh from Harvard, uh, which uh, uh, concluded, in addition, that high daily exposure to pHs may cause molecular changes that accelerate biological aging. Now, this is a little bit beyond my capabilities, but trigger damage to DNA methylation, which has been shown by other studies to be associated with premature death, even accounting for cardiovascular and other disease risk, risk factors. So adding on top of everything else we've talked about, there's an additional uh, mortality fa factor. A very recent study uh, by Korean researchers that appeared in Nature um, uh, made the very important point and I'll, I'll, I'll quote it here, but uh, first I'll paraphrase it, that all particles are not equal. Well, if you think about how EPA regulates particles, they do it by size. Well, how likely is it that size is the determinant factor of toxicity? Not very likely. It's going to be a chemical aspect. And so, as these uh, researchers found, fine particulate matter smaller than this 2.5 uh, level, uh, is strongly affected with adverse health effects, 
However, it is unlikely that all fine particles are equally toxic in view of their different sizes and chemical components. Our results were, were disclosed higher toxicity of combustion from, in other words, from combustion uh, aerosols than non-combustion aerosols. The mutagenic effects of soot particles, which come from aromatic hydrocarbons, are suggested to be associated with the organic components generating reactive oxygen species, a term of art that you come across in the medical literature, that are able to break DNA strands. So this is, in effect, the mechanism that explains these health effects. They were primarily looking at diesel exhaust, uh, but the gasoline engine exhaust particles showed comparable uh, or slightly lower toxicity relative to diesel engine exhaust particles. Uh, in, in, their, in their findings. If you look at their charts, you can hardly tell the diesel and the uh, gasoline uh, charts apart. Here's another interesting thing that they found. The aging process of freshly emitted particles uh, has an effect on toxicity. Um, what does that mean? So, as they say, aged combustion particles oxidized by ozone uh, are suggested to exacerbate lung injury and inflammation relative to non-oxidized particles. So this goes back to our SOA story. It's not so much the direct emissions as what happens when the particles coming out of the exhaust pipe combine with sunlight and air, uh, oxidize, and uh, are enabled by this SOA transport to be aged. They stay in the atmosphere for a long time and they have different uh, health outcomes because of what's happened while they were in the atmosphere. Now, Dave and I continually call up each other and say, well, where's the smoking gun, Dave? Well, here's the smoking gun. After the Zeleniac research uh, came out, EPA had a workshop in 2015 on ultrafine particles. Uh, at which uh, Zeleniak uh, presented her research. This is a summary. It's not my summary. This is a summary written by an EPA staffer and published in a peer-reviewed journal. For many years, available atmospheric models were not able to predict SOA formation. All the models relied on the assumption that SOA particles were well-mixed, low-viscosity solutions don't have to necessarily understand that, except the next sentence, recent studies demonstrated that these assumptions were wrong and that SOA particles must be viscous semi-solid particles. So in other words, everything that EPA had been doing to predict atmospheric results, predict health effects, was based on the wrong model of how these actually, these S secondary organic aerosols were formed and, and what they even consisted of. Uh, they, they, these studies show that there's a synergetic effect, this is the Zeleniak work again, between PAHs and SOA. Since PAH is trapped inside the SOA particles, slow down SOA evaporation, increase SOA yield and lifetime. This can explain the long-range transport of toxic compounds like PAHs and other persistent pollutions, pollutants. In conclusion, and again, this is the conclusion written by an EPA staffer and published in the peer review journal. In conclusion, a new SOA paradigm has been developed. Particles are semi-solid, nearly non-volatile, in other words, they don't just self-destruct, and trap organic material during formation. This is the marching order to EPA to regulate SOAs and uh, by inference uh, UFPs and PAHs generally. So that's the hard work you had to do today. I'm sorry that was so technical, but it's important to see that it's not just us blah blahing up here. This is scientists and EPA itself uh, acknowledging uh, the, the, the uh, health risk that uh, is present here. So what's the answer? We know the answer. Mid-level ethanol blends provide the octane of premium gasoline, allow uh, increased uh, compression, uh, increased uh, uh, 
uh, compression leads to greater energy efficiency. Greater energy efficiency offsets the lower energy content of gasoline, as Oak Ridge has shown. They call them, quote unquote, renewable super premium fuels, which maybe they're not going to be marketers, but it was a nice term. And uh, Boyden mentioned Mercedes once this morning. Uh, one engineer was quoted, as I recall, in the Wall Street Journal as saying uh, these fuels produce ridiculous power and good fuel economy. Now, that is a marketing statement that you could go to the bank with. Uh, so uh, if we were to displace aromatics with mid-level ethanol blends, we would not eliminate aromatics in all likelihood. Aromatics are naturally present in petroleum. They are added during the refining process to increase the octane of gasoline. So you probably are not going to eliminate all aromatics. One study by Ford uh, concluded that E30 would displace 60% of the aromatics in gasoline. Well, when you see those kinds of health effects, I think 60% would be a good start. Thank you very much. Great. We're going to turn it over to the gentleman on my left who needs no introduction. But before we do that, I, I really want to thank you for that deep dive, and, and that was very detailed. But it, it strikes me as it reinforces one of the key messages coming out of this forum, which is to direct EPA to do their job. And we heard that this morning over and over again around how difficult that is. But what we're talking about now is building a evidence-based case for that action to occur. So this is the type of granular facts that need to be brought forward uh, in an organized way to allow for EPA to do their job. So now we're going to continue down this theme. Uh, the, the, the title of our panel is A Truthful Accounting of Gasoline Aromatic Health Effects, and we're going to hear from Dave Halberg around some of the modeling work that they're doing and how they perhaps need to make some adjustments there. So Dave? Thank you very much, uh, Ernie and Reed. Great job. Uh, I should apologize to all of you, actually, for uh, my posture. I had some neck surgery last week, so if I look a little bit like a hunchback, uh, I hope it uh, wears off. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you because this has been an area of passion for me for 45 years. I came back from the Middle East after the 73 war, came here to Washington, I uh, got my degree at Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and worked on the Hill for about five or six years as uh, these issues were developing, after which I formed the Renewable Fuels Association uh, in 1981. So um, I am, uh, if you accuse me of being an alcoholic, I am. I'm really stuck on ethanol. I believe in it very, very strongly. Uh, and I'm absolutely passionate about this particular issue because I have children and grandchildren. Uh, I think you're going to find my time here is going to be a little bit different in the sense that I may have a little edge, um, and if, if I do, I'll apologize. Uh, but after the last 45 years, and in particular the last 10 years, in which we have spent as a group of us literally uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours uh, researching this, going through all the documents, the peer-reviewed studies, um, my takeaway from this is that this is more than just a complex issue that some very smart people, which they are, have, have uh, overlooked. Uh, I think there's something else going on. So anyhow, uh, we'll go on to, I, I think it's time for EPA to get real. As Ernie says, to do their jobs. We think they need to control gasoline's phantom poisons. Uh, some of you may have seen last week the PBS uh, documentary uh, called The Poison Squad. Uh, it was written up in the, in the Wall Street Journal book review, kind of an interesting quote, regulation can be a dirty word to American business but the Poison Squad does an inspiring job of detailing how filthy things can get when you don't have any regulation at all. Um, really, it was a story about uh, a USDA chemist that finally uh, got fed up, uh, literally, with the way US food policy was allowing uh, processors to get away with murder. Uh, part of the book that really caught my eye was about uh, dairies in Omaha uh, that laced uh, spoiled milk with formaldehyde, uh, which they then sold to orphanages because they thought they could make some money off it, and dozens of, of children died as a result. Um, the entire book made it very, very clear uh, that the Food and Drug, the Pure Food Act, 
was a critical part of the turn of the century uh, change in our culture. And at the time, Americans literally did not know that what was in their food was killing and maiming them and their children. Uh, many of us now believe that a century later, most Americans literally don't know that what is in their gasoline is killing and maiming them and their children. Um, and we think that needs to stop. There are many parallels, but one major distinction, which is good news, I think, for us, uh, in, the, in the food case, it took 40 years for um, this Harvey Wiley and his uh, contemporaries to get uh, Roosevelt and the Congress to pass the, the pure food law. We have a law that's already been passed. It's in place, it's in force, it's been reaffirmed in 2005. What we need to do now is make sure EPA uh, does its job. We're going to talk, uh, this story, as we've, we've said now, is, is about the use of lead and gasoline. As many of you know, historians think that one of the main reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire was because they drank their wine from leaded goblets. Um, it's a poison. It's a terrible neurotoxin, uh, toxicant. But despite all that, um, uh, John Rockefeller was able to, to roll Henry Ford, and, and uh, we had leaded gasoline for 70 years. Um, my particular talk is going to focus on three primary inflection points. The first is the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, uh, which banned leaded gasoline and restricted uh, aromatics, BTEX. The second is 15 years later, the 2005 EPAC law, which greatly expanded ethanol production and then reaffirmed congressional restrictions on BTX. And the third is the 2020 SAFE rule uh, and clean octane demands. The SAFE rule is now pending uh, before OMB. Uh, as we talked about with Boyden this morning, uh, there's a mandatory congressional endangerment finding on the books. Uh, and uh, we don't need to go back to Congress, fortunately, in these gridlock days uh, to get the authority we need. Uh, very briefly, the U.S. transportation sector uh, is dominated by gasoline. I think a lot of people think it's kind of a mix between gasoline and diesel, and EPA likes us to believe it's mainly uh, diesel and power plants and maybe trees. Uh, no, it's, it's all a gasoline story. There's 270 million vehicles out there. Americans drive trillions of miles. Uh, every year on 140 billion gallons a year of gasoline, which, as Reed says, contains from 25 to 30 percent uh, of these uh, carcinogenic, highly toxic um, uh, octane compounds, and that's 35 to 40 billion gallons a year of toxic poisons that, that are being combusted and they're not combusted completely. Uh, so, so that's our target, and I think the last thing we need to remember is EPA would have us believe that the vehicle emissions control systems, which they've really focused on, just the automobile, clean all this stuff up. Uh, they get all the, the criteria pollutants pretty well, but they do not get uh, the toxic products. They do not get the photooxidants that, that react in the atmosphere, which is where the bad stuff are, the UFPs uh, and, and the uh, PAHs. Well, as I mentioned, Ford and, and Rockefeller headed out over 100 years ago. Ford and, and the other guys needed octane for their, for their uh, vehicles. Um, Henry Ford said that E30 was the best way to go. He is in writing, warned about lead and uh, BTEX. Rockefeller, on the other hand, had a different uh, idea. Uh, his kerosene uh, refineries had this waste product that came out of them called gasoline. And uh, he was trying to get gasoline into cars. He had a lot of gasoline. And he did not want to have that gasoline displaced 30% by an agricultural product he didn't control. Lead was perfect for him because he only added three grams. And so he used all his gasoline. In the end, uh, Rockefeller won. And 70 years later, we had a major public health crisis on our hands. Uh, again, ethanol's octane properties are superior. Um, there was a 1933 uh, Navy study that found if you took an E30 blend, you'd get the same octane boost as three grams of lead, which we talked about, and or 40% BTX. So it has enormous octane boost, as Steve Vandergren has told us. Uh, we already saw the quote from Bill Kaverick about the, uh, the Scientific American prediction that it would be ethyl alcohol that would be in future fuels. And Oak Ridge National Lab and other experts have done a number of studies that say definitively 
E30 would give automakers the octane punch they need to increase their compression ratios cost effectively and safely. So leaded gasoline, we, we haven't gotten the weeds on that, but very quickly, it, it was really horrible stuff. A uh, UN commissioned report, I think it's 2014, estimated global annual impacts of leaded gasoline to be 1.1 million deaths, again this is annual, loss of 322 million IQ points, close to 66 or 60 million crime cases, economic loss of US dollar 2.4 trillion per year, which is 4% of global GDP. G Chicago Tribune, Tribune recently ran a series that concluded elimination of leaded gasoline was a major reason why U.S. crime rates dropped sharply nationwide during the 1990s. Again, related to what happened to children and their, and their uh, IQs. As EPA began to phase out leaded gasoline, experts warned, many experts warned, and I was here in Washington when it was happening, uh, that aromatics BTX, EX, were as bad or worse. So the inflection point, number one, was 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. In 1987, there was a tone-deaf report that came out of EPA to the Senate EPW Committee that proposed that they should increase the BTX limit for certification gasoline to 45% in certification fuels. Now, basically, in their defense, they were doing that to respond to what they knew was going to be the loss of lead and all that loss of octane. But what they didn't do was to be forthcoming with Congress about the implications of that down the road and plans for how that might be avoided over time. Uh, despite enormous industry and EPA opposition, and, and a lot of us in this room were involved in this battle, Congress passed a mandatory legislative endangerment, endangerment finding that requires, and I say S instead of D, because still today EPA is required to substantially reduce gasoline BTX as technologies present themselves. Congress anticipated in, in applying the maximum achievable control technology standard to that provision that EPA would be involved in a proactive way with helping to encourage and advance those technologies. Instead, EPA, as we can demonstrate and Burrell will talk about, has worked hard to, to erect barriers as opposed to encouraging. The oil industry, of course, never gives up. Uh, after this law was passed, they were determined to somehow eliminate ethanol's threat to oil-based BTEX. So um, we can go through this in detail, but the bottom line is EPA sided with the oil industry. They consistently erected roadblocks to ethanol's use. Um, they, they did have an, an excuse at the time, we admit that in that there was not enough ethanol to be used as a replacement. And ironically enough, after 100 years, there were really only three real uh, commercially available viable octane enhancers. There was lead, there was uh, BTEX, or there was ethanol. And uh, so there was a try with Congress in the 1990 Clean Air Act where they required oxygenates in gasoline. Oxygenates happened to contain octane. There were two types of oxygenates at the time, ethanol and MTBE. The oil industry went to MTBE because they controlled MTBE. So after about seven or eight years of that program, which did help cap aromatics at 25%, which the law required, the MTBE contaminated groundwater and it had to be banned. So there was this huge upheaval again in the gasoline markets and an EPA regulatory policy and so Congress went to inflection point number two. Essentially what happened is Congress called EPA's bluff because EPA had a legitimate argument saying there was not enough ethanol. So Congress decided to help and it repealed the MTBE portion of the, of the program and in, replaced it with the first renewable fuel standard, the RFS. And that mandated nationwide ethanol use and the ethanol industry responded beautifully uh, and expanded very rapidly. In that same law in 2005, oil interests and EPA did everything they could to repeal MSET 202L or the Clean Octane Amendment. Uh, they tried very hard at 3 o'clock in the morning in the conference committee on the final day, as some of us know, 
But fortunately, Congress refused, and in fact, they doubled down. In that law, they t required EPA, uh, which for 15 years had done nothing, to finally promulgate an MSAT reduction rulemaking within 18 months. When EPA did that, uh, predictably, they manipulated the, 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 the data. They used $19 crude oil, for instance, which was based on 1993 numbers. They assumed it took two gallons of ethanol to replace one gallon of toluene, BTX, uh, for octane, when in fact it's the opposite. And of course, when doing that, with cooking the books on those numbers, they concluded that it wasn't feasible to work on replacing uh, BTEX with ethanol. EPA had another uh, shot at it in the Tier 3 rule a few years later. Uh, their proposed rule said very good things about E30 and its octane properties. It looked like they were going to uh, uh, really open the door. And then they played Lucy with the football, the final rule, they shut the door. Pearl will talk about some of the FOIAs and the investigations that we've been doing, others have been doing, that prove inappropriate interaction, which I think is a very nice term, between EPA bureaucrats and oil industry representatives. So all of a sudden, with RFS in place and the ethanol industry responding so dramatically, um, without tax incentives and the increase in production capacity, EPA we had a problem because now all of a sudden their excuse for stonewalling uh, was gone. Uh, the, the, in fact, they admitted when Governor Perry asked to, to uh, 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 I'm sorry, withhold the Renewable Fuel Standard program that year, they rejected that by saying the ethanol out, is out there and there's more than enough of it and it's working to to uh, you know, lower gasoline costs and replace aromatics. So no, we're going to reject your request. So EPA colluded with oil interests to manipulate their models and pin BTX emissions on ethanol. Steve's been talking about that today. Uh, MOVE's model is kind of the short word for that. I call this the unicorn fuels phase, where they went out there and basically invented fuels, gasoline, that will never be sold in the marketplace. They were adding aromatics to uh, gasoline at the same time they're adding ethanol and nobody in their right mind would do that because aromatics are expensive and you don't need to add both. But they did it anyhow and they're still defending that model. Steve worked on them in Ann Arbor this week. But we know they manipulated the fuels, we know they manipulated the da data and on top of that they still insist upon relying on atmospheric models that as Reed just said, they have admitted are defective that they're wrong, that not only are they wrong, they're misleading, but they won't change the models. So 2015, when they admitted to the, the BTX SOA linkage, um, one of their contractors, Desert Search Institute, which is very, very respected, and I may, was amazed when I ran across uh, this paper of theirs because they still do contract work for EPA, they basically, this is their cartoon, they basically said, how can this be? In other words, the MOVES model excluded 86% of the most potent PAHs, gas phase in particular. They only included 14%, and so they conclude that really there's not much problem from gasoline with PAHs in urban environments. DRI said, how could you do that? So, Reed and I were at a meeting with uh, the Health Effects Institute and EPA a couple of years ago, and they were talking about PM. And EPA was saying that ethanol increases PM. And 90% of all the experts in that room told EPA, some of whom are EPA contractors, literally, you're crazy, your models don't work, and you need to use real world measurements, real world fuels. That's why we say they need to get real. This is a very busy slide, but if you, can, if you could go down and take the time to read it, which I won't do all of them with you, but their track record is really abysmal, okay? If you look at their assertion on the left-hand side, for instance, there's not enough ethanol, so we, we can't, you know, hope to use it to solve the problem. After the RFS passes, there's ethanol all over, and there's no tax incentive, and it costs less than aromatics, so that one goes away. Um, my eyes are so bad I can't read some of the rest of them, but they're all good arguments. Okay? <laughs> and, and in fact, we do have 
this data uh, to refute and rebut. And it is all third party and it's linked and cited. Dave, I'm going to read your last one. Okay. EPA assertion must wait for electric vehicles because we hear that today. Right. And millions of children will be harmed or prematurely die before EVs arrive. Why should we do that? Makes no sense. Their job is to protect children, not to wait on them. So the last inflection point, number three. The 2020 SAFE rule, which I think stands, Burl, correct me if I'm wrong, for safer, affordable fuel efficiency, okay, uh, is, as, as I said, uh, on OMB's desk. It's been in, in process for a couple of years. It's the ideal vehicle if, if there was a, a perfect world or even just a reasonable world, as Boyd mentioned this morning in the EPA um, mindset, uh, they would be fashioning this rule in such a way to respond to their request in their proposed rule, which was tell us, recommend to us, how we can encourage a national higher octane gasoline standard that is, quote, consistent with Title II of the Clean Air Act. Title II of the Clean Air Act is where Section 202L is housed. And we have submitted comments that point out that under the maximum achievable control technology standard, there is really only one answer, and that is literally E30, not E15, not E25, because all of the data that we have from automaker studies and everything else shows that at E30, you get the maximum of improvement of fuel economy and, and reduction in, in, in air toxics and, and that sort of thing. Multiple winners, of course, uh, because you've got agriculture, environment, trade deficit. I think that's the one on this slide that I would like to uh, emphasize the most. A lot of people don't realize that today E10 is displacing uh, 350 plus million barrels of oil a year. It's about a million barrels a day of ethanol. So even if you don't count its benefit in reducing the reformer at the refinery level, which saves even more crude, 350 barrels a day, a round number. If you go to E30, that would become a billion barrels a year. I'm saying a day. A billion barrels a year. At current prices, that's somewhere between 600 billion and $1 trillion over 10 years. That's a pretty big hit to a problem that President Trump is so worried about and should be with our trade deficit. All these other benefits, 45 to 85 percent reductions in SOA, PAH, black carbon, big number, 7 percent improvement in fuel efficiency and, and reduction in tailpipe CO2, and 90 million tons a year of soil carbon sequestration, which is equivalent to taking 30 million cars off the road every year. That comes from corn acres. Summing it all up, Section 202 L is a mandatory provision. EPA must act. Somebody needs to make them act. All the pieces are in place to act now. Infrastructure, vehicles, ethanol, economics. The technology is there. Safe rule offers an immediate pathway. Congressional action is not needed. And if they don't act in the safe rule, the only remaining alternative, most of us in this room, will be to compel EPA to enforce that provision in the courts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, continuing down the trail of truthful accounting of fuels, health impacts, uh, we're now going to hear from Burl, who's going to draw some correlations to issues that happened within the other part of the fuel industry, the diesel fuel industry. So, Burl? Not diesel, but gasoline gate. This is the other side of that story. <clears throat> and Dave, it's the safer, affordable, fuel efficiency vehicles rule. And what we're talking about here is bringing in the fuel side of that. It's just not always the burden uh, of the vehicle and the automakers, but again, it's the fuel. So. I don't do this often, so I'm trying to figure out how to juggle my notes microphone and a clicker. Uh, I'd like to thank Doug Somke and his organization for all the...
for uh, his leadership and what their organizations have done to, to support the Safe Gasoline campaign. If we're going to have safe vehicles, we need safe gasoline to go with them. So this is a story about gasoline gate trumps diesel gate based on a report uh, by, the farmers <clears throat> by the Farmers Union Enterprises. Uh, it was over a year of research, uh, a lot of thought, uh, a lot of experience went into it. Uh, and if you think, you know, Dave has an edge, uh, this gave me the edge and I'm about to jump over it. So I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, to share it with you. Uh, it was this gasoline gate report that really created the basis for the Safe Gasoline campaign and also the CFTC fact book, What's in Our Gasoline is Killing Us, Mobile Source Air Toxics and the Threat to Public Health. You know, you've heard it today, the, the evidence is overwhelming. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And we need to know why. And if we can get from here to there, why not? And we think it's gasoline gate. How is it that after 100 years of intense competition and innovation of every other product, from the Perrier you're drinking, water, food, clean food, clean water, toothpaste, cars, gasoline still remains the same? It's basically a monopoly after 100 years, especially when you consider war funding terrorism. We still get 25% of our oil from OPEC, which is missions to manipulate the price of oil. At a cost of $62 billion a year, which can fund terrorism. And then there's the sickness and death that we've heard about that's caused by the aromatics and gasoline. What's the problem? It's gasoline gate. Gasoline's a problem. Big oil's a problem. Automakers are held responsible for big oil's problem. EPA should be held responsible for all three problems, and right now they're not. So a growing number of industry observers, the more uh, you understand this issue and connect all the dots, uh, that for three decades they've been negligent of reaching the, to the greatest extent achievable the reductions of these toxins in gasoline. Uh, they've colluded with big oil, and they've thwarted the competition to gasoline, and that's not a free market. What's another problem? It's the real cost of gasoline. Consumers and taxpayers are the same, and they pay at the pump, and they pay again through taxes. They pay again through health care. We spend $100 billion a year defending oil in the Persian Gulf. A recent study by the IMF shows that the United States is spending $649 billion in 2015 alone to subsidize oil. But you still have to add the cost of war, climate change, and health care. These are real costs. If there's 3,800 people that are dying or it's 50,000 from transportation feels like MIT estimates. That's a lot of money. That's driving up everybody's health care costs. So like NATO, there needs to be a cost-shared burden to actualize the real price of gasoline. Biofuels are cheaper, better, cleaner, safer, and faster to market than EVs. Even if EVs get to 50% of the market, which MIT says will be in 30 years, we're still going to need 70 billion gallons of fuel for the rest of the vehicles. This is something that's here and available today, which shouldn't be exposed to barriers. So what's the challenge? The challenge is EPA. EPA has embraced a culture of roadblocks, detours, delays. Their cost-benefit analysis is, is an out. 20 years, 30 years, how many, how many years is it, Dave? 2007. 2007, 15 months. It's a bit overdue. So the list goes on. You know, again, this isn't something that um, has happened overnight. It's a body of evidence that continues to grow. 
Uh, they've failed to emphasize mobile sources, aromatics, and it keeps going. Not acknowledging the, the science is changing. You know, this is not your grandfather's ethanol. And ethanol is not flat either. And we found the smoking gun and we found the bullets. They look a lot similar to the story of tobacco and its product and a shameful story of how long it took to change that for many Americans and the lives that it cost. Objectives of the Gasoline Gate report provide enough credible information to make a case that EPA has failed to protect public health. And we're going to do that in the court of public opinion first. We're going to provide the research needed to change existing PR-induced negative perceptions about ethanol and instead provide information about aromatics, because people don't know. Who's our target audience? the court of public opinion, the above average body of key influencers, media, Congress, NGOs, activists, they must know what we know, then decide before there's any significant change in our fuel quality. It's a complex issue, but if people can read, people can change. The world was flat. Smoking was cool. Didn't have to wear your seatbelt. Didn't have airbags. I mean, everything has changed except gasoline. And we need to know why. I'm always the first to fight the new adage, people don't read. Maybe some people don't, but leaders, innovators, and the sweet sweet read. Then people read what they wrote, and they follow the directions. So we don't need to reach everybody. We need to reach those key influencers, and that was the objective of the report. The primary goal was to make media and policymakers less susceptible to a hundred-year-old anti-ethanol campaign by big oil. It's a very competitive market. Many people would do the same, but McDonald's wouldn't tell Wendy, McDonald's wouldn't tell worms in Wendy's hamburgers. There, there is a sense of fair competition that needs to be uh, invoked, and it's not. So we hope and we pray with a solid foundation of accessible and validated public knowledge, the environmental health, national security advocates, and the media can easily create an immediate rebuttal internally or publicly. So we... Um, we're going to go through some key findings. Uh, a lot of them are online. The whole thing's online. Uh, you can find the report at 69 pages. There's 100 footnotes. They're all live linked. Uh, this is an opinion piece. And what we're looking for is the opinion back from all of our key influencers who are in charge of making public policy and making change. So as much as uh, Congress can't agree, uh, for decades, they've agreed that Congress can't be trusted. That's why organizations sue them. It's just an accepted business practice. Even the ethanol industry is finally doing it now, getting their day in court. Why is it that the ethanol is never compared to benzene? You got my question today. You know, how is it that the greenhouse gases aren't compared to aromatics? You know, why is ethanol compared to gasoline? It needs to be compared to aromatics in the, what it displaces. Um, why? Gasoline gate. There's a body of evidence that needs to be addressed. Why is it always considered when, when you look at, you know, what are we going to do next? When you look at the environmental community, public health advocates, you know, people need to ride the bike, people need to take the train. Well, you know, they're not. People ride the bikes, they ride them at the gym and they drive their car to the gym. Ethanol needs to be considered, as the senator said, you know, you need to take another look at biofuels. Th this isn't the, the same anti-ethanol campaign that was based in 1980. Okay. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes. I'm not going to go through all this, but the cliff notes are so you will read the report, not so you won't read the report. 
because we desperately need your opinion. So when you look at parts four through six, there's 11 pieces of legislation that favor ethanol and EPA is still in a way. The Clean Air Act provides a 30 to 1 return on investment. E Biofuels can do more, EPA is in a way. 10 compelling telltale events over the decades and 10,000 emails. We believe EPA is in a way. Collaboration, conspiracy, or is it just negligence or ignorance? It doesn't matter. We're looking at history to find a way in the future. You know, science is updated, EPA needs to be updated, and we need to move forward. MIT says there's 200,000 premature deaths from air pollution. 50,000 of those are from transportation fuels. If you look at the source, if you look at gasoline, you've got to attribute half of those to gasoline at least. Okay, that's, that's, you know, that's the flu. That's the epidemic. That's 9-11 times 10. That's awful. And yet you never hear about it. I didn't hear about it. I've been following this issue for 40 years. I didn't hear about that until, you know, two years ago. So, um, you know, death is a big deal. Uh, seven of the top ten causes of death are related to air pollution. Aromatics are the new lead, as Carol says. Aromatics are also the new tobacco. Aromatic emissions are strikingly similar, as was stated earlier, and so is the shameful cover-up story. Part four, the return on investment, the real cost of gasoline again. EPA's analysis that cleaning the air has saved $2 trillion. Why stop? They've stopped short. Let's get more. Part five, the cover-up. Denial for health effects of aromatics and detours for ethanol. Biofuels are cheaper, better, faster to market. Why are there barriers? There should be, ex there should be acceleration ramps. Or there should be a damn good reason in an updated cost-benefit analysis as to why it's not. You can't have, you can't have a void of both. Uh, the grand conspiracy. I mean, is this a conspiracy? Are they, are they really adversaries? Is it just a missing void? Is there a, a knowledge bank that, that hasn't been tapped? So we're looking at magnitude. You know, you look at Dieselgate, 500,000 cars. Gasoline gate, 263 million cars that have higher than necessary emissions. Gasoline gate trumps diesel gate. And Trump can trump gasoline gate. There's an opportunity here for correction through the safe rule. EPA admits in correspondence and elsewhere they don't have the te technical capability. Did they miss the ball or did they hide it? An analysis of the FOIA emails was conducted by Boyd and Grain Associates, and it illustrates how EPA violated the Federal Advisory Committee Act and other government guidelines. I mean, that's, it's worth pulling up the report in order to just read those emails and read those analysis. It's, it's truly astounding how uh, <clears throat> you can move the moves model with an email. Uh, some knowingly, some unknowingly have bought into the oil industry party line and misinformation campaign, in, including EPA. Maybe they bought into it. Uh, it's a crap trap. And now this is research everyone can avoid so they don't get stuck in the same trap. So did um, oil companies break into EPA through that revolving door? Are they now just getting caught? You know, these are, this is the research, these are the questions, these are the information we're bringing forth that we want key influencers to validate or object or, or tell, us where, tell us where we're wrong. Uh, you need to understand the process. Uh, there's, there's some easy math in there to follow. Uh, they've got money, we've got the truth. Uh, it, it's the people versus big oil and EPA and the anti-ethanol wars. I mean, it's a, it's a great story that, that people need to understand. A lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is lacing up its boots. It's not me, that's Mark Twain. And anybody who's followed this issue for more than a year at a time, there's always something new. Is it going to be land, land, <coughs> land use? 
Is it going to be food versus fools, as we say? Because you can look back now, and each one of those campaigns, some paid for, publicly caught, Senator Grassley put it right in the public record, paid $5 million for the food versus food campaign, and it created a lot of fools. Okay, so it's not food versus f food versus fuel, it's food versus fuels. People need to be educated, and they can read, and they, and they do. Uh, the war's not over, it won't be over. It's a competitive market, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's something you have to deal with. Uh, API wants to kill the RFS, if you don't believe me, go to the website. They say it right there. Um, and then when they couldn't kill the RFS, they tried to kill the Section 202L. I mean, this is a very, very competitive market. Tobacco. You shouldn't. You should. <laughs> Must be a Siri. Oh, it again. Siri implement the small team. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get her started. Okay, so what's the problem challenge for biofuels and LPA? There are 763 oil and gas lobbyists reported. That's more than one lobbyist for each member of the House, Senate, 37 committees that have oversight over EPA, each federal agency, and each of the President's cabinet. We are simply overrun. Next slide. What's at stake? It's benzene versus biofuels. Will we be able to get a new octane standard that's going to be met by biofuels or aromatics? What's the end game? Replace aromatics with biofuels. Next slide. So here's the good news. EPA, it's already working. This is not something you have to prove. As the ethanol has gone in, the octane level of the pool has gone up, and the aromatics have gone down. There's nothing left to prove. But the key, part of the key findings is, when you climb, that's going to be the fight. How are we going to set a higher standard, a higher octane standard, so automakers can meet their efficiency goals in the safe rule? So if you read Doug Somke's Des Moines Register opinion piece or got a copy of the letter several governors sent to the president, as you've heard from others, you can now understand Trump can Trump gasoline gate. There is a solution. We don't need Congress. We can move forward. Next slide. So if it works, why not more? Again, it's gasoline, it's gasoline gate. Fake test, fake fuels, fake results, <clears throat> 263 million cars emitting emissions that are higher than necessary that can be replaced by a cheaper, better, faster to market fuel than the hope that people buy an EV. Slide 13. So, you know, what's, gas, what's, what's our summary here? It's the greatest story never told. I've been engaged in this issue for 40 years. I'm still fascinated. I'm still convinced. I'm equally excited as I am disappointed. I don't think anyone had to defend Nicorette, and even the tobacco industry did not attack them. Your extra credit assignment is to Google Gasoline Gate, and you'll find a copy of the report, the links to the research. Please read it, and please give us your opinion. For people that don't read, go to YouTube and search for Gasoline Gate, and your first choice will be you can watch our animated version of Gasoline Gate with Jack. Why Jack? Because people don't know Jack about what's in their gasoline. If you want to have fun in an Uber, Take some time, you ask them five, a few questions. Do you know what's in your gasoline? No. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know what ethanol is? Yeah. It's on the label. Is it good? I don't think so. Do you know what benzene is? No. Do you think it's bad? I don't know. What's the th thre safe threshold for benzene? I don't know. It's zero. Do you know how much is in gasoline? I mean, you can go on you know, for 10 questions and, you know, man on the street, it's astounding what people don't know. Why don't they know? Gasoline gate. We've taught them about everything else. Somebody needs to teach them about what's in their gasoline and the impact on their lives. For all you Pulitzer Prize winning journalists we've been trying to reach, 
Here's your research. It's called Gasoline Gates All in One Place. The greatest story never told. Ugh. The greatest story never told. And, you know, come on, man. This even has a sex plot. Because every time an American breathes, they're getting screwed. And if you read the report, it won't be consensual for you either. People read, and they need to know the truth. Thank you for your time and consideration of our research. OK, Burl, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, the title of this segment was Truthful Accounting, and we've provided you with lots of information that, in my mind, fall in the category of evidence-based facts to make our case. And all that's great. But today is, what, February the 6th? And I'm reminded that earlier in the week, it was Groundhog Day. And as I sat here reflecting over the course of the proceedings today, I kept thinking about that movie, where we wake up day after day after day and go through the same conversation. It changes a little bit. We have a little bit more information. But we wake up, and it's the same day. So I want to move us beyond the facts and talk a little bit about strategy of how do you build ownership and support for the type of transformational change that we're calling for. And it strikes me that the coalition of the committed that's in this room uh, and others that are watching um, have been doing yeoman's work over the years, over the decades, over a century. But we're still fighting the same fight that Ford and Rockefeller were fighting and prior to that. So my question is, if the evidence is here and we can document that people are hurting, people are dying, that there are serious issues affecting the entire nation, who is it that's not in these chairs out here that we need to be talking to that can help carry this message forward? Because as good as we are, apparently we're not good enough. And if the president couldn't solve this problem, mediating a battle between the oil industry and the agricultural industry, uh, as capable as he is at solving problems, this is one that's even surpassed him. So how do we do this, Reed? Who's out there that we need to be more intentional about bringing into the fold to help champion our cause? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge, Ernie. I'm not going to discount the difficulty of it. But I think that the target audience, in my mind, is uh, mothers uh, through a public health lens. If, if they know that uh, their children-to-be or even the children they've had uh, have been affected by uh, invisible pollution that they didn't even know was present, that penetrates through homes through their bodies, into their bloodstream, I think they will be motivated to action. And the one thing I know about the political process is if you put motivated mothers into every congressional district office in the country, you will get legislation. So if the motivated mothers can partner with the coalition of the committed here in this room, there's probably some other stakeholder communities uh, that would be aligned with that, those that are involved with risk management, those in the health professional industry. So connecting their call to action with the horse that Tim Worth talked about this morning is part of this as well. So what are your thoughts about this new evidence-based moment in time, uh, Dave, about reaching out to a fresh horse to help step up and take on maybe the challenge of this century when it comes to the transportation sector? Well, it's a great question, and it could be uh, due to the pain in my neck. Uh, but I See, am... That's not me. <laughs> no, it's not, not Reed. I, I'm not sure after 45 years of this that I think we have... I think your analogy was outstanding. Um, I think the Groundhog Day movie is exactly what we've been living through. And, you know, in my mind, we've got three branches of government. We've got the Congress, which has spoken. A lot of us went through those wars for 20 years, and frankly, we won. We beat the oil industry. The law's on the books. We have the president and his agencies. And as you said, that's not working. Certainly, it's not working with EPA. 
Those guys have been there for over 32 years in Ann Arbor, and they're dug in. We have one other branch of government, and that's the courts. And I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, I know that that's a, a tough row, but the law is clear. The legislative history is clear. It's a mandatory set of uh, provisions. We have some pretty smart folks here listening in that are, that are getting ready to, uh, to go to war. So my view would be we take the court of public opinion, which everybody here is right about. We've got to mobilize that, build it up as best we can. But we need to go into the other court. And that's where we have some equilibrium. In other words, we lawyer up, they lawyer up. You have depositions, you go under oath, and at least we have there a chance for a fact-based outcome. That's my view. So we, we talked a lot today about EPA doing their job and whether you're a conspiracy theorist and have concluded that they're not doing their job because they have an ulterior motive, or whether or not you're someone just thinks they're incompetent, or whether or not you're sympathetic and think they're overwhelmed and don't have the capacity to pull all of the tools together with the resources they have. Whatever it is, they're not doing their job. So, Burl, as you put the uh, gasoline gate uh, study together and you talked about the analogy with the tobacco industry and the smoking gun, uh, did you look at any of the strategies and tactics that were deployed by the anti-smoking stakeholder community that they used to go up against a similar entrenched major industry that was incapable of being moved in other ways prior to that? Uh, yes, it was the Surgeon General's report, which was, you know, a government analysis that came out and said, hey, that's killing you, and it needs to be labeled as such, and, and that started that campaign. It was a relentless campaign to save lives, and we're in the same one. Uh, we coined, you know, the true cost of oil, the true cost of oil, and, you know, we were going to write a book about the true cost of oil. Ah, we just changed. We just did a pivot because all the commercials I see on TV, it's the real cost of tobacco. And people understand that. Before the tobacco industry got sued, cigarettes were $3 a pack. They're $12 a pack because that price, that health care price tag is now in the product and it should be the same thing. So it's a relentless information campaign. And Dave and I get in this all the time. I've, I've ha I have high hope for consumers and the public. They wear their seat belts. Most people don't text. I mean, there's lots of things that, you know, men and women have evolved, and it's because of education. Why haven't they been educated about gasoline? And, and Burl, I'd make one other point there, though. The real breakthrough on the tobacco settlement case was the paralegal person, I don't know if it was male or female, that taped the documents to its body so he could get out of the office, the building, and evade the patent search, patent search, and, and that provided the ability of the people that were trying to get tobacco on the run to go into the court and prove the case. It was a, it was a combination event. I, I'm surprised with the revolving door with oil going in and now a lot of loyal EPA workers going out, that, it, that at some point there is going to be a whistleblower. There is going to be something that comes forth that says, you know, th this evidence in this, the length of time, three decades, is entirely too long. And in the end, it, it has to be personal. And I have to ask you for an amendment to my slides. I've got one more. It's the filter from my new CPAP machine. And I forgot I was, I was supposed to change it every two weeks, and I left it in there for a month, mainly because I didn't know where it was. I took it out. I was appalled. It was black. I mean, it really put a chill down my spine because I know why it's black. This is in my house, in my bed, and I live right here. And it, and it really it scared me. So, you know, this is personal. It is tobacco. It's about saving jobs, lives, and money. Everybody can hear this message and understand it, and they don't even have to read. They just have to hear it enough to believe it. On that point, I think we need to wrap up and move on to our next panel. I hope this was informative as we build the evidence case, and now what I think we need to reflect on is do we have the will to act? So please join me in thanking our panel members.
for their input today. And we have saved the best for last. Doug's, Doug's returning to the stage with Reg Modlin, and we'll hear a perspective that we have talked about, but not in an informed way all day long, which is what about the auto industry? And Reg Modlin has been at the center of uh, the action in the auto industry for his career, and Doug will draw it out of him. not quite dropped the mic, but we're not done yet. But, <clears throat> well, thanks, Reed. Uh, real pleasure for me to um, sort of see if we can get some discussion on <clears throat> what Reed said. The sort of most important part is where do we put this stuff? And that's really where the accounting uh, comes through the emissions are gauged, and that's, uh, that's the consumer issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's the cars. I mean, it really comes down to the cars. So uh, Reg Modlin has a 40-year career with Chrysler. Uh, we're just delighted that he came in for this. He's been a uh, great advisor to several of our groups, 2525 and Ernie's uh, uh, Ag Auto Ethanol Group, my group, Clean Fuels Development Coalition. Reg is retired but uh, continues to be a, an advisor in many ways, and, and uh, certainly he and I talk about these issues all the time. But we thought it was uh, very important. Reg has a technical background uh, in engineering, a legal background in law, uh, again, 40 years. I met him during the when I was a young pup, and the Clean Air Act was just starting. But uh, very fortunate to have you engaged in the ethanol end of things now, and able to get you to say some things you couldn't necessarily say when you were the Chrysler. So that's the good news. But we do want to talk about that. And I thought maybe we could just freewheel a little bit, Reg. On you know, it, it, we all think it's just so easy. We make this stuff. We know the benefits. Let's just put in cars. Why aren't cars using it? Why don't you do it? But it, all of the issues that you, you know better than anybody, uh, whether you like them or not, the legal ramifications, the studies that have to be done, the body of evidence, things that we might consider anecdotal, particularly out in the countryside where we're running fuel and say, hey, the car didn't break down, it must be fine. But there's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> and, and so we, we're trying to navigate through that, but at the same time, force some of this action, as you've told me many times, put the fuel out there, get it out there. Um, and if, if automakers see the fuel out there, they'll, they'll see the trend that's behind it. But let, let's just start, if we could, with some of the things we've discussed over the last couple of days, your outline, but some of the thoughts that, that from an auto perspective, as you're watching us on the fuel perspective, say, all right, th this is what we would need to happen. And these are the, the obvious obstacles. So let me turn it back to you. Sure, Doug, I, and I appreciate being here. This has uh, been a wonderful day. Uh, I think, uh, uh, this section is, I hope we're gonna sort of tie in where, how does the auto industry fit in with this, but this is all fuels. Uh, the, the discussion today about aromatics and fuel, what the implications are, have been well uh, laid out. I think uh, a lot of people can make a lot of use with the information that came out here. Uh, so this, I'm just gonna try to knit uh, some, uh, let's call it some factoids together, and then uh, hopefully we'll get through this quickly enough so if you have some questions, we can, brought it out to where you wish to have some questions answered. First off, there was a, a fellow in uh, my team when I was at Chrysler had a, a little placard up in his office for the whole time he uh, was with the group. And it, uh, it quoted an unnamed oil CEO. It said uh, something along the lines that the duty of the auto industry is to plan to use the product that we give them. And that, that uh, for, uh, and that's what you see today. Uh, they're they're uh, out there, and uh, that sausage that we call gasoline uh, is a concoction that they uh, use to, uh, as you saw the Rockefeller, he, that's how he got rid of the, a lot of product he didn't know what to do with. It became a pro, uh, 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 this product we call gasoline. So how important is that composition of that fuel? Uh, in uh, today's uh, uh, fuel poll, uh, I recall the, uh, the test fuel island at, uh, at uh, Chrysler. I, I'm going to speak maybe with some Chrysler references, but uh, let's be clear. I'm not speaking for any company. I'm speaking on the basis of experience I've had with in the auto industry. And I think uh, these opinions, although they're mine, I, I, I believe firmly that they're substantiatable uh, uh, through a lot of publicly available information. So anyway, the, the fuel 
Testfield Island at Chrysler or Park uh, contained something uh, just short of 30 different fuels. Uh, that wasn't because there were 20, uh, 30 uh, fuel specs. That's because the variety of fuel across the United States and some other countries in the world uh, varies so much. You had to select uh, a, a representative uh, fuel package so that once you designed a powertrain, that powertrain could be tested to make sure that the vehicle uh, didn't hiccup on uh, uh, some particular formulation uh, because the ramifications are that uh, particular uh, a customer or customer group would come back, uh, and so it would become a warranty and, uh, heaven forbid, a, a recall type of situation. So the breadth of uh, test fuels is very uh, broad, and the desire on the part of the auto companies is to narrow that down. If they can get down to one, that'd be perfect, because in that one, they could optimize the performance of those powertrains, uh, where right now they have to broaden it out to accommodate the varying parameters of the many fuels. So the, uh, that's where the goal becomes uh, uh, in, in a, a discussion, the debate of uh, what about that FFV in a vehicle using E85 and E10. Uh, they, they were uh, under the realm of uh, 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 continuing tightening of uh, uh, fuel economy or CO2 emission requirements. Uh, that, that noose is starting to get pretty firm. And uh, the wiggle room that they indeed had uh, for many years where the test parameters would allow them to flow within the test results pretty nicely, they're running out of room to wiggle. So the tighter the fuel spec, the better they can uh, meet uh, standards in the future. Uh, and then uh, they, in, in this case, uh, I think they would then make a choice as to what combustion regime they wish to use, and they can use some more aggressive uh, combustion regimes like high, uh, high compression engines. The um, wrinkle uh, this year is with EPA poised to back off the Obama era requirements, uh, isn't this sort of uh, null, uh, uh, position sort of nullified? Uh, uh, first off, just a personal observation, the Obama era requirements were never in place. Uh, the second phase of the program was only a recommendation, uh, and it was a recommendation, the execution of the recommendation was to be based on a uh, study that EPA was to conduct. And that's what the fight was about as we transitioned between Obama and Trump, uh, where the accusation was that the Obama administration hustled out uh, the uh, results of the analysis before it was really fully baked. So uh, then that, the reason for backing off is only to reset on the basis of facts that the Trump administration feels are now in place. But the, the bigger issue is, is that really going to happen? Yeah, maybe, sort of. But the, uh, uh, please notice that the rest of the world has been playing catch up with the United States standards, Euro United States and Europe, for quite a while. Uh, where it was United States, Europe, Japan, and maybe a couple of other uh, outliers, it's now uh, regulations covering something like 70% or more of the world's auto park. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for Pete's sake, has fuel economy standards now that are pretty darn strict. So uh, the rest of the world trend is set. And if the United States standards backs off somewhat from what uh, we had uh, a couple years ago, uh, we'll just be out of sync with everybody else for a while. Uh, I'm very confident that at the end of the day, the United States will not be an outlier. Uh, and the rest, uh, only during the interim, the rest of the world, including China, will be the one driving uh, the performance specs for the vehicles that the car companies, in fact, build. Okay, then what about that electric vehicle thing? The world's moving to electric vehicles quickly. We saw a slide here that said you know, EPA won't just wait for the electric vehicles. I agree with the statement that was made. If, uh, if we get to uh, you know, even 100% uh, of the uh, vehicles, on, uh, uh, new vehicles being produced, uh, uh, by 2030 are electric, it's still going to take 20 years after that for the whole car park to change over. Uh, that's, a, that's a real dreamy position. I think uh, I've seen many studies recently, and all of them fall way short of 50, and most of them fall in a neighborhood of maybe 10 to 20 percent of the total car park being electric by 2050, which tells you you've got to have something else if the world is moving towards uh, lower uh, carbon emissions from transportation. Uh, that tells me you can't leave the current stinky fuel on the road. 
uh, and hope to get there. You've got to do something with the fuel to give the current car park and the new vehicles in the uh, next uh, 20, 30 years a chance of reducing emissions and a chance of reaching some much lower carbon uh, threshold. So uh, that, that, that just says that a new fuel is necessary now for the car makers to start planning for the next few years to get those cars on the road that will occupy the car park of the next, uh, by 2050. So what's that uh, technology? High compression, sort of period. There's variants on that, and we can talk about a lot of details that people uh, think about and talk about, but high compression is uh, really the target, uh, and that uh, too was mentioned earlier. The, uh, 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 the gasoline of the early days needed something to uh, have anti knock characteristics, and that, that became tetraethyl lead, then became MTBE, now it's uh, uh, aromatics and ethanol. But uh, with the octane up, which is a key thing, uh, uh, the vehicles can be designed with higher compression, with a known good high octane number in place, well controlled in the marketplace, the efficiency in the engine can go up pretty dramatically. How difficult is that? It also depends on who you're talking to. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's more, uh, it's a, a, a couple of things. It's one, it's uh, uh, the DOE testing that has been mentioned, Department of uh, uh, Energy uh, uh, in their national labs, it's underway uh, for a lot of reasons for uh, direction by the car industry and many others. Uh, what they're doing is getting uh, current vehicles and they're uh, modifying the pistons to give them a, a better uh, or higher compression and then uh, testing the vehicles with a modified controller usually provided by the car company. So that tells you where, where it's at. You know, the heads may need to be redone, uh, the pistons need to be redone, and a, a, a controller with new or, or calibration needs to be put in place. Uh, fuel systems are uh, another th uh, thing that uh, people keep talking about, maybe, and those, uh, uh, but the, today's fuel systems uh, are the result of an evolution from zero ethanol gasolines, E0 we now call it, through E10, that transition took, uh, what, 12, 13 years uh, between about 2000, 2000 and 2013 or 14. And the car companies got serious about uh, 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 firming up the performance of the fuel system about mid-2000s, where uh, the uh, elastomers throughout the systems all got modified uh, to be tolerant of increased ethanol. How much ethanol? Don't know. Uh, but uh, one thing I can say that, uh, with great sincerity, the elastomer companies that all the companies share weren't going to come up short. Uh, so I don't think they stopped at 15.5% or 10.5% or 10, 15.5%. I think they went way beyond that just to make sure they had lots of headroom and didn't have to modify their formulations again. Uh, how much? We got, uh, that's what we'll talk about the E30 test programs in a minute. All right, so how difficult it is to put this in production? Uh, these things are already in production, folks. It's in Europe. Europe already has a, a 98 RON or 95 RON, a 95 uh, uh, average of uh, octane fuels in place. And that's where Mercedes gets the absolute 100% assurance that octane matters. They know. They already designed their product in Europe for it, and they have to dumb them down to get to the United States and use our uh, less than optimized gasoline. The, the, the technologies are well known. Uh, the modification parameters are well known in production, probably in most, if not all, companies in the world, just not for the product here in the United States. So if the fuel was there, the transition could occur as quickly as they, the companies can provide tooling enough to produce the volume necessary to produce product in the United States. That is not an overnight situation. Uh, that uh, is a modification testing. Uh, uh, tooling, certification, so that, that's a multi-year process, but it is not, uh, not a difficult one. It just costs money and time. Uh, the money and time piece reflects in a, another, uh, oh, then uh, the vehicle, uh, one, one uh, point, uh, there's uh, one comment that gets made um, fairly often, and that's uh, the uh, engines have to be, our product has to be hardened, and that's going to take time. Uh, that too is a, a fairly clear 
target. Now, this, these are, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you know, fairly straightforward pieces, and they're probably smaller things that have to be brought in also, but that term hardening uh, does predominantly aim at uh, the metallurgy of valves and valve seats. Uh, so uh, uh, to modify those, uh, it does take engineering, it takes tooling, it takes testing. Uh, but once it's done, the car companies are not going to make two engines. Not if they run high volumes of these things, because uh, it costs money to run two different products and then to inventory them and move them around the world. So typically, uh, a company will make the modification to an engine platform, and that would be their 100% uh, production run. So uh, the engine then would be capable of being compatible with the high octane fuel, provided it has the right calibration in its computer. Uh, the calibration in a computer is not insignificant. Uh, the artists that uh, do those jobs are uh, not plentiful. Uh, they are probably some of the highly, most highly valued people in the industry, and are, uh, they don't just crank them up uh, uh, you know, off the engineering produ engineer production line. They, they need to be trained over years with good experience. So that, uh, that segment of the engineering team is uh, highly prized, valuable, and not plentiful. Uh, so to uh, uh, try to make a switch, uh, uh, when a company argues that the, uh, it takes time, it's usually in the time to process the testing necessary to get the calibrations done. Again, that, and that when you look at a whole product line, a company that really wants to put something in can drop it into a product in, I'll call out a number, let's say three years. A known, a known uh, 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 fairly easy system requires tooling and testing and certification. Um, but to put it through a whole powertrain family within a product, within a, a company's vehicles, that could, take, uh, that could take a long time. That could take you know, six, 10 years at least. Uh, many times something you want to put in production even takes longer. But uh, let's just, for this conversation here, let's use six to 10 years to turn over uh, uh, introduction of some product like this. So at this point, now if, uh, if you're getting a sense for, for where this goes, you know, the car companies already sort of know how to make this thing. They made FFBs. Uh, they uh, uh, put these things into uh, uh, Brazil, for Pete's sake. You know, we're made, you're using 27% ethanol in Brazil, so don't you already have it in production? And if you can do it in Brazil, can't you do it here? Two big considerations there. One is Brazil is a pretty big car market on its own, and they're very protective of their in-country business. They uh, work you know, pretty hard, not as obvious as some countries may, but they work pretty hard about keeping others out. Uh, we heard today you know, they have 38 car companies building product in Brazil. Uh, yeah, and they like to keep it just that way. So. Uh, most of, uh, in my observation, most of the uh, world's companies, unless they don't build down there at all, uh, they'll bring, the, the, if they don't build down there at all, they'll bring some product in. But that's not going to be, I'm going to say, high volume. Or they might team up with a company that does business there and bring, in, uh, bring their product in that way. That's where he mentioned uh, this morning uh, that uh, there might be, I think, uh, if I hear, heard it right now, somewhere in the neighborhood about 10, 15 or so, 20%. Of the vehicles uh, aren't FFEs. Well, that's right, because those are products probably made for another market outside of Brazil uh, and brought into the country that they don't control very well. But that's, uh, that's uh, the product that is designed and made there may be a design brought in, let's say, from the United States. And they'll be tooled there, engine built there, and that the product then would be designed to be certified there, therein it would be made for an in-country product using a, a, an E27 product. Those are not necessarily exported and very rarely exported here to the states. Uh, make it and use it locally is a real good uh, uh, part of car companies. Uh, sometimes powertrains are brought in from out of the country. And in Brazil, what happens when that happens most of the time, uh, the product is brought in, it is recertified in Brazil by Brazil company employees just because the country likes it that way. As at many times, the, ca the car is modified, uh, maybe in this case, to put in a different controller to be compatible with the, uh, the uh, ethanol product. So what does that mean to, why can't we do it any everywhere? Because it's designed for a specific market, and it wasn't designed 
tested here. So what at least would have to happen is the whole testing and certification process that would have to be run here. And if that's the case, it's a resource issue, uh, not only with the car companies, but with EPA in California, because they have limited resources also. Uh, so it's a, at very least a long-term timing problem to get the product shifted. So that it's not that it can't be done, uh, it's in the difficulty of getting the product uh, approved and then certified for sale in the, in, uh, this, in the country. To some degree, this, the, the, the uh, 30, E30 testing program, which is, that was, isn't that laugh out loud funny? Uh, EPA showed up and said, you can't do this. Uh, yeah, no kidding. It's an illegal fuel, and there's a provision in the Clean Air Act that says you cannot modify a certified product. I mean, the product's been certified, and it's against federal law for you as a customer to modify that vehicle. So now you take it to a commercial setting, and somebody walks in and says, I'll modify your vehicle for, tell me a number, and EPA knows where those people are, and EPA does, whenever they find extra time on their hands, they go out and chase down those guys, especially the ones that are good, because that way the word gets out faster. If it was just somebody, you know, uh, Joe Bob in the, his uh, back shop, uh, uh, back door shop, doing one or two vehicles for his buddies, they're not going to care. But a fellow like the one that was pointed out here today has obviously got a, a following, and when, uh, when they walked into his shop, a lot of people heard about that. So the EPA likes bang for the buck. It's like the IRS, you know, they're not going to necessarily go after any one of us, but they're going to go after somebody big with a, a big tax bill to make a, a, a headline, right? So the same thing with EPA chasing down the, uh, the uh, engine modifiers. Uh, so the illegal fuel, illegal operation, but also note they walked away. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but isn't that sort of curious and doesn't that tell you something that maybe they do know, they have a sense of the pulse on this, and maybe it's something that they figure they shouldn't be hammering on too hard. Uh, the issue with, uh, a competitive, with uh, can you use E30, E25, E20, I don't care what the number is, but the number in vehicles and how far back or new vehicles, it's in testing. Uh, the, the car makers, uh, the question is, how come you guys just don't warrant the vehicle for E25 and be done with it? And, well, because the vehicles of the past were not tested. Simple as that. Uh, it's not like they don't agree with everybody. Uh, it's simply that they do not have the test information in hand that says that the vehicle is compatible. Oh, but there's all this test information. We've got how many millions of miles and uh, vehicles. Uh, a test program at an agency or a car company is very regimented, highly disciplined, and runs for millions of miles. And that testing is usually done on a comparison, so you run an E0 or E10 uh, vehicle, and then you run a, co a corresponding modified vehicle to accept a new fuel, and you run a whole bunch of them, then you try to do industry testing. So these things take millions of dollars and years, uh, and the, the well, very disciplined and uh, result gathering as such. The, relatively anecdotal approach of going out and putting vehicles into a community's, uh, uh, fuel into a community's vehicles uh, is, uh, is really good stuff, but it's not going to be robust enough uh, to convince a car company to take the risk that uh, the, that product is going to be able to enter the field on a nationwide basis running this fuel and run the risk of somebody or some percentage of vehicles turning on mills that they can't fix. Uh, because that becomes a big-time warranty, and at worst, it becomes uh, to a diligent uh, uh, class action attorney, which, of which there are many around, they would love to find something like that, where the car company said, I don't know what the test result would be, but I approve the use of that fuel. Then have the thing break up, and then uh, they go into court and say, Mr. Engineer, what did you, on what basis did you approve that? We had no basis. We just went along with the anecdotal information. Loser. So that's, that's the reason that the car companies aren't going to do it. Uh, they got the product liability attorney sitting in the background saying you just can't. You don't have the test information unless you go back and do the testing. And that they're not going to do because they don't have the resources. All right, so why don't you do it now for your current product? Um, one, uh, the, uh, the fuel that's being requested is an illegal fuel. Uh, the best way to fix that is to get EPA to declare illegal fuel by setting up a test fuel. Well, yeah, but, but why don't you just do it for this and uh, won't that bring EPA along? 
not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea if this were the only request remotely similar to this that a car company might get. But even on the fuel thing, it's not going to be just one. Somebody's going to say E15, E20, E25, E30, E27 for Pete's sake. Uh, then it's going to be, uh, what about the thingamajig uh, uh, for uh, traffic stoplight detection that you can put on your autonomous uh, vehicle that right now is not legal either? Or what about name, name some other invention that might pop up that somebody thinks is a great idea? It's a resource, simply a resource issue. And even though it might appear to be a good idea, feel like a good idea, uh, it takes something more to make that happen. So in this case, it's in some fashion, we need to get EPA to say the new fuel looks like this. And whether it's 94, 95 Ron, or if it's 98 or 100, get them to say that. And once they uh, say here's a, a, a fuel that uh, can be tested, you can use in fuel economy testing and put it in place, and you get you know, five stations in Kansas to put this stuff in a tank, uh, it would be available for the car company to use. I am absolutely convinced that if uh, EPA said 98 Ron E25 fuel, we approve that, and here's the spec, um, and somebody put that into a tank someplace, uh, the car companies would use it because they can take the fuel economy benefit. Now, they will argue, at least going in, that, gee, it's got to be generally available for all the customers that want it. Let's have that discussion later. Uh, let's have that discussion later, because if they can get a fuel economy benefit by using that fuel, my bet is they would grab onto it. And uh, if, the, if the fuel is priced right, and you know the market's going to pick it up, uh, they'll take advantage of it and run with it. So but that's a discussion I think we need to have in a broader audience and just put the gauntlet down and say, now what? So how long would it take to put this in? Uh, you guys, folks, know that, first off, uh, we have, uh, we've already said that uh, the, the need for the fuel is there. Uh, and that's the United States worldwide. It's a, it's a big need, and it's going to be around for our families, our, all the way through our grandkids at least, uh, out many, many years. So people are going to make good living off of this. So it's going to be a long time thing in the market. So the need for the fuel is there. Uh, we know what it looks like. Name a number, high octane. And we know that uh, corn is available to provide that product now in the volume that can be used now. And again, I, I'm pointing, we've done this uh, review looking at uh, E8, uh, E25. Uh, and how, how fast can that be ramped up? Uh, can it supply all the vehicles that would want it now? Well, uh, if I go with the com our car company, we'll say I'll have a product certified to do something. That, that'll make it like a 22, 23 mile year product. And our estimation is that uh, clearly there's enough fuel potential to uh, put in the market in volume to satisfy all the new vehicles that would be produced in that model year. Will it be evenly distributed? Yeah, the infrastructure is coming in too, folks. Uh, uh, the underground tank stuff is supposed to be done. Uh, the only question is, uh, is, the, uh, is all that equipment certified to the requirements that are on the books for them to perform against now? Understand what I'm saying? The stuff that's in the ground is supposed to be capable of supporting an E100 product. Whether it does or not is uh, subject to records keeping uh, that has been a bit weak uh, uh, up until now, but uh, the anecdotal information we have shows that uh, um, the people who are going out and con are trying to convert their stations to use an uh, E25, E30 product are finding that most of this stuff is done, uh, or if it needs a modification, it's an inexpensive switch. So the infrastructure, and also by 2022, uh, above ground equipment needs to be uh, uh, um, chip card readable, or, uh, read ship cards, and the, tank, the, the new pumps that are being produced with that capability are all being certified to an E40 product. So uh, we, as, we estimate that uh, just on normal turnover, there's going to be at least 40% of the pumps in the country will be uh, E25, E40 capable, which is far more gasoline than is necessary to supply all the new uh, cars. And the, uh, so the infrastructure is there. Uh, so the only thing is missing now is where is EPA? Uh, so the, the back to the, I think the fundamental bottom line here is EPA do your job. Uh, for all the reasons you guys mentioned, I won't uh, double down on those uh, 
this, these are all the same ones, but the information is available to them, the product's available, the will would be there if they were, uh, if they called out a fuel specification and, uh, and recognized the value of ethanol as an oxygen enhancer in current day gasoline. Well, great stuff, Reg. Uh, lots of, lots of uh, great progression of thought there. Just some things I was jotting down that we've either talked about in the past or you just gave me an idea. But when was it, um, you know, you talk about the fuel spec and how important that is for unity. You recall that, I know you would, the, the World Fuels Charter idea. But what happened, try to remind me, what happened to that? That was in that blur of the Clean Air Act and that movement, that, that whole time period where we were doing so much with fuels. For the audience, there was an effort to, uh, to, to establish sort of a single formula that included oxygen. I believe it was a cap. At the time, MTB hadn't gone bad yet, so they preferred MTBE. But it was a recognition that oxygen brought you oxygen at benefits plus octane. And it was that whole effort by the auto industry and uh, refiners and everybody else say, look, let's have one formula. And that's a heck of an idea that, as you just alluded to, is hurting us right now. What, what happened to that? And is that something that could be brought back? Because you know refiners and automakers. That's actually a good one, uh, Doug. Uh, something that I think would be worth, uh, worth asking now that uh, people are interested in um, uh, better formulations above what has been in the past. Uh, the, the Worldwide Fuel Charter is a living document. It is being used by the oil industry and the car manufacturers, the world's car manufacturers, to describe uh, the, the proper matching of fuel formulation with vehicle technology level. And the vehicle technology level is being set at uh, emission standards level. So, you know, European one, tier one, two, three, four, five, maybe six now. And the U.S. standards, tier one, two, three. Uh, then the fuels that are necessary to, uh, to uh, necessary to make those vehicles perform at those levels. Uh, the last one I recall uh, calls for an E10 pro a product, um, and, uh, and uh, again the world's car makers agree that they will uh, match the technology in a country, provided the country provides gets the fuel in there at the right level. So looking at the next fuel, could be time to get that discussion going. A couple other things, just some throwing things back as I. You know, as you've, you've got me thinking, and I jotted down some things, and I hope we get some discussion from the audience. But um, a, another issue that uh, <clears throat> we're working on, I'm not sure it came up earlier today, but is this whole concept that since E10 is the, is the base cert fuel now, that we, we would argue that it's, there is an argument, Boyd and Gray has made this argument very effectively, um, that the substantially similar law now has no, no cap. If 10% is in there, and you've approved 10% ethanol, we have certified on that, that the burden of proof is on EPA to show that higher blends actually degrade emissions or cause problems. Again, with your legal background, in addition to your regulatory background, how does that argument hit you? Because, he, again, this is not a, something we thought about over, over drinks. I mean, Boyden has, has made a very uh, compelling case for this, and we put it in front of EPA, and, they, of course, they haven't answered us. Well, if I... Yeah, this is pretty simple. I agree. Uh, I've spent some time with that with uh, Boyden and his staff. Uh, really enjoy the, um, uh, the thought process they went through and the proofs that they've come into. And it appears from that analysis, that's yeah, really clear. The EPA has got themselves backed into a, a pretty black corner that uh, they need to approve uh, higher blends if asked to do that. Uh, but the, the big challenge is are they not going to. So therein, how, uh, how does uh, uh, the community get EPA uh, to uh, uh, not be able to weasel out of, of, of that kind of a corner? Well, another thing you mentioned is um, it's so obvious to, to me. I, I use it in almost all my presentations. I, I don't know if it still exists, but you, were, you headed up U.S. Car, which was Ford, Chrysler, and GM, the three domestics. But I have some old charts from that where that the ethanol volume went up, and each time it went up, a little tweak of compression, and at the end of it, and I think Dave had it in his presentation, we were at 7% efficiency. That's a whopping increase, given that we think the new SAFE rule is going to be calling for 1.5. 1, 1. And I think even Obama was calling for 5. So the question is, why, why, why didn't, in your opinion, now that you're out of it, the autos you know, jump on that a little bit more? The whole octane argument, um, 
just didn't, you know, for, it just didn't quite, quite resonate. It came and went fast. It seemed to me that there was a, there's always a technical recognition of that, but I, I can recall the RFA conference. That was the whole theme of the conference a couple of years ago. Uh, we see some, some of the auto folks out talking about it, and it's like, no, never mind, we've shifted gears. And, and that 7%, or anywhere in that range, 3, 4, 5, 7%, that's a whopping increase with minor changes to your cars, and, and I would argue it, it slows down the, the electric push. So I'm just curious why you think that petered out so fast. Uh, I'll, I'll take the 5, 6, 7% thing as a, a given. Uh, whether it's that number or not, uh, let's not get into that. But that, uh, as a fundamental for this discussion, that's a good number uh, for, for this discussion. At that time, uh, that's uh, in a generally uh, before uh, uh, the current president came in and uh, pulled back the, the standards. The standards were at that uh, point were moving up like at 5% a year. And the, uh, the, what got the car manufacturers to agree that uh, the goal setting could be properly, pro appropriately set at uh, a, a two, uh, uh, set at the rate that they were uh, 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 set for going out to 2025. Uh, was um, uh, two things. Uh, one uh, was a very important one, and we call it the midterm review. And uh, NHTSA had a, a, let's call it a statutory requirement that they can only set standards out five years. So that was a nice break point. So it, uh, NHTSA standards never did go into place, which are the fuel economy rules. And EPA standards, uh, they could not make them final beyond five years. Uh, so they became recommendations. But the ramp rate was 5%. And that midterm review was going to assess, is uh, industry capable of doing it? And the biggest question that was targeted, the biggest question was, are the customers accepting the technology in the marketplace at the rate that it needs to be introduced? I'll bet you never heard that one because EPA sort of forgot that one. But uh, the, the second uh, 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 part of that uh, was, uh, uh, well, the, 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 technolo the technology had to be, uh, uh, well, the second part of it was uh, nobody knew what the technology package was going to be out past about 2020, uh, 2022 at that, but back in the, at 2011 and 12 when these things were negotiated. And that, that, that's, uh, people say, well, yeah, you guys are smarter than that. Now, well, uh, they, the car companies don't even know how they're going to price vehicles next year, let alone what technologies are going to go in five and ten years from now. So uh, the, and the technology packages were coming along pretty good at that time, and that they were, they were running out of ideas. Uh, so the, uh, the, the technology uh, not being known, a provision was put in uh, to that uh, list of regulations that uh, allowed for the evolution of new ideas yet unknown. Uh, so the adoption of credits against not understood or off cycle or some sort of uh, packages that could come in uh, come into play. Uh, I elaborate there because the the fuel component in the automaker's mind was one of those was one that they could sort of see out there. They could see if the fuel was there, we could use it. But I understand that if if the fuel was there, we could use it. The problem was they don't control fuel. Uh, they needed EPA help to do that, and then the industry's help of actually putting it in. But uh, nonetheless, it was, that's one idea. And let's say it's good for 5%. That was one year worth of uh, step for an engine family or two that they could put in on a yearly basis. So it was far from the total uh, technology package necessary. So what they did is they said that that's, this is part of that. You, know, you, uh, uh, you need to uh, allow us the opportunity to do more. And uh, what happened with the new EPA is that, that uh, those optional packages have been um, held back quite a bit. Uh, so they don't want to be arguing for one uh, at the risk of, oh, you got that one, so we're not going to do any more. So they wanted to uh, have a, a assurance that they were going to have access to the full future of unknown technology packages. So it's not that they wouldn't accept it or wouldn't push for it uh, once the fuel was in place. It's just once the fuel was not in place, and if the fuel didn't show up, they'd have to go some other way. So they weren't going to waste uh, political chits on something they had no certainty of seeing in the market. Well, that's the dilemma that we're in. I mean, <clears throat> we make ethanol. 
and we put it out, we can use it in a number of different ways, including a Z30 or E85 or E10 or anything else. But to go, you know, all, all in on that and try to get E30 in, in, in lots of places, then the obvious question is, you know, I hope the cars can handle it. So that's where this, I don't want to call it civil disobedience, but, you know, this sort of, sort of <laughs> go ahead and use it anyway. And, and it ties in with the testing. And uh, Governor Noem, uh, you know, we had hoped to be in here today, but uh, Larry Pierce alluded to this earlier, you know, in Nebraska, the Dakotas, some other places, um, they're, they're going past what, what Jim and Doug talked about earlier in South Dakota, and they're going to state fleet tests. So that's way above anecdotal. It's way above what they're doing. It's closer to data that can maybe lead to widespread acceptance. But I, I just would always argue that, you know, people say, well, show me the fuel. We know some people, I won't name it, who always challenges us at, it, at our ag autoethanol meetings. But I, I can't show up at the fuel and say, sorry, nobody can use it. So there's got to be some cooperation. That's why the World Fuel Charter or something like that, where the autos were working closer with the, with the ethanol community, uh, and sort of going down this road together, rather than saying, you go first. No, you go first. And that's a real problem for us. Well, maybe Fuels, World Fuels Charter is a nice place to be able to start getting the right parties together, but that process is a bit diligent and long. But it's not, not to, we shouldn't do that. That's actually a good idea. Uh, getting EPA to nod in the direction of, if you bring it, bring a product in and uh, uh, test it, uh, on a, a new fuel that will give you a certificate. That's uh, sort of bottom line. And what we've seen in the last uh, couple of years is reluctance on the car companies to be first. Uh, they uh, seem to have a great fear at this point of not getting the right answer. And uh, the discussion we saw today where EPA's reluctance or opposition to putting fuel in the market might be a real, uh, a real challenge, uh, I think um, may be part of a company's reason for not, not taking the first step. But that discussion, folks, in my opinion, we've not, you know, we've, we've heard those. Doug, you and I have heard it. Uh, companies bounce back at us, and then what we do is we get hit by it, and we sort of drop the conversation. I think we need to get some small group uh, together and say, let's, let's start this conversation again and say, on the basis, would you guys use it? What, what would it look like if you saw it, and can we get and who can actually take that request to EPA and who's willing to make that shot? We have not wrestled that one to the ground. One more thing, Reed, before uh, I just want to close this thought process. So, okay, so how do you get the autos a little more engaged? Um, one of the things we talked about on, you know, the other day and, and, and I just want to talk about for a minute here is, is credits. You know, I think the idea of credits to automakers um, is just a, left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. The E85 program was um, called a loophole by the environmental community because there was no uh, set way to demonstrate that these FFEs are actually using using the ethanol, and yet they were getting credits. I get that, and but I I think the ethanol industry was asleep at the at the switch to, to, to fix that. It was fixable. There were some things we talked about that could measure these, and um, but by that time it was too late. But in even our our other meetings since then, there's been a lot of discussion about well. If the objective is to not use oil and you got credits at 85 percent, why wouldn't you get credits at 30? And if you could prorate those, 30 is actually a better way to use it than the 85 from an efficiency standpoint. So um, you've told me many times that, that the auto guys would take the credits, but they're not going to fight for them. Um, I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure we couldn't turn that around to go and say, look, you guys are going to tweak your cars to get maximum performance, maximum emission reductions, maximum mileage, um, and meet the objectives of the original cafe, which was to not use oil, and uh, we can provide you with, with what you need there. So come in and, and, and at least smile and nod and say that credits would be helpful. But that's another thing, like Octane, I feel like they've just stepped off of. So I, I'm not going to give up on that one. I think it's an extremely defensible uh, position to ask for credits. If you want me to not use oil, I cannot use oil, but I, wanna, I have to do something for it. And I think that's, that's a road we could go down. But let me take a break. Reed has a question or comment. Reg, you made a very compelling case why the auto companies want to have a standard fuel that they are going to build toward, and, and that uh, suggests uh, a process of collaboration toward agreement on a single spec fuel. My worry is that the least common denominator nature of that process 
will lead to a fuel standard that the oil companies are happy with because they can still use aromatics at their maximum volume. That would be the worst possible outcome from our perspective in terms of public health and climate change. How do we avoid that outcome? Well, that's a huge question, probably much bigger than we have time left to resolve. Uh, so I'll just give it a, a, a short shot. Uh, the refiners and GM largely came and it was supported sort of subtly by Ford came up with that solution, and that was a, a 95 Ron E10 uh, proposal and uh, that was linked to re, uh, uh, pulling off, uh, or removing, uh, eliminating the RFS. And that had so many negatives, uh, you know, like one, they can make it about the current, at its current premium is what it is. Uh, so they wouldn't have to make any change, and then uh, the, a lot of people who count as necessary lose the RFS. So it, that wasn't the place to start. Uh, and uh, the people who were uh, making that argument, right now, the, it appears to me there's a lot of people afraid of the refiners and uh, for some reason don't want to go in separate from them, but they can't shoulder up to them because they don't agree with their position. So that leaves everybody outside the door. I, and I think some group folks have got to resolve, you've got to leave the refiners outside the door and go and talk to uh, the, the policymakers uh, the car companies, deep down, don't really care um, uh, about RFS, and they really don't care so much about the number, just as long as that number is bigger than it currently is and very narrowly scoped. They settled for 95 because of a couple of reasons that we won't get into right now. But if, if it came out as 98, they'd be happy. That's, that's better. Higher is better. So I, I don't think we, and, uh, and I think the, uh, the argument pretty much is settled, not died. It's just gone away right now, to your point, uh, Doug, because uh, safe rules under debate, uh, the huge uh, fight uh, between California and Trump administration, uh, the separation of the companies, GM, Honda, Ford, uh, you know, uh, under, for a safe rule and whether or not uh, to involve California. The political fight right now is uh, potentially so hot, or at least simmering strongly, that they really have to let that die, before, uh, go away a little bit. Uh, then we can get back into uh, this uh, fuels discussion. Now, the problem with that is that sort of says you've got to wait for the safe rule, which then may or may not have a fuels component. Again, we've got to talk about the strategy and uh, uh, such. Uh, it, it, the fuel component does not have to be in the safe rule. It would be really convenient. But it doesn't have to be. Uh, and are, is anybody talking about the, the fuel economy component, or fuel component in the current safe rule? I just don't know because I've been outside of that discussion with you guys. So I think it, 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 that, that demands a much deeper discussion, maybe another couple hours sometime, someplace. But uh, great topic, though. That, that, that's that's uh, in the next steps discussion that, that we should bring that up as far as we've we got to hold that discussion to actually frame it up, if nothing else. Steve, you had a question? Would you share that mic, please? Uh, Reg, you've mentioned this a couple times, and, and a few times I've even defended the auto industry because, you know, you look at all the challenges the auto industry faces. I mean, in Tier 3 comments, the autos are very positive on higher octane. Um, we have a lot of issues at the EPA, both for the auto industry and the ethanol industry. I mean, look at the R factor. And the fact that if you can't fix an error at EPA, how do you fix policy? We have a letter by EPA in 1997 that we can't take more than a 3% advantage on octane between regular and premium. We've got, you know, so the EPA hasn't updated their testing protocol yet for, for the OEMs. And we have moves, we have EPA coming out by March with the anti-backsliding study on, on ethanol, and we know that's not going to be positive. How do we... How do we get more traction at EPA if EPA clearly doesn't even listen to the auto industry? And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's always amazing. Just the R factor alone is an example where you clearly pointed out an error in EPA's calculation. And I don't know if they were just mad because someone pointed out an error that they just refused to even go to their own recommendations. So how do we fix EPA? 
that's been a discussion of the day. You know, how do we get EPA to do their job? Uh, and I, maybe we, that's better left to the next segment to look at uh, the things to do. Uh, but that is uh, that is a challenge. I, but I, in uh, uh, one one thing, it might I would use to start like the next segment would be uh, whatever we resolve to do to set our ladder to get to the next level. Uh, we got to start with a real firm pot, a, pot, a, a real firm, assured attention grabber that they then get stuck to and can't release, and they get them to grab the next one. But we, one thing we can't do is lay out the whole litany of uh, things we got to have fixed because uh, they'll just flat out ignore us because they know nobody else is listening to that whole list. So we got to get them in the room so they can't get out. And then what I think will happen. I'm very convinced will happen if they get the right direction from the horse, uh, is they will then have to fix those things to make the, their conclusion come out right. So that's, anyway, that's, we'll leave it at that. Well, we, we talked about maybe just having a round robin discussion here rather than people physically changing, changing spots and, um, and um, oh, that's true. So we, we're going to leave, leave Reg and Doug's still in charge, so everything's fine here. Uh, we're going to bring Dave Hallberg back up, Ann Steckel, Carol Warner, and uh, we'll just continue the discussion among ourselves for everybody's entertainment. Ernie, Ernie Shea may join us. He's on a call. And uh, Doug, and uh, Doug, and, and Jim, and or. And if we need to pull another, pull another chair up. Yeah. Okay, so Doug, you come on up and Well, you guys aren't on camera, though. We need you. Oh, come on. No, we're, we're recording this. Carol, we're, no. we need you. We're recording it. Come on. I was going to just say that, but I wanted to make sure I didn't say it wrong. But, well, I thought, you know, after a tremendous um, uh, series of presentations and great discussion, and uh, most of everybody up here was a speaker or presenter of some type, um, it's interesting that, that we wound up sort of where we started, uh, EPA, you know, Boyden this morning and, and Tim Worth this morning, uh, both experience in uh, working with EPA, but as I said this morning, it was a much more positive experience when they did it back around the time of the Clean Air Act, but it's funny how almost the last word comes right back around again to EPA. So I don't want to uh, throw too general a question out that we just said, how do we get EPA to change, but I think we heard some ideas, engaging moms for clean air and groups like that. Um, I think this awareness, as, as Burl pointed out, um, you know, some people still do read. We've got to get them to see and read this information. Um, the, the, the book that we did on, uh, that everybody hope gets a copy of, the Mobile Source Air Toxics, it, it's a fact book, and nine-tenths of that book is the health impact. It's only at the very end where we say, by the way, we have a solution. Carol was one of the reviewers for that and helped, helped me put that together, but a lot of research went into that. But we've got to get that information out. But let me, but there's a lot of other things. There's auto issues, there's ag issues, there's everything else. So I, I'll start with you, Ann, at the end, I mean, from a whatever standpoint, but obviously an ag. You know, if you were king for a day, you know, what, what's, what's, what, what's something that we can, not in a too general of a sense, but what is something we can do? Um, you know, what, what's, what's something we can do to move? We're a little bit stuck on the ethanol side with RFS, E15, slash RVP, you know. Okay, so what is something we could do in this town with EPA, Congress, get Congress to move EPA, whatever it is we need to do, that, that, that we could, everybody think about this, what's one thing you, you, you'd like to see done, and then we can determine if it's doable. And that's a great question. You know, I think with this issue, you know, it's our challenge and our opportunity, right, is to coalition build because there's a lot of different um, aspects that talk about when you're talking about the benefits of ethanol, depending on who you're talking to. Um, I certainly think that the health aspect is one that resonates uh, with everyone, and so I think that we need to really focus on um, embracing a lot of these um, health groups and trying to talk to them and educate them uh, about why it makes sense to them and bring in um, a lot of the urban folks into this too. I mean, I think Doug Somke's 
presentation on that um, really hit home because you know it's great if we're we're talking to ourselves in agriculture and we all agree to it but we have to talk to the rest of the country too and so I think really digging a little bit deeper on the health aspects will really uh, get us where we need to go Carol um, I I agree about the need to really kind of zero in on the health aspects. Um, it's been disappointing that it hasn't been easier to attract people with regard to that in terms of thinking about the kind of the professional public health uh, organizations. Uh, but I think that there hasn't been enough of a concerted effort and all of this really takes a lot of time. Uh, but I think that needs to happen. And I also wonder, about the health insurance industry because so many of these costs and everything come right back to thinking about insurance and and that one thing i have been thinking a little bit about is is um you know and raised the whole thing in terms of building broader coalitions well i think while that's important to do nationally i think it's also important to do within states and to look at you know because if we had folks going to their respective governors or or to their opinion leaders or you know or to um and i think that media could be very very important here in terms of a horse that we also need is somebody to tell the story in a really you know like in a couple credible you know like media outlets you know so that it's really being talked about and finding ways to really talk about it. And I, I have also, in terms of thinking about health insurance, you know, you've got state Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. So what I'm wondering too is whether it is worth trying to at least take a stab at engaging some of them and seeing whether there is any, any interest. I'll stop. Dave, I know what you want to do, but and you can sue. <laughs> Dave and you can only wants sue. to do right. one, one thing, but it's, no, I mean, it's. And that's a really important compliment. Yeah, yeah. it may be the only thing. Well, I, I liked Ernie's, Ernie Shea's analogy to Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. <clears throat> Most of us have been doing this. So we need Bill Murray. Yeah. yeah, Bill Murray would be a good shot. Let's call him up. Most of us have been doing this for 30 years. Um, as Reg Modlin said, you can line up about 12 different issues and confuse everyone. Right. I think we need to turn this from a shotgun game uh, and a broader conversation to a sniper shot. I think that sniper shot is the Achilles heel of the oil industry, which is BTX and aromatics. We watched them try to defend that in the 1990 Clean Air Act and all their ads, and they spent millions, and they lost huge on the floor. That's because you cannot explain that. So instead of having to go back again and try another 20 or 30 years in Groundhog Day, I think we need to focus on A, that point of vulnerability, and B, how do we get there from here? And yes, I am gonna say the courts, because you're not gonna get there with Congress, ain't gonna happen. We can talk to them, we can educate them more, but they are never gonna break out of their gridlock on an issue like this. And it doesn't look like EPA is ever going to budge. So we got to budge them. And that's where the court of public opinion helps complement whatever court we go into. And we've got the data. We've got to get the attorneys. We've got to get the industry allied behind us so the resources get applied. Doug, um, I don't want to answer your own question, but from an ag standpoint, from a state standpoint, you're doing a lot of stuff state level. We heard, uh, we heard Tim Wirt this morning say, you know, you guys need to get a governor. Right. You know, so we, we are doing that, but, you know, yeah. so I'll, I'll kind of yeah, lead I mean, the question you know, with that. We've, we've been trying to do all that. I mean, first of all, you know, when I started looking at this several years ago, I was seeing the things that were tried and that were successful, but you couldn't do them today. I mean, in this town, it just can't be done today. And uh, we should learn from the past. The, the one thing as a farmer, you don't want to repeat the same problem twice because you're not going to be around very long. Um, what Dave has just said, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think uh, the patriots that led in this uh, fight ahead of me um, have done a great job. Have, right, he's spent his whole life doing this. Ori Swayze, another one, spent his whole life doing this. Um, 
but we really haven't moved the ball uh, so far. I mean, Jim and his group are doing a great job showing how it should be done. Um, Christy Nome has stepped up to the plate to, to take it to a state level. Um, Minnesota's uh, Tim Waltz has done the same thing. We really, if you're going to do it by the, the state thing, you got to do it at least two or three more states, mm -hmm. at least. And then you might only be a regional thing. And how long is that going to take? I can tell you right now, farmers don't have that long. We are up against the fence right now. Um, matter of fact, well, you've seen the numbers, and we've got 20% higher bankruptcies today than we had uh, since 2012. We've got income of farms predicted to be down, just re released yesterday, 11% less income this next year for farmers than this year. That's not counting the expenses are going to be higher because these damn tariffs. I mean, we're, get, we're getting pinched, and we can no longer take it anymore. You know, you know that saying, you know, I, I'm fed up, I'm not going to take it anymore? That is hell. I'm not That's where we anymore. are. And I agree with Dave. I mean, I just don't think that there's any other choice. And I'm really frustrated with my commodity group friends because they put us in this box. They've, they've fought and fought to build their commodity and where has it gotten them? We've, we depended on trade, and look where that got us. Um, we're trying to do the same thing with ethanol, and that's going to take us to the same place. Um, look what Brazil is doing. I mean, I, I read the article that uh, your brother, Steve, Dave, wrote, the, the Brazilians are coming. Now, if that don't wake you up when you read something like that, and so we're going to wait and wait for them to come? I don't think so. My farmers in South Dakota aren't going to take that. My friends in National Farmers Union sure as hell don't want to see that. Um, we just don't have any place to turn anymore in agriculture. We just don't. Um, we thought ethanol was the best thing going since sliced bread. We still believe it could be, but we've run up against the likes of the oil companies that are holding us back, and EPA is infiltrated with them. That's the way I see it. I mean, the letters that I wrote to Chris Grendler, where's he, where he now? Oh, hey, he's gone. He scared the shit out of him. That's what it did. And I'm just going to be butt naked honest with you. That's what should happen. They should be scared to death. And as farmers, we need to stand up. And farmers are in these commodity groups. So just, you know, think about what you're doing here. You, you're fighting against yourself. I'm, I'm fed up with our South Dakota Corn Growers Association because they can't even bring themselves to agree that what we're doing with Jim and the E30 thing is right. They won't even say it out loud, although you visit with each individual board member, and we're with you, man. The other thing I'm fed up with our commodity group checkoff members is the fact that they go around telling about people that are taking their checkoff back. I mean, they're, they're trying to pit us against each other. That's not right. I mean, <laughs> I thought that this was a great event. The information that was shared here today was wonderful. It, it was very enlightening to me. I feel like what I'm doing is worth something. And my members need to hear this. They want to know this too. And they, they really appreciate the fact that there's others out there that want to help. I agree that the, the health care thing, because I've, I mean, again, it's personal. I've lost my mom to brain cancer. Um, I've lost friends to cancer. And we all know what we're doing here. Why are we letting it slip by? As Burl said, you know, everything else, we're, we're, <laughs> we lock our kids in. Heck, I was raised in a car that you didn't even strap yourself in. And what, you know, you just wandered around the car. I made it. My, my mom or my wife's Traverse has three car seats in it because she babysits our grandkids. I can't even get in the back seat without taking one of them out to get in the back seat. 
Uh, and that's a great thing, right? I mean, it's good, we're safe, there's no, no problems there, but yet we're putting this fuel in a car that we don't even know. I mean, I heard, uh, here's what a seed salesman told me one time at a, at a uh, seed event, field day. This, this is Brian Hefty, for those of you that know the Hefty boys. He said, he's t he was talking about the, the Roundup uh, case in California, and he said, you think that's bad? He said, wait until you see what's in your diesel fuel or in your, or in your gas, he said. You'd wear a hazmat suit. You wouldn't let your kids even in the car when you fill it up. This is coming from a guy that's very reputable in the ag industry. So why aren't people like that fighting with us? Why, why, don't, why don't they jump in? If that's truly how they feel, I think it's for the same reason. I think it's because they already know that the past, if anything is like the future like the past is, we are not going to get there. I really think, as I said before, the only way we get there is through this safe rule. And it works, it works. If it don't, it don't. That's the way I see it. Reg, we, we touched on a lot of it, but I want to come down the line here again. You know, you've heard all the different, all the different uh, perspectives of this thing, but again, in the short term, said, okay, let's get to work tomorrow. What, what's, what's something we could really focus on, uh, you know, in the short term and, and start on? I think uh, message-wise, uh, the health angle is one that I haven't heard used strongly before. Uh, and uh, 202L calls very directly for uh, health or damage to a nursing control device. Uh, I reflect uh, with uh, the guys on uh, another example of uh, some of that actually did work at one point. You know, get the lead out was one thing. Uh, in the 90s, there was a, a considerable study of the con uh, constituents of gasoline. Uh, it, was, it was a very joint effort between the oil and the car uh, industry, the Detroit Three at that time. Uh, Ten-year program constituents, and uh, there were many reports that came out of that. And one uh, one report uh, in particular, uh, but, but it came up with it at the end of the day was uh, a pile of data so big you couldn't really measure it, and uh, so compelling that uh, engineers just loved it. But then they re recognized that uh, the difficulty with that is there was just so much information it just overwhelmed uh, people who were going to look at it. So there was an effort that if you're going to do one thing to gasoline as a result of that study, what would it be? And it was get the sulfur out. Uh, the, the sulfur report was published in 1993, and the sulfur and diesel was uh, directed out uh, in early 2000, right? Uh, then we said, well, what about the gasoline? Oh, well, you need more proof uh, of the of, of correlation. So the, the industries got together and did that, and eventually sulfur got taken out of gasoline in the late uh, 2000s. Uh, the point is that th that did work. Uh, at, the point, at that point, the administrator, Carol Browner, was a, 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 a wide-eyed, full-blown advocate of getting sulfur out of fuel. And we were on the stump uh, uh, together as EPA and the car industry to, uh, to convince people to do that. And it went along with provisions, protect the, the health, and then also protect uh, the uh, functionality of the uh, mission control device. I, I'm sort of long with uh, you know, the legal action is uh, sort of next phase if people won't listen to it. I, I, I just I'm, I continue to be baffled why EPA won't pick up the mantle on that. And uh, but uh, maybe uh, Carol, you mentioned something this morning I thought was it was an attention getter for me. It was along the lines of. Uh, uh, you haven't seen or haven't heard of, 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 of I think, clear deliveries of message uh, to the Hill on the topic. And uh, that, to some of us, is a bit frustrating because we think you know, we've been working on messaging and stuff. And if, if, that, if, that message, if your message to us is that precise, what are we missing? Who do we get the message to? Who do we get this health message to? And then who needs to carry it? And I guess that's where I'm at. Uh, I, I think. We've got membership at AAE and all through this organization that uh, would be willing, and maybe we're just all going in to shotgun on the uh, what we're saying. Uh, I, is it okay to respond? Okay, um, I would just I would just say that 
uh, you know, based upon the conversations that I've been in, the level of knowledge is very, very low, if not non-existent. Part of it is because a lot of staff um, have pretty broad portfolios. There's also a huge turnover on staff. There's been a huge turnover in in members, um, you know, and so it's not really anybody's priority. So in terms of thinking about leadership, and here's where, I don't know, in terms of thinking about whether there's any hope in terms of, of um, again, somebody banging the drum, it, as far as somebody who's on a committee of jurisdiction. And one of the things that I, you know, because I, I'm actually gonna go back and make some some inquiries about this too, because there's also climate legislation that is moving forward, or it's being talked about a lot. And therefore, because this also ties in, that I really want to go and talk to a couple senior committee people about this and to see what, you know, to start to feel that out a, a little bit more. Um, but, but I think that there's got to be much stronger, harder outreach that, that has to happen. Uh, because people all talk like they haven't heard anything from anybody on this stuff. I want to come back to you on that, but, but Reed, jump in, please. Mm. I want to, I, want to I, I think everything everybody said is fine. I, I don't have any quarrels with anything that people have suggested. But I want to come back to where I started out today, which is one of the sort of threshold difficulties of this issue is it's so darn complicated. Right. It's so hard to explain. It involves so many disciplines. Uh, it, it is a really difficult story to tell. And, and so I have sort of two pathways out of that thicket. One of them is internal to Washington and one of them is external to Washington. I think the story internal to Washington is that we have become too dependent on a priesthood of experts uh, who are, uh, hold all the knowledge to themselves and act on their own without any democratic or congressional or even administrative review. They are situated in Ann Arbor, they pronounce their view of the world and everybody bows down in obeisance. Now, uh, uh, I hate to tell stories on myself, but a great idea that was an abject failure uh, of mine uh, was a few years ago during the Obama administration when we had friends in the White House. And we had friends at DOE, we had friends at USDA, we had friends at DOT, and we thought we ought to have friends at EPA. But EPA refuses to cooperate with anybody. And so we said to the White House, let's have an interagency process. You know, you have the, this expertise in the national laboratories. You have agencies dedicated to different issues here. Bring in NIEHS, bring in the whole team. Let's not just let Two guys in Ann Arbor decide the future of this issue. Well, turf arises, and uh, the administrator of EPA put her foot down and said, this shall not go forward. And it didn't, but it's still a good idea. And the problem is still there. And who knows, maybe this administration would be more sympathetic to having different voices. I mean, certainly the White House has not been able to solve this issue. Maybe it would be sympathetic to the idea that there may be one more source of wisdom that isn't situated solely at EPA. So that, that's, that could be through a congressional directive. It could be through lobbying the White House. There, there are different ways that could happen. So that's the internal. That's sort of how do you stall this problem of how complicated it is by bringing in a bunch of different experts and try to reach a consensus. I don't think that works outside of Washington. This is too hard a story to tell. So I think what we have to say is very similar to the, the, the problem I've dealt with for the last 20 years on climate change. 
That's too darn complicated to explain to anybody either. And what has worked on climate change was kids saying, I'm scared. Right. What else do you need to say to a politician? I'm scared. What are you doing about it? Or I'm scared for my kids or my grandkids. What are you doing about it? And that's the exact same message we have here. It's not complicated. Kids are being poisoned by the gasoline that we're burning in our cars. Do something about it. Stop the poison. Well, I'm, I'm with you. It isn't that complicated. There's bad stuff and good stuff. I was going to come back to you, but you sort of touched on it, Reg. But, <clears throat> you know, I, I, again, too general of a question, but, you know, why hasn't this resonated? Um, I wrote an article uh, with Dave Vandergrind in Biofuels Digest after that, oil, that Houston oil spill in the harbor. That was, a, I forget the numbers now. It's been a while, but, but staggering numbers, large numbers. Oil industry on camera, CNN said, well, it's just reformat. Well, Reformit's benzene. Reformit, it's, it's, it was just a different word for exactly what we're talking about. That should have had people up in arms. I mean, because that Houston Harbor then feeds to all kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's very uh, uh, frustrating to us that this stuff hasn't resonated. I mean, we put out a lot of stuff. Thanks to Mr. Somke here uh, through CFTC, we, we launched uh, something that, and I hope people will visit it, on our website is the Safe Gasoline Campaign. We have compiled a bazillion things that are, should scare people out of their boots, and they don't. So I, I don't know how we do it other than, you know, look at the attention uh, this, this young Greta got, you know, on climate change, things like that. But that Houston thing was a local, it's like, you know, Tip used to say, all oh, politics are local. Well, so are health effects. And, uh, you know, people all over this country are in cancer wards. And so we've got to figure out how to do that. And then that, as we all know from working here, that drives things here. But um, I just was staggered at, at how that Houston thing, and there are many more examples, that was just one, but how that sort of came when, yeah, a bazillion gallons of benzene in our water. Uh, and as Burl pointed out in our research and our other project, EPA is, on, I mean, API is on record as saying the safe, safe threshold for benzene is zero. There is no such thing. So anyway, I, I, think, I think we just got to get to keep pounding that. And then for those who might sort of doubt, then you're bringing in these ancillary benefits of agriculture, of energy security, of economic development. But um, I, I, it's just shocking to me. You're a bridge, Carol. Can, to, I, can I jump into one, yeah, one point there? Mm. I, I think the, the Houston case is, again, a lot like climate change, is, well, I don't live there. What do I care? You know, I, I, it's a bad story, but most people react to what's affecting them. Yeah, it wasn't and I, and I, think, I think what's compelling about this PAH story is this does not have a geographic boundary. No, this is happening in New York and Burbank as well as in Omaha. So the, the, what moves politicians are motivated, passionate people who come into their offices and tell personal stories. Now, they can be corn growers. That's fine in those districts. They can be mothers in the Bronx. That's fine. But we have to get individuals with compelling personal narratives to say, what are you doing to protect me from this hazard? Well, we did that, Steve. The ICM sponsored the, did the young fellow who was in one of your race, one of the various things you guys sponsor, uh, had suffered directly from... Yeah, you know, so I mean, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all, but I, I, I guess we just got to do a better job of it because while you're right about that, yeah, I don't live in Houston, but if you can turn that narrative and say, well, that's in your gas too. That, you know, it, 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 you just said it's not geographical, we're not limited to that. It's in my gas, it's not just in Houston, no, it's in, your, it's in all gas, we're all affected by it. So I think, you know, we've got to figure out a way. But I, I look to the Hill, I agree with Dave Alberg entirely, we've had, you know, we're not going to get any legislation. But they are a bully pulpit. They can beat up on EPA. They can hold hearings. They can make noise. Mm -hmm. I still come back to Ann. You spent a lot of time on the Hill. You know, we had someone from Senator Markey's office here today. I have personally, you know, gone after them because I know that when Markey was in the House and chaired the Health Subcommittee on the House side, he knows the stuff inside out. I talked to him at your retirement thing, Carol. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's interested. He really was genuinely interested. Where you, you need someone like that to say, and he's not even an ethanol guy. We don't need him to be an ethanol guy. 
No, he just needs to, to say, we're we, we going to get this stuff out of gasoline. What are the alternatives? And when he learns of them, then become an ethanol guy. So I, I think there's a balance between the media, the Hill, the states, the governors, you know. Um, and suing. And, and yep. oh, and, and absolutely. There's no question. While that's going on, that will strengthen the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Boyden has said that for years. Right. That's a built-in communication. It's a built-in public relations platform to, to direct, constantly update people on the lawsuit, and you're always informing people then of why we're suing him. So it, is, it can all tie together, but it takes resources and time and people. You know, That's Doug, just it. Carol, you touched on it, because uh, we, we, we've had this problem uh, getting into Rounds' office or staying in front of Rounds' office, uh, the staff turnover. Um, it's not like in the old days where someone would be a staffer for 15 years. Right. You're lucky they're there for 15 months. And so then you lose that ground that you thought you were establishing, and now you got to start over from zero. Uh, and I really thought that we might have a better chance with rounds uh, to pose some questions to EPA for the simple fact that his wife is dealing with cancer today. So, I mean, <laughs> talk about making it personal. And I just, for whatever reason, uh, it's not reaching him, for whatever reason. Anything from our audience? Any words of wisdom or concerns, questions? We've covered a lot of grounds today. Bill? Did you know that in 1925, Alice Hamilton wrote an article in the American Journal of Public Health saying if you're going to try to keep lead out of gasoline, you really shouldn't have, you know, put benzene in it also. Benzene is worse. Use the mic. Sorry. In 1925, um, Alice Hamilton of Harvard University wrote an article in the American Journal of Public Health saying that benzene was worse than lead in gasoline because it was carcinogenic. It was very clear, even at the time. So I just offer that maybe history can have a role in this too, um, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's a long, a lot of ground to recover. Well, I'll just say in the history that that's a strong point to, and we use this in a lot, going all the way back to Clean Air um, Act stuff in the Clean Air Act amendments when we were working on that in the late 80s. Yep. We knew it then, and we really haven't done anything about it. I mean, that's, that's the Dave Hallberg's point about 202L. I mean, we have, we have quotes from physicians, from legal experts and others, and say, we've got to get this stuff out of gasoline. Well, we didn't. And in the Sierra Club, uh, had one of the greatest lines when they went after him on, on, for not enforcing the toxics provision, and they created this benzene averaging scheme that they said, how, how could a provision that requires the, the removal of toxics result in no removal at all? Because all it did was average it out into the pool from RFG areas, and it was kind of this, this shell game of moving benzene around. So, but, but, but the point, your point is a good one, that we've known this for a long time, and it makes it even that much more compelling. How many bazillion gallons of gasoline have been, we've been exposed to since then? So. Steve. Um, I'm going to come back to the science for just a minute and then see if anyone wants to comment. You know, when EPA came out with the E15 rule last summer, they also said E15 over E10 raised VOCs, raised NOx, raised PM. And I don't think the ethanol industry or people supporting the ethanol really realize the science already uh, put up against us because we all know ethanol burns cleaner. I mean, that's not a, that's not a disagreement. But they're using the argument that ethanol and like ethanol's cooling effect makes gasoline burn worse. And I think we have to understand their strategy to how they say we're worse so that we can give the right questions. I was in Ann Arbor at EPA this week, and I had one of my slides had the Denver results when Denver's using their models that shows E0 is better than E10, and they're not disagreeing with Denver's results. Of course, I argued they're not using real-world fuels when they do this. So I think it's, it's the ethanol industry or the people that want to support a cleaner fuel. We have to have the right people that understand our fuel, understand ethanol from an emissions and a performance side. Uh, because it's not just EPA, it's not just CRC. NREL has just done another study giving the cooling effect of ethanol a possibility of being why PM goes up. And I'm looking at the study and I'm on it just kick somebody at NREL for doing that study. So, you know, we have some science against this, and I think we got to, so that when someone goes to EPA, we're giving them the right questions to ask. 
So there are certain questions you can ask EPA. They're not going to want to answer. So, Steve, I think C EPA should be forced to ask those questions under oath, okay, when they can't be cute, okay, and they have to say yes or no and, and, and suffer the consequences. You and I have talked about this a lot. There is nobody in the world that understands the MOVES model better than you. You have studied this for five years, and you are brilliant at it, okay? You can spend the next 20 years, again, Groundhog Day, sitting down with those guys and their successors, and they will never admit that they concocted a model that is not only wrong, but it's idiotic. Never, okay? But if you force them into the court of law and you present the case, what Reed presented today, which they themselves buried in their documents, have got up and admitted that their moves model is bust, that they were absolutely wrong on every count, and on top of that, their contractor said, how can you leave 86% of the bad stuff on the cutting floor? What that says is it goes back to the law. How can a law where Congress says reduce to the greatest degree achievable, allow them to concoct in collusion with the oil industry a model that they themselves admit is defective, right, with manipulated fuel samples, and they can continue to use that model to tell people that E0 is cleaner than E10. That's not just stupid. That should be illegal. Right, and my point is we need the right people to support the legal, to support the lawyers, so you can go in and just Absolutely. take them down with the right questions. I mean, you call that expert witnesses. Hello, thank you. My name is Shetha. I'll spare you my last name. Um, I haven't been here all day, but I've been tuning in remotely. And so apologies if what I ask you, you might have already covered, but it's something, Reed, you were just talking about. So you were saying how to get the attention of politicians. You need, to, you need that child in the room saying that they're scared and to draw attention to it. I actually work with a group, We Don't Have Time, that's largely credited with launching Greta Thunberg, turning that picture, making it viral. I'm their US representative here in the States. I also am a behavioral scientist, so I study and my colleagues study what is, what is that gap between perception of risk and the reality of the risk, and why haven't we been able to succeed in closing that gap. What I would argue is that even though it's not in your backyard, we have been really effective in identifying the communication, and that's what it is, it's a communication challenge. You're never going to be able to make every risk present for a, a particular population, but if you can communicate that experience in a way that makes it immediate for them and not so far away, then you can begin to come overcome people's perceptions. And so there's an entire field of study around this, and I'm wondering to what extent we've talked about it and if it's being applied. Um, we're applying it in everything we're doing with the social media network with We Don't Have Time, but this might be some of the missing component here that I'd love to talk about some more. Well, we may have to hire you. Um, <clears throat> Because I think you're absolutely right. One of, yeah, you're, that's, that's great points and absolutely right. One of the challenges we have, just wearing my ethanol hat, is we have other sort of daily fires at our feet that have, the ethanol industry has, and I've been in it from the beginning, but, and has a, uh, the ability to really mobilize and, and have a single message and be very effective at it. Because for years and years we had a tax exemption, we had to all defend a tax exemption. Then we had, you know, oxygen. We had to defend that. Then we had the RFS. And we had, so, so we're pretty good about, you know, kind of, kind of getting together. These last five years or so, the renewable fuel standard, which has been the basis for a lot of ethanol use, has been under constant attack. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's fair to say it's, you know, some of us have broken off, and Jeff Cooper said to me, Tace, I'm really glad you guys are laser focused on, on the health aspect. But they're fighting. The, so, so we haven't been able to bring our message together. So it's a... It's an unfortunate but unique situation we're in where every time we think things have settled down, okay, let's go do something positive and, and, and if you, you know, somebody attacks something, then we have to go defend the North Wall, you know, kind of thing. So if we can ever get past that, and frankly, a lot of us have made the argument that maybe if we could get this, we don't need a renewable fuel standard. We already don't have a subsidy anymore, so we could really be free of this, which is, which is dragging us down. But th those are good points. And, um, I think uh, at some point if we could mobilize our financial resources and tap into that sort of really high-level uh, communications expertise, I think it would, 
it would do as well. And I would love to connect with you to talk about this further. Just one other thing that I always think is kind of amazing about this issue too is that when you think about all of the work that has gone into clean air on the power sector side and how strong that whole thing on the health side, everything has been, it's really incredible to think when you juxtapose that to all of these health impacts on the fuel side in transportation. It's kind of mind boggling. Well, these studies uh, come out and they show spikes in autism, spikes in cancer rates, spikes in urban areas. Well, you, you don't have power plants in urban areas. You've got cars that are trapped in buildings. You know, I mean, so, sometimes it, it's, it's just it's frustrating that someone doesn't ask the obvious questions like that. Or are you guys looking at fuels too? And so many of these studies aren't. But it also goes back to EPA and the particulates and not recognizing the nano and the micros, right, right, saying, right, look, we right. control diesel and we control power plants. We're good. We, we did PM. No, there's a whole family right. of PM under that that, right. you know, that they don't even know about. So uh, I, I agree. It's a totally disproportionate prioritization of, of how you control pollution. And, and well, it's dysfunctional. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Hers. I work with Carol at EESI. Um, I want to reinforce your comment about working with other organizations and observe, I think, like responding to the scientific studies very, you know, precisely. There's, I, maybe it's not fair, but there's a little bit of a perception maybe that the people who produce ethanol are interested in selling ethanol and maybe just, you know, that angle is alone is not going to, you know, that's another reason to work with other groups. But uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to look at is getting people to think about this, what are called the social determinants of health. And it's, so it's not just, it's what the, the way that the public health people look at public health. And these are the things that we can control that affect people's health. And the idea is that it's, it's not just uh, you know, asthma, it's, it's all the various, uh, you know, things that lead to deaths that we can actually respond to. So one of the ideas that, um, actually there's just something in the Journal of American, of uh, Journal, the American Medical Association is looking at the, the impacts on the social determinants of health in the budget process so that when, when uh, laws and regulations are evaluated, they don't just look at the cost. <clears throat> They're actually required to look at impacts on health and the environment, but it's not, it's not, the guidance really isn't there. So the idea is how the benefits of your, what your program is about is gonna benefit the health side of the government as well. And there are all these different groups working in all these areas, and they, all, and they do kind of add up you know, under climate as well. So it's a much broader coalition, and, and as you say, if, if you ask the question in the right way, people will say, well, you know, ben, you know benzene isn't, doesn't work, what does? And it all, it all sort of comes back together. So I think, I think that's a really, that's a, that would be a really strong way to, to approach this. Well, I'd just say one, one thing, and, and thank you for that, and I agree. Your, your very first comment, though, um, yeah, beware of ethanol guys bearing gifts, you know, kind, kind, but I, I would just say, and we fight this fight all the time, all the time, oh, yeah, ethanol. Uh, we, again, wearing my ethanol hat, but we make no apologies for the fact that we, we produce a product that does all these things, all these boxes it checks, you know, energy security, economic development, all, all of these things. And as we said this morning with Warren Gray, and it saves lives. It, it replaces a toxic carcinogen. So I understand exactly what you're saying. We've got to get over that initial hump that, you know, that you're not, that there's not, you know, another shoe to drop or that you're not holding something behind your back. But... It is a clean product, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to not talk about that. So we've got to overcome some of that perception. I think Jeff Cooper's presentation here this morning to the environmental community should. That you know, was yeah, terrific. Yeah, that really was yeah. super up to date, and and, and we, we were aware of these numbers, but you know, it was just an excellent presentation. But you know, we just got to get over that. I, I met at your retirement party. We. Burl and I had a couple of exchanges with a couple I different people. I have another there. retirement party, obviously. Well, right? well, don't bring the guys that we met because unless we've won them over, we need more time to win them over. But they were like the same thing. Like, oh, you ethanol guys. So, but those are good points. But 
Well, look, I think um, unless there's anything burning, I think we're on the home stretch here. We have a reception at 5. Uh, if opens, we break, opens at 5.15 at, at the perfect. Occidental. And uh, we can give you directions to that, but it'll give everybody a chance to catch up in their email and go to the restroom and unfortunately get your raincoat on <laughs> and um, get your raincoat on your umbrella out. But uh, I know I speak for all the organizers of this, Doug and, and uh, Farmers Union and ESI and my group, Clean Fields Development Coalition. Uh, thank you, Reed and Senator Worth, for giving us this terrific venue. And um, uh, just a lot of great information. You can never have too much great information. I hope we can snip at this and bottle it and do some different things with it. But all these presentations will be available. Uh, for those of you who stayed the whole day, thank you very much. And um, with that, I think we, yeah, yeah, and our audience on the air, yes. We'll live forever, ever uh, uh, on the air. So, so again, I thanks. I was everybody. just going to mention, too, that the live cast, that this will be on EESI's website. So that's EESI.org, O-R-G, okay? Okay. Okay. With that, I, uh, you should bang a gavel or something. Read your... Uh... <laughs> <laughs>